What, our last South Park video wasn't enough for you? Need another heaping helping of facts about everyone's favorite mountain community? Yeah, I guess we can do that for you. Get ready for more Stan, Kyle, Cartman, Kenny, and Butters than you can possibly handle. I'm serious. If you watch this entire video, you will be turned into a construction paper cutout and be forced to live your life at 21 minute increments at a time, complete with intro and outro. Don't say I didn't warn you. Welcome back to Channel Frederator. I'm Keegan, and today we've got an additional serving of South Park facts cooked up from our archives. So sit down and listen, okay? You just might learn something. We'll start off with the evolution of South Park. It's always been good to know where you came from in order to avoid making mistakes that have already been made. To make sure that you know when something has already been done. Or as the great philosopher and scholar Butters Stotch might say, Simpsons did it. From May of 2017, here's the evolution of South Park. It's crazy to think that 20 years ago, a raunchy cartoon with animation made of construction paper cutouts premiered on Comedy Central. Two decades later, South Park is still going strong. It's become almost as iconic to the world of parody and satire as SNL, and even then, South Park's willingness to offend has placed the show in a league of its own with its social commentary. What's up everyone, this is Adrian with Channel Frederator, and today we're talking about how South Park has changed over the course of its 20 seasons, which, spoiler alert, is quite a bit. So get ready for some serious political incorrectness, because it's time to talk about South Park, then versus now. Okay. <laughs> The creation process. One thing that South Park has kept the same is its insanely fast six day production schedule. Most animated shows are made over the course of three to 10 months, which really puts into perspective how much the South Park team pushes themselves. Plus it helps keep their satire fresh and current. What did change, however, was the way they do their animation. Any viewer from the past two decades can easily pinpoint South Park's distinctive animation style. It has the unique flair of someone who put it together using construction paper, but how they make it look that way has been updated with the advance of technology. The spirit of Christmas the original five minute short that would become South Park was made by Parker and Stone using construction paper cutouts in stop motion. This spirit, excuse the pun, was kept once the show made it big. Back in the 90s, the animators tried to keep the look of the show as crappy as possible. They scanned the construction paper cutouts and then used state of the art animation to make it look cheap and amateurish. They primarily used the program Power Animator for the first four seasons. As time progressed, the South Park team was able to use computer animation technology to streamline the process. Starting with the fifth season, the staff began using a standard program in the industry, which can replicate the movement that paper would make in the real world. The physical cutout figures used for characters and scenes were scanned into computers, and Maya took care of the rest. Okay, really, the animators did, but using Maya helped. The team has a library of all kinds of props, backgrounds, and characters accumulated over 10 years that they recycle to save time. But it's not exactly a piece of cake. New animators and technical directors that join the staff have to go through a whole training process to learn how to do things the South Park way. In fact, the fifth season ended up being postponed for six months, so the staff at the time could learn to use Maya. I guess when you have a six day turnaround, there's no real waiting to get the hang of things. The style of humor. South Park's humor has always been crude and aggressive if not also topical, intelligent, and insightful. However, its early days were mostly focused on the crude and aggressive half rather than the topical and intelligent half. The first few seasons of South Park are somewhat more juvenile, looking a bit like Parker and Stone were trying to figure out what they could get away with on cable TV. Later seasons, however, are more sharply satirical, aging with the creators themselves and channeling their cynicism with whatever's happening in the world into comedy. Another factor that's changed with the aging of the creators is the shift in focus to more adult characters, and as a result, the jokes themselves have even been coming out of the adults more now, versus primarily being delivered by the kids in earlier seasons. Matt Stone explained, instead of Stan or any of the other boys having this big voice, it's Randy, Stan's father, who has the big voice, and it's because that's who we relate to now. Luckily, Stan has a grandpa because the jokes will probably move to him eventually. In current seasons, Stan's father, Randy, has become a much more prominent character, going from bumbling doofus to a centerpiece of several episodes who always means well. Leanne, Cartman's mother, started out the show as a doormat who spoiled her ill-behaved son, but has put down the proverbial boot more often in recent seasons, like when she punishes Cartman for beating up his friends, and for his foul mouth, in Kun 2 Hindsight, and she even yells at him in public in Human Sentai Pad. And of course, the jokes and running gags used in episodes have changed over the years too. Kenny, for example, hasn't been killed in years. This was a gag used in every episode in the first five seasons, but the creative team eventually exhausted the joke. Stone and Parker tried to kill off poor Kenny permanently in season six, and had Tweak and Butters take his place, but it didn't stick and he came back in the season's finale. Since then, Kenny hasn't died anywhere near as often. Older seasons often ended with Kyle remarking, you know, I learned something today, but that gag has faded with the many deaths of Kenny. Poor Butters, however, gets grounded very often nowadays, and Mr. Garrison's change in gender to Mrs. Garrison didn't last long. But one thing that South Park's always made fun of, politics. A major evolution in the show's humor has come pretty recently. South Park won't be making fun of the commander-in-chief. Donald Trump had a 
cameo way back in season 5, but for obvious reasons, he's a much bigger deal nowadays. But Stone and Parker don't have any plans of presidential satire. As Trey Parker explained, it's tricky now because satire has become reality. He added, we couldn't keep up and what was actually happening was much funnier than anything we could come up with. So we decided to kind of back off and let them do their comedy and we'll do ours. Characters The first couple of seasons had a much smaller speaking main cast, consisting primarily of the four boys, fellow third grader Wendy Testaberger, and occasional appearances from Tweet, as well as some of the boys' parents. As the show progressed, classmates Timmy Birch, Token Black, B.B. Stevens, Craig Tucker, and of course Butters became more prominent. Butters has become a more central character, and his relationship with the core cast has been expanded upon in more recent seasons, as he's often an accessory to Cartman's plans, whether or not he wants to be. The main characters of South Park have always been kids, but as mentioned, there's been a recent shift in focus to the adults, including a new nightlife spot of the town called Soda Sopa. In addition, the kids were only in third grade for the first 58 episodes, after which they graduated and have since been in fourth grade. What a difference. There's also a new school administrator named PC Principal who shames people for not being politically correct, and sometimes even gets violent to those who won't conform. He's in PC fraternity and soon gets Randy to pledge. Another major difference is the absence of the beloved chef in current seasons. Chef and his good-natured advice, cue the, hello there children, was a constant presence for a major portion of the show's run. His voice actor, soul singer Isaac Hayes, had a stroke in 2006 and lost the ability to speak. During that ninth season, a few months after South Park mocked Scientology, his representatives, most of whom were Scientologists, sent a letter of resignation on Hayes' behalf, according to Hayes' son, Isaac Hayes III. Well, one thing's for sure, we miss you, chef. You and your chocolate salty balls. Title Sequence One of the best parts of the show is its iconic opening sequence and song, but that's changed a few times over the years. The original sequence shows different characters and scenes coming in and out, while a lookalike of Les Claypool, the lead singer and bassist of the band Primus, who did the intro, plays the theme song, and the boys chime in of course as they head to school. For seasons 4 and 5, it started out the same, but then the song stops and the words 4th grade pop up, and everything's revamped. You can see old scenes in the background, and they also show a 3D version of each character, along with stats and possible other characters to make it look like a video game. It ends with live action footage of someone jumping away from an explosion, which is apparently a clip from the movie Bad Boys. Season 6 began the sped up construction paper design, and since Kenny was now permanently dead, Timmy sang his lines. Old scenes were shown again, and the crowd shot at the end began with Butters holding a sign that said, The Butters Show, and later changed to Professor Chaos knocking the sign over. And the title sequence stayed that way until season 12, when they reverted it back to the original intro format, give or take a few minor changes, like the music being a rock version. Seasons 14 through 16 showed the boys singing scenes based off of former episodes, and for some clips, the rest of the picture turns to monochrome, except for the character singing. It uses the same rock style theme song. From season 17 and on, the sequence got an entire makeover. The opening sequence is similar to that of the original seasons, except it's done in 3D. Pretty cool. Don't know how they'll top that for the next revamp, but looking forward to finding out. The fans. South Park takes place in the titular fake town in Colorado, which means that there's quite a bit of references, spoofs, and teasing regarding the centennial state. But people aren't always particularly receptive to being made fun of. So for over half of the show's run, the entire state of Colorado weren't fans of the series. But all of this changed during the Democratic National Convention in 2008. The Denver International Airport's display of Colorado for visitors included South Park among the things that Coloradans were proud of. This affirmation was a huge deal for Stone and Parker, and the current governor of Colorado, John Hickenlooper, has openly said that the show's smart and that its biting satire is important to keeping American culture and democracy honest. As is the case with other long-running shows, some fans of the show have aged while others weren't even alive when the show began. Kids back then used to get in trouble for wearing South Park t-shirts to school when the show first started. But now Stan, Kyle, Cartman, and Kenny are too ingrained in culture for anyone to bat an eye. The web, not even a decade old when South Park aired, has helped fans of the show talk to each other and share theories more and more over the years. Many fans of the show have been critical in recent seasons. Much like with fans of The Simpsons, there's been a lot of talk of the show becoming stale or running out of ideas. Criticisms have been levied at the show aging a bit, with what used to be edgy and forward-thinking humor are willing to mock both sides, becoming less unique with age. But that doesn't mean the show still isn't funny and sharp, finding ways to riff on everything we hold sacred and reminding us not to take ourselves too seriously. Episode Structure The number one biggest change since South Park's beginnings is the switch to a serialized structure. Up until season 19, the episodes were standalone stories that weren't necessarily connected to each other. Matt Stone
Stone explained that it was a different time in television back then, when he had to do this sitcom-style reset every week. But TV shows and audiences have both progressed to be able to handle following a storyline through nowadays. So for season 19, they created 10 episodes that were all connected under the theme of political correctness. Thus came PC Principal, and the show now even references its own episodes. In Tweak X Craig, Randy says, Our town has only had a Whole Foods for three weeks, and we already have our first gay kids. So cool. This is a reference to a previous episode titled, The City Part of Town, in which the town campaigns for Whole Foods to come to the area. You can even see Cartman's out of control yelping in the episode, You're Not Yelping. And then you see his obsession with his online presence again in Safe Space, as well as Randy's anxieties during his Whole Foods shopping experience. Hello, continuity. Next up is a trio of 107 facts videos, all in order, all ready to be perused and parsed by fans around the world. Don't tell PC Principal, he does not like this show for some reason. With that out of the way, here's 107 South Park facts everyone should know, parts 1, 2, and 3. South Park, one of the most popular cartoons ever created. So today here at Channel Frederator, we're gonna be listing 107 South Park facts that everybody should know. Eric, did you just take a crap on my desk? What's up? What's up? Crapped on your desk, Doug. What's up with that? Number one, the pilot episode of South Park, Cartman Gets an Anal Probe, was animated almost entirely using paper cutouts in stop motion. The series had not yet been picked up, so Trey Parker and Matt Stone did not have the budget to animate it digitally. It is the only episode in the series to not be animated using computers. Number two, during development, the creators of South Park were brainstorming how to get away with creating a modern day Archie, complete with misogynistic views and racism. So what did they do? They made him eight years old and named him Cartman. Screw you guys. I'm going home. Number three. It currently takes the team six days to complete an episode. Employees generally work 100 to 120 hours during that time. Number four. South Park has only missed the deadline for an episode once due to a blackout. Number five. In the episode, Kenny dies. Kenny's cycle of being killed off every episode finally ends and he doesn't appear again until the final episode of the following season. Number six. Originally, Kyle was the character up for the hatchet. He felt too similar to Stan and they wanted Butters to join the main cast as his replacement. Number seven, Comedy Central originally refused to air the episode. It hits the fan because of the amount of times the word shit was used. The creators came up with the idea to use the word shit so much in the episode that it becomes meaningless. Surprisingly, executives agree that the use of the word had become justified and allowed the episode to run. Huh, it somehow loses its punch after multiple viewings. Number eight, Butter's first name is Leopold. Creators were originally gonna name him Poof Poof, but decided otherwise. Number nine, when the episode Trapped in the Closet aired, the Church of Scientology was very offended and paid for an investigation of Trey Parker and Matt Stone. They tried to find incriminating facts on them, but, thanks Elron, they failed. Number 10, in January 1999, EA had to massively recall Tiger Woods PGA Tour 99 after a worker snuck one of the original South Park shorts, Jesus vs. Santa, onto game discs. Number 11, the crew of The Simpsons enjoyed South Park's anti-Family Guy episode so much, they sent them flowers. Number 12, the South Park song, Chocolate Salty Balls, managed to reach number one on the UK singles chart. Number 13, George Clooney repeatedly asked to guest star on South Park. Eventually, the creators offered a part that would have him barking for Stan's gay dog, Sparky. He accepted. Good on you, George Clooney. Good on you. Number 14. Jay Leno provided meows for Cartman's cat. No kidding, this is my pet pet. Number 15, every episode to date has either featured or mentioned a celebrity. Number 16, Matt Stone and Trey Parker obtained a copy of the script for The Day After Tomorrow prior to its release. They planned on making a puppet film that would follow the script word for word to be released the same day as the film, but were dissuaded by their lawyer. Number 17, Kyle's hair is based off creator Matt Stone's self-proclaimed Jufro. Number 18, co-creator Matt Stone is the voice of Kenny and muffles his voice by speaking into his hand or sleeve. Number 19, all of Kenny's lines are scripted, even if they're almost impossible to understand. Number 20, besides being a co-creator, Trey Parker is also the voice of Cartman, who is also his favorite character. 
Screw you guys, screw you guys, screw you guys. Number 21, the majority of Cartman's lines are ad-libbed by Trey Parker. I thought your family was rich. Nah, 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 blah, 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 blah. Number 22, the criticism that South Park was nothing but bad animation and fart jokes led to the creation of Terrence and Philip. <laughs> Number 23, Mr. and Miss Garrison have first names. Mr. Garrison's first name is Herbert, and Miss Garrison's first name is Janet. Number 24, in the theme song of the first season, Kenny's muffled part is actually, I like girls with big vaginas, I like girls with big fat titties. <laughs> It was never censored because it was already difficult to make out. Number 25, every Halloween special, one character dressed up as Chewbacca. <laughs> Number 26, the band Primus performs South Park's theme song. I'm going down to South Park, gonna have myself a time. Number 27, South Park holds the Guinness World Record for most swearing in an animated series. Number 28, Mr. Hankey's The Christmas Pooh was created based on Trey Parker's childhood habit of forgetting to flush the toilet. Trey's father used to tell him that if he didn't flush, Flush, Mr. Hanky would come out and eat him. Number 29, Cartman's mother is named after an ex-girlfriend of Trey Parker's. He actually caught her cheating on him. Number 30, Chef is based off a real dining hall employee at the University of Colorado. The two creators met him while studying there. Number 31, all the names in Stan's family come from Trey Parker's family, while Kyle's families are from Matt Stone. Number 32, after the episode Le Petit Tourette aired, the Tourette Syndrome Association released a statement praising the show for being well-researched and for serving as a clever device to get accurate information information to the public. Number 33, Kenny's character is based off a real life childhood friend of Trey Parker's who was also named Kenny. Kenny was the poorest kid in town and always wore a large parka that made him hard to hear. He would frequently skip school which caused other students to joke around that he died. <laughs> Number 34, South Park's lawyers wouldn't allow Trey Parker to call Tom Cruise gay directly so he put him in the closet instead. I'm never coming out! Number 35, Mr. Mackey's based off of Trey Parker's old school counselor, Mr. Lackey. Okay. 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 Number 36. After Kanye West interrupted Taylor Swift at the 2009 MTV Music Awards, I I'm really happy for you. I'm let you finish. Comedy Central played the South Park episode Fish Sticks on repeat for two hours. Number 37. A character named Alex who only appeared in one South Park episode called Red Man's Greed was voiced by Alex Glick. Alex earned the role by being the highest bidder at a charity auction to benefit AIDS research. Number 38. The Pokemon Pair parody episode that appears in South Park, Chim Pokemon, is Japanese for penis monster. And if you didn't know, Pokemon is Japanese for pocket monsters. Yeah, we see what you did there, guys. Number 39. The chairman of Scientology's niece first learned about the story of Xenu through South Park. She left Scientology shortly after. Number 40. In the credits of Trapped in the Closet, all the names in the credits read as John Smith and Jane Smith because of Tom Cruise and the Church of Scientology's reputation for frequently suing people. Number 41. The movie South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut was originally issued in NC-17 rating. Number 42, Casa Bonita, the Mexican restaurant that appears in South Park, is a real restaurant in Denver. Number 43, Frito-Lay sold 1.5 million bags of cheesy poofs at Walmart in collaboration with Comedy Central in 2011. Number 44, when Kenny dies and Stan or Kyle would yell out, Oh my god, they killed Kenny! You bastard! The word they was actually alluding to Stone and Parker. Number 45, prior to season 8, Chef was never shown from any other perspective than a frontal view, even when exiting a scene. This is because for seven years, creators never drew a side view for him. Number 46, Chef was written out of the show after Isaac Hayes, the voice of Chef, requested to exit his contract prematurely. He was very unhappy with how the show portrayed his religion, Scientology. Number 47, Butters is based off of Eric Stowe, South Park's animation director. Like, we're gonna put you in the show, Butters. Yeah, he's, he's like, here. well, you better not, I'll get awful mad. He's here, he's sitting, he's <laughs> yeah, sitting. He's here. Number 48, Jerry Seinfeld was a fan of South Park, so his agent contacted the creators about a potential guest spot. He was offered the role of a background turkey in Starvin' Marvin. He refused the offer. Number 49, Professor Chaos, Butter's supervillain alter ego, is based on Marvel's Doctor Doom. Number 50, in Cartman's Mom is Still a Dirty Slut, it's revealed that Cartman's mother is a hermaphrodite. However, in 2001, this is shown to be a lie made up to protect the Denver Broncos. The Broncos have never thanked us for our help. Go Broncos! Number 51. In the show, it's easy to distinguish Canadians from Americans because Canadians have floppy heads with separable tops and bottoms paired with beady eyes.
Number 52, chef's full name is Jerome McElroy. Number 53, Lemmy Wink's journey through Mr. Slave's body in The Death Camp of Tolerance is meant to be a parody of The Hobbit. It turned out a lot of people didn't catch that. Lemmy Wink's. Number 53, four different versions of the song Stinky Britches are sung throughout the series by Cartman, Chef, Alanis Morissette, and Marilyn Manson. Number 55, prior to the airing of Trapped in the Closet, Tom Cruise had wanted to voice a character on South Park. Yeah, that's a bit awkward. Number 56, South Park has been nominated for 13 Emmy Awards and has won five. Number 57, South Park was the first weekly show ever to obtain a TVMA rating. Number 58, in the deleted ending of Fish Sticks, Kanye West drowns and the Coast Guard recovers his dead body. Number 59, Doug Herzog, a TV executive, credit South Park for having put Comedy Central on the map. Number 60, Sri Lanka banned South Park after the episode 200 depicted Buddha snorting cocaine with Jesus. Number 61, Kyle's birthday is May 26, while Stan's birthday is October 26. They share birthdays with the creators Matt Stone and Trey Parker. Number 62, Dr. Sophie Rushman of the University of Strasbourg discovered a mutated gene in fruit flies that caused them to die within two days after bacterial infection. She named it Kep One after Kenny McCormick. Number 63. Outside the other inspirations for Cartman, he is also based off a high school classmate of Trey's. The two still remain close friends. Number 64. Cartman's middle name is Theodore. Ha! <laughs> what a dork. Number 65. Scott Titterman Must Die was written by Matt and Trey to reveal that Eric Cartman is the most evil kid in the world. Your kids are so yummy. Number 66. Cartman has only been arrested six times, though he has committed murder, rape, arson, prostitution, and forced cannibalism, attempted genocide, manslaughter, animal abuse, hate crimes, grave robbery, war crimes, child abuse, vandalism, theft, piracy, embezzlement, shoplifting, terrorism, drug possession, smuggling, armed robbery, and more. He's a nice guy! Number 67, the KFC turned weed dispensary in Medical Fried Chicken is based on an actual weed dispensary in Los Angeles. After a Kentucky Fried Chicken went out of business, the store was bought and turned into Kind for Cures. Number 68, when he has writer's block, Trey Parker plays with Legos. Number 69, in 2007, South Park was included in Time's 100 Greatest Shows of All Time. Number 70, South Park has won a Peabody Award praising it as one of TV's boldest, most politically incorrect satirical series. Number 71, when the production company logo appears at the end of each South Park episode, the music playing is from the song Shadoinkle. The song was originally used in Trey Parker's student film, Cannibal the Musical. The sky is blue and all the leaves are green. Number 72. In 1992, South Park's creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone collaborated on an animated short called The Spirit of Christmas, Jesus vs. Frosty. It was made entirely with construction paper and glue and was one of the very first viral videos ever created. Number 73. Brian Greeden, a Fox executive, saw the spirit of Christmas and paid Parker and Stone to create a similar animation that he could use as a Christmas card. They created Jesus vs. Santa. Comedy Central saw the video and gave the two a shot at their very own show, which would end up being our beloved South Park. Go Santa! Uh, go Jesus! Number 74. Nancy Cartwright was invited to audition for the pilot of South Park. She walked out of the audition in disgust. Number 75. When Mr. Garrison is told by the school counselor that Mr. Hat is a manifestation of his gay side, Mr. Hat is replaced by Mr. Twig, a hand puppet with a pink triangular patch on his shirt. The same patch was used in Nazi concentration camps to identify homosexuals. Number 76. Mary Kay Bergman voiced most of the female characters in South Park until her death in 1999. Afterwards, the roles were taken on by Eliza Schneider. Number 77. The first season averaged about 250 
150,000 per episode. This may sound expensive to you, but this was much less than the standard of 600,000 at the time. Number 78. When the show first began, the most expensive ad spot cost $7,500. Within months of its debut, they could demand over $30,000. Number 79. An episode that referenced Terry Schiavo aired only hours before her death. Number 80. The episode About Last Night aired less than a day after Obama's victory speech and used actual excerpts from it. Man, they're so quick! Number 81. South Park was originally animated in Power Animator, but switched over to Maya at the start of Season 5. Number 82. These three all offered to do voices for the show, but were rejected. Number 83. Co-creator Trey Parker is mainly credited for writing and directing, while co-creator Matt Stone is mainly credited for production coordination and voice acting. Number 84. Mr. Hat is based based off a children's book character named Hi-Hat. Hi-Hat is a puppet that teaches children the letters of the alphabet. Number 85, the music played during the closing credits is the original Primus opening song, Slow Down. Number 86, the main boys, Cartman, Stan, Kyle, and Kenny, never showed their hair in early seasons. Over the years, however, their hair has been revealed. Number 87, one of Cartman's less common catchphrases is, Ha <laughs> ha, He says it in a British accent and is a reference to the Pink Floyd song, Pigs, three different ones. Number 88. In the episode Pink Eye, most of the German heard from Hitler in That Guy Hitler is nonsense. His second line, however, translates roughly to, I love your breast, dear. Number 89. Kyle does not have a single line in the episode, Butter's very own episode. Poor Kyle. Number 90. The creators of South Park were asked to write a prequel to Dumb and Dumber. They worked on it for two years, but ended up being too busy with South Park to complete it. Number 91. Matt Stone and Trey Parker are big Star Trek fans and try to squeeze in references whenever they can. The are at 20%, Captain. Number 92. The episode Jared Has AIDS has never had a rerun on Comedy Central due to all the AIDS jokes. Number Number 93. In the episode A Ladder to Heaven, the TV studio backgrounds are identical to the ones used in the military base in Towley. You can tell by looking at the maps on the wall. Number 94. Terrence and Philip in Not Without My Anus actually aired the day Cartman's mom is still a dirty slut was supposed to premiere. It was April Fool's Day, so the creators thought it would be funny to show the wrong episode. But it didn't go well, over very well. Most Everyone of America hated it. hated it. Comedy Central received numerous phone calls from angry viewers who had been waiting for the reveal of Cartman's father. Number 95. In Chicken Lover. Whoa, dude. How do you have sex with a chicken? When everyone's favorite South Park officer returns to the school, the letters on the alphabet chart say something in Spanish. It's translated to, Oh my god! They killed Kenny! You bastards! Number 96. When the demonic voices are singing in Demian, if you pay close attention, you can sometimes hear them say, Cheesy poofs. Number 97. In their 200th two-part episode, South Park depicted the Prophet Muhammad paving the way for a huge conflict. Come on, people. You really think anybody's gonna be that pissed off about a cartoon? In part one, Muhammad is present but never shown. A group called Revolution Muslim protested and implied that the creators would be killed for their actions. As a result, Comedy Central had Muhammad's character edited in part two and censored all mentions of his name. Stone and Parker were very much against this. Something that was okay is now not okay, and that's just... Number 98. With all the commotion surrounding the 200th episode, it's very interesting to note that in the 2001 episode of South Park titled Super Best Friends, they depicted Muhammad without controversy. Number 99. Parker and Stone hate the early video game adaptations of South Park. This is why they were more involved in the making of the highly rated South Park The Stick of Truth. Number 100. Yes! An Elephant Makes Love to a Pig originally had a scene where Shelly repeatedly set Stan on fire with matches before drenching him with water. Comedy Central cut it right before broadcast because they feared children would imitate the act in a similar fashion to what happened with the Beavis and Butthead controversy. If you watch the episode, this cut scene explains why there's a puddle under Stan after he's beaten up. Number 101. The creators dislike the episode Chef Goes Nanners and have admitted that it was rushed because they wanted to leave early for the holiday weekend. Number 102. The episode Pip was universally hated by all the staff that worked on it, especially 
Trey Parker. As a result, it isn't aired often. Number 103. Barry White was originally considered for the role of chef, but he turned it down because he found the content offensive. Number 104. Parker and Stone are friends with Bill Hader, and he has occasionally served as a writer, producer, and voice actor for the show since its 12th season. Number 105. The animated director listed below animated several episodes in season 11 and 12. Number 106. In 1997, Comedy Central was in 9.1 million homes. By 1998, after the premiere of South Park, it was in 50 million homes. By 2003, it was in 82 million homes. And finally, guys, number 107, Timmy was originally going to be a one-time character, but he was so popular that the creators kept him around. What do some facts have in common with South Park? We've always got more material to cover. From Kenny's last death to the inspiration behind Butters, we've got more to tell you about your favorite South Park residents. Hi, I'm JD with Channel Fred Earner, and we're here to dish another set of zany moments and info about this small town and its crazy citizens that you may not know. Yeah, flip, 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 flip the cop car! Flip the cop car! So get your snow caps and satire face ready, because we're counting down 107 more facts about South Park. Let's get started. Number one, the show's iconic stop-motion paper cutout animation style was inspired by Terry Gilliam's paper cutout style from Monty Python's Flying Circus. South Park creators Matt Stone and Trey Parker are huge fans of Monty Python's Flying Circus. Number two, in the first South Park original short, Jesus vs. Frosty, the name Kenny was associated with the character designed to serve the basis for Cartman. In the short, there's even a character that looks identical to the Kenny seen in the main series, but he isn't given a name. Oh my god! Number three, Pixar films heavily influenced South Park's writing style. According to Stone and Parker, Pixar taught them that you can take a basic, played out plot and make the story unique by adding small twists, so an otherwise cliche story becomes something fresh and exciting. Number four, in the unaired pilot episode, Cartman had a father and even a younger sister. They're briefly seen when Cartman's mom is setting the table for dinner. Number five, the pilot episode of South Park had a budget of $300,000. It was written by Matt Stone and Trey Parker, and Parker directed it as well. Number six, while the first episode was made out of construction paper cutouts, the actual process of animating the whole episode largely fell on Matt Stone and Trey Parker, with some help from animation director Eric Stowe. Number seven, they created the Starry Night Sky by putting holes into a black poster board and illuminating it from behind. The pulling of Kenny's blood was simulated by drawing an initial dot with a red marker pen and gradually drawing more blood with every frame. Number eight, the characters who weren't speaking rarely moved, which saved on time and animation, so they're just staring blankly. Number nine, the finished pilot was 28 minutes long, which was too long to air. Trey Parker and Matt Stone didn't realize that more time should have been allowed for television commercials. In order to shorten the episode to 20 22 minutes, Parker and Stone had to cut out a good chunk of material. Number 10. The idea for the town of South Park came from the real Colorado basin of the same name, where, according to the creators, a lot of folklore and news reports originated about UFO sightings, cattle mutilations, and Bigfoot sightings. Sounds like paradise. Number 11. Parker and Stone's original intentions for the pilot were to have the aliens' presence feature more frequently in the following episodes, but eventually they decided against this, because they didn't want the show to look like a parody of the popular science fiction TV series The X-Files. Number 12. During season 1's opening theme song, a TV can be seen in the background playing Matt Stone and Trey Parker's very first South Park short, Jesus vs. Frosty. Not long after, a billboard appears playing a clip from their updated version of the short, retitled The Spirit of Christmas. Number 13. The reason the episode Cartman Gets an Anal Probe contains so much explicit language, you my brother a dildo? What's a dildo? Is that Parker felt pressured to live up to the standards of their original short, The Spirit of Christmas, which contains a lot of obscenities. As a result, Parker admitted that they may have tried to push things farther than they should have. Number 14. Each episode of South Park is made within the span of only six days. For other series, it usually takes months to complete an episode. Matt Stone and Trey Parker believe that pushing their crew to create episodes within six days encourages them to be more spontaneous in the creative process, making for a funnier show in the end. Number 15. Randy Marsh and Trey Parker's dad have a lot in common. Not only are they both named Randy, but they're also both geologists. Number 16. Hector, token black, was the only African-American child in South Park until the introduction of Nicole in Cartman Finds Love during season 16. Number 17. Before Adrian Beard came on to play Token as a character, Parker and Stone originally took turns providing their voices for the few lines Token had as a minor character. Number 18. Officer Barbrady's voice is based on the voice of syndicated radio talk show host Dennis Prager. According to Trey Parker, Prager has a big, bombastic, and stupid voice that's oh so fun to mock. That is the silliest thing I've ever 
overheard. Number 19. Tally was created as an inside joke with the writing team when they took a boating trip. Some of the writers decided to take up wakeboarding, and somebody shouted, don't forget to bring a towel. Then everybody started saying this phrase in high-pitched voices, and thus, Tally was born. Tally is also a parody of characters that are created specifically to sell merchandise, which, oddly enough, Tally did. Don't preach to me, fatso! Number 20. Trey Parker was originally meant to voice Tally, but the crew thought his voice for the character sounded identical to Mr. Hanky. So Tally's voice wound up being provided by Vernon Chapman, who was a writer and producer on the show. Number 21. The Super Best Friends were based on a long-running inside joke that Matt and Trey had, that all the religious deities were close friends and hung out together on a spaceship responding to crimes, much like the Justice League. Seaman, you and Swallow go get a sushi for dinner! <laughs> Number 22. In the episode Weight Gain 4000, Kathy Lee Gifford awards Cartman a trophy featuring a golden orgasmo on top. Orgasmo was the protagonist of a film of the same name that was written and directed by Trey Parker. The orgasmo trophy returns as a dodgeball trophy in the episode Conjoined Fetus Lady. Number 23. Cartman's cat, Mr. Kitty, has changed genders throughout the course of the series. Yeah. In season 3, Mr. Kitty is a sought-after female cat in heat that partakes in a cat orgy of epic proportions. In season 12, it's revealed that Mr. Kitty can spray out a concentrated urine required for cheesing, something only male cats can do. Number 24. When Butters was just a non-speaking background character, he was referred to as Puff Puff for the first two seasons. It wasn't until the season 3 episode, Two Guys Naked in a Hot Tub, that he got his big break. Number 25. The song Montage in the sports training sequence during the episode Aspen is the same song used in Matt and Trey's 2004 film Team America World Police, but with slightly altered lyrics. Number 26. Many of the show's staff veterans voice recurring characters on the show. Supervising producer Jennifer Howe voices Wendy's best friend Baby Stevens. Number 27. South Park has a habit of changing their characters' names over the course of the series. Jimmy Vollmer's last name was originally Swanson, Token Black's last name used to be a less blunt Williams, and Chris Stotch was originally Steven Stotch. Number 28. Matt Stone and Trey Parker apparently don't remember creating the Season 3 episode Sexual Harassment Panda. They attribute this to their exhilarating efforts creating South Park bigger, longer, and uncut, whose production had ended around the same time Season 3's production began. They compare the production of Season 3 to something of a dream, with episodes like Sexual Harassment Panda being composed of delusionary writing. Despite this, they think the episode's still pretty funny. Number 29. Parker and Stone initially wrote the film South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut as something as a grand finale for the TV series. They personally thought that the show's second and third seasons were terrible enough to warrant its cancellation. Figuring they had nothing else to lose, they decided to make the movie a musical. Number 30. Production on South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut lasted for just one year. It usually takes an average of three years to complete a feature-length animated film. Number 31. Originally, the movie's title was South Park All Hell Breaks Loose. The Motion Picture Association of America had a strict rule forbidding the use of the word hell in a movie title for the sake of the film's promotional material. Even though plenty of movies before South Park had used the word hell in their titles, Matt Stone and Trey Parker gave in to the MPAA. Instead of All Hell Breaks Loose, Stone and Parker made their title into a dick joke. Bigger, longer, and uncut. Which the MPAA actually approved, only realizing the title's true meaning afterwards. Number 32. South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut cost $21 million to make, and went on to rake in over $52 million domestic, and over $80 million worldwide. Number 33. At the end of South Park Bigger, Longer, and uncut, Kenny removes his hood for the first time in South Park history. Number 34. In the film, Kenny is voiced by Mike Judge, creator of Beavis and Butthead and King of the Hill. Yep. Number 35. Since the film, Kenny also talked without his hood in the Halloween episode A Nightmare on FaceTime. Kenny goes dressed as Iron Man, and his voice is only slightly modded with a robot voice. Number 36. In the credits for South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, Saddam Hussein is credited as being played by himself. Even the credits have jokes. Number 37. In the film, the song called What Would Brian Boitano Do is a callback to a joke from the old short the Spirit of Christmas, in which the boys ask themselves, what would Brian Boitano do if he had to support either Santa or Jesus in the fight? Instead, the Olympic skater takes the high road and teaches the boys about the true meaning of Christmas, just like the real Brian Boitano would do. Number 38. What would Brian Boitano do if he found out South Park was ribbing on him? He'd take it in stride and find it hilarious. Boitano loves that an entire generation of children look at him as some sort of Chuck Norris type figure, even if they know nothing of his victories in the Olympics. VH1 even did a special on South Park, in which they tried to get celebrities at the show picked on to come on to discuss the episodes. The thick-skinned Brian Boitano was the only one that participated. Kanye could learn a thing or two from Brian. Number 39. While Stone and Parker didn't need permission to use Brian Boitano's name and likeness in their movie, Brian apparently needed Stone and Parker's permission to use What Would Brian Boitano Do on t-shirts he created for charity. Number 40. The South Park movie's song, Hell Isn't Good, was performed by Metallica's James Hetfield. Apparently, he wanted to keep this performance a secret. Number 41. You can see at the end of the film that, according to Cartman's battle with Saddam Hussein, his VJ considers the name Barbara Streisand a swear word. Number 
42. Long before he would receive praise for his Broadway musical, The Book of Mormon, Trey Parker received praise for his musical talents at the Academy Awards in 2000. Parker was nominated for Best Original Song for Blaine Canada in South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut. Number 43. Trey Parker and Matt Stone attended the 72nd Academy Awards dressed like women, specifically in outfits that resemble dresses previously worn by Gwyneth Paltrow and Jennifer Lopez. They also decided to take acid before coming to the ceremony. Not your typical Oscar pre-party, or is it? Number 44. Being the huge South Park nerd that he was, Robin Williams led a stellar live performance of the movie's Oscar-nominated song, Blaine Canada. Number 45. The episode Proper Condom Use was based on teenagers' frustrations in the 80s due to the general public's demonization of sex during the AIDS epidemic, and Parker and Stone were 80s teens, of course. Number 46. The buttheads seen in How to Eat With Your Butt were based off comics that Trey Barker drew in high school, in which people had butts for heads. At one point, he seriously considered making it a premise for a show, but thought it would have been too juvenile. Coming from the co-creator of Terrence and Philip, that's really saying something. Number 47. The fight between Timmy and Jimmy in Cripple Fight was choreographed after an identical fight sequence in the movie They Live. They even animated it to the movie's original score. Number 48. Jimmy was supposed to be a one-off character that was created specifically to fight Timmy in Cripple Fight. In that episode, he actually isn't from South Park, but from a nearby town. Jimmy later spontaneously showed up in the classroom of South Park Elementary without explanation, simply because the writers loved him so much, even arguably more than Timmy. <laughs> Number 49. According to a penis size chart seen in the episode TMI, Timmy's full name is Timmy Birch. Penis charts can teach you a lot. Number 50. A rumor circulated that Trey and Matt had two versions of the episode about last night produced. One where Obama won the 2008 election, and another where John McCain won. Boom, baby! This is false. The South Park crew thought Obama would win, so the only episode they produced focused on his victory. Their backup plan, if McCain won, was that they would overdub the episode with drunken commentary, creating something similar to Mystery Science Theater 3000. Number 51. While most South Park episodes are made in six days, the Imagination Land saga was developed over a course of three months prior to its air date. Why? Because Imagination Land was intended to be the second South Park movie, but the crew thought the story didn't loan itself well to a theatrically released film. They decided instead to split the story up into three episodes released over the course of three weeks. Despite this change of heart, the Imagination Land saga was released later on DVD and edited together to resemble a feature-length film. Number 52. Due to voice actor Isaac Hayes' abrupt departure from the show, Chef's lines in his final episode, The Return of Chef, are all spliced sentences using recordings from previous episodes. Strangely enough, it actually fits into the idea of Chef being brainwashed pretty well. Number 53. Darth Chef's voice actor, Peter Serafinowicz, also dubbed Darth Maul's line in Star Wars Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. Number 54. In the episode, I'm a Little Bit Country, Benjamin Frank Franklin was voiced by none other than Norman Lear. Lear is responsible for creating the TV classics All in the Family, The Jeffersons, and Stanford and Son. Number 55. Man Bear Pig is an allegory for global warming. Parker and Stone came up with the idea for the creature after watching former Vice President Al Gore's documentary about global warming, called An Inconvenient Truth. In the film, Al Gore repeatedly preaches about the dangers of global warming and how nobody takes him seriously, but that they should. In the South Park episode, the creators show Gore as being somewhat desperate and using this cause for his own fame. Number 56. The scene where Cartman revives Kyle after the Man Bear Pig attack is similar to the CPR scene between Ed Harris and Elizabeth Mastrantonio in The Abyss. Number 57. Nobody on the writing staff knew who Mysterian was at the time of his first appearance, except for Parker and Stone, who always knew he was actually Kenny. Number 58. In the episode Mysterian Rises, the scene in which Cartman bonds with Cthulhu is a shot for shot replica of a scene from the Studio Ghibli film My Neighbor Totoro. Number 59. The episode Gluten Free Ebola was based on the entire South Park's writing room adopting a gluten free diet. It began when one writer named Kurt became gluten free and claimed he was much happier because of it. The rest of the writers made fun of him, until they slowly began adopting a gluten-free diet one by one, with the exception of one staff writer. I guess he really needs his cheesy poofs. Number 60. For season 18, Randy was just supposed to pretend to be Lord, but everything changed after Parker and Stone read an article in response to the first episode, in which Randy dressed up as Lord. The journalist called South Park's staff insensitive for making Lord Stan's father, claiming Lord was an artist with depth and deserved better. After reading the article, the South Park writers decided to make this journalist's twisted perception a reality. Thus, Randy became Lord's true identity. Number 61. Lord responded to her South Park representation, as well as a young female pop star being accused of being a 45-year-old male geologist can. She personally found it hilarious, and found herself singing, yeah, 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 I am Lord, for hours after seeing the episode. Number 62. In the episode Snook, Hillary Clinton's Southern accent is a spoof on when she delivered a speech in Selma, Alabama in a notable Southern drawl. Number 63. The Chewbacca defense used in the episode Chef Aid was a fictitious defense used by Johnny Cochran. That 
does not make sense. Similar to his red herring tactics in the O.J. Simpson trial, Cochran stated to the jury, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. In reference to an earlier part in the trial, when prosecutor Christopher Darden asked Mr. Simpson to try on a bloody glove found at the murder scene. If Chewbacca lives on Endor, you must acquit. Number 64. For the season 18 finale featuring PewDiePie, the online game vlogger actually recorded his lines while on vacation in Japan and suffering from a bad case of the flu. Wow, that's a trooper. Number 65. PewDiePie has actually done a Let's Play of South Park, The Stick of Truth. Despite how many game publishers typically feel about Let's Play, Parker and Stone are actually appreciative of the ones for Stick of Truth and see them as free publicity for their product. Number 66. In the episode Go Fund Yourself, Washington Redskins owner Dan Snyder picks up a thrown out newspaper, looks into the camera, and cries. This is actually a reference to a commercial for a long running ad campaign by Keep American Beautiful Inc., a foundation committed to preventing pollution in the United States. The commercial featured a powerful image of a Native American looking into the camera and crying. Number 67. The episode Freemium Isn't Free was based on pitches the South Park studio received from developers of Freemium games, who wanted to create a freemium game similar to The Simpsons Tapped Out or Family Guy that quest for stuff. The developers put an emphasis on creating an addicting slot machine experience first and a good game last. Number 68. Happy Holograms was based on Parker and Stone's own frustrations with the death of the communal television experience that families once shared. They find that now their wives and children are separated from each other by their various tablets, which they prefer over an actual TV. Number 69. For the episode Tweak x Craig, South Park turned to their fan base for help. Viewers were asked to submit their fan art of Tweak and Craig in the Yaoi art style. Yaoi is fan fiction that center around romantic relationships between male characters. Number 70. Of all the episodes in the series, there are only two episodes that the main boys don't appear in. Season 4's Pip and Season 10's A Million Little Fibers. Number 71. Kenny has died a total of 97 times in the show over the course of 86 episodes. 98 if you count Rob Schneider as Kenny. Rob Schneider is... Kenny. Number 72. While Matt Stone looks upon the show's earlier years more fondly, Trey Parker personally hates the first three seasons of the show and could care less if they were spontaneously erased from time itself. Well, we are our own worst critics. Number 73. Of everything they've done in the show, Trey Parker's absolute favorite South Park story is the Imagination Land trilogy. Number 74. When Saddam Hussein was in prison, the U.S. Marines guarding him played South Park bigger, longer, and uncut for him several times, showing him the cartoon version of himself in the film. The soldier sent Parker and Stone a signed picture of Saddam in captivity and enjoying their film. Matt Stone considers this a highlight of his career. Number 75. After the episode Free Hat, Parker and Stone received a letter from Steven Spielberg, who thanked the duo, claiming he had finally made it now that he was officially a celebrity villain on South Park. To this day, Parker and Stone still can't tell whether or not the letter was sarcastic and written from a place of anger or not. Number 76. Free Hat was made at a time when Steven Spielberg had publicly announced that he was going to digitally touch up scenes from Raiders of the Lost Ark, the way George Lucas had touched up the original Star Wars trilogy. According to a source at Lucasfilm, Spielberg abruptly changed his mind after Free Hat aired, implying that the episode may have what snapped Spielberg out of it. Number 77. According to Matt Stone, after the episode Super Best Friends aired, David Blaine's fans began asking him for his Blaintology book that South Park made fun of. David Blaine had to tell these fans that no such book actually existed. Number 78. South Park caused even more confusion about David Blaine's image when people began asking him why he always said twa at the end of his sentences, which he doesn't. Blaine called Stone and Parker to ask where they got the impression, and according to Trey Parker, it was mostly random, but originated from a friend he had in high school that was a heavy metal musician that frequently made a twa sound. Number 79. At the end of the episode 201, Kyle's speech was heavily censored by Comedy Central, as well as the image of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Due to the network's fear of terrorist threats, it wasn't until four years after the episode aired that the uncensored speech was leaked onto the internet, proving that the bleeps were not some sort of meta joke on the show's part. Ironically, Kyle's speech is about the dangers of letting terrorism censor comedy. Number 80. While many have merely dismissed the show as nothing more than endless profanities and toilet humor, South Park has actually been incorporated into a college curriculum. McDaniel College in Maryland offers a class in which professors screen South Park episodes for the students to break down and discuss the social issues covered throughout various episodes. Number 81. Cartman's cover of Lady Gaga's Poker Face is actually a playable song in the game Rock Band. It was added as a piece of downloadable content. Number 82. The episode Simpsons Did It came from Parker and Stone's frustrations of coming up with story ideas and finding out the Simpsons have already done it. In fact, in the episode The Wacky Molestation Adventure, Cartman was originally going to blot out the sun to get back at Stan and Kyle. And they worked all weekend on it, only to find out it was just like a Simpsons episode. Number 83. Several episodes focus on Kyle and his religion. Being the lone Jew has resulted in animosity between him and the anti-Semitic Cartman, which becomes stronger as the series progresses. Parker and Stone have compared this relationship to the one shared by Archie Bunker and Michael Stivic on the 70s sitcom All in the Family. Number 84. When developing Kyle's character, Parker recalled there being only one Jewish student in his hometown of Conifer, Colorado, and described her as being the token Jewish person. He described a moment where all the kids sang Christmas songs and she had to come out 
out by herself and sing a Hanukkah song. Number 85. So we all know Leopold Butter Stotch, but how did he get his name? Parker and Stone actually got the name after calling the producer, Eric Stowe, Little Buddy for about three years, and eventually nicknaming him Butters. The character Butters' is warm and caring personality is based on Stowe. Number 86. Butters is the only kid in South Park who normally doesn't use curse words or profanity. His happy-go-lucky persona has been described as resembling that of a typical 1950s sitcom child character. Number 87. Randy and Sharon Marsh's names are derived from Parker's parents' names. According to Parker, Randy is the dingbat in the entire show, but he also said that his own dad is a great father, adding, I hold my father very dear, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to rip on him. Number 88. In the season 1 DVD, Parker stated that Mr. Mackey was based on his school counselor, who, when he saw Parker in the halls during class, would simply say, okay, Trey, get back to class now, okay? Number 89. Parker and Stone said that they chose Kathy Lee Gifford for the episode Weight Gain 4000 completely at random, not based on any particular reason or distaste for her. Shortly after it aired, the tabloid The Globe hired Susan Johnson to film herself seducing Frank Gifford, Kathy Lee Gifford's husband, for a newspaper story. The incident was the first of what Parker and Stone called the South Park Curse, in which something tragic or embarrassing happens to a celebrity shortly before or after they're featured on South Park. Number 90. In Weight Gain 4000, Gifford appears at a parade hidden inside a bulletproof glass bubble. The bubble was inspired by an appearance that Pope John Paul II made in the Pope Mobile during his trip to Denver, which Parker and Stone also attended. They thought the design of the Pope Mobile, which has a bulletproof booth built into a back of a modified truck, was hilarious. Number 91. While Cartman Gets an Anal Probe was created almost entirely with construction paper, Waking 4000 was the first South Park episode made completely using computers. Number 92. There have been a slew of consultant writers for South Park, including comedians like Bill Hader, Kristen Schaal, Kenny Holtz, and Brad Neely. Number 93. SNL alum Bill Hader also produced many episodes, and even did some voice work, including the voice of the newsman in the episode's sponsored content and truth in advertising. Number 94. In 2013, South Park opened with an entirely 3D opening credit scene. This was accompanied with new animation and gave the show a new third dimension for its opening. Number 95. Whatever happened to Mr. Derp? Yes, the fan favorite character, Mr. Derp, replaced Chef in some earlier episodes. But where's he been since? He debuted in season 3's The Succubus, but you can still see Mr. Derp make a cameo in some episodes, sometimes as part of crowds, and sometimes even in the kitchen saying something weird. He was even in the episode Timmy 2000 throwing lemonade at the Phil Collins show. <coughs> Number 96. Speaking of missing characters, whatever happened to Mephisto? Well, according to the show's creators, he's not dead. In fact, he made a cameo in the Queef Free music video. Number 97. In the episode Guitar Queero, when Thad says, I quit, I quit, I quit, he's referencing a scene from Tom Hanks' musical film, That Thing You Do. Number 98. Would you believe me if I told you the show was still using construction paper? Of course not, but it's pretty close. After the pilot episode, the construction paper used for the show was scanned and used for future episodes in the animation software, Maya. They've used some of the same textures for 19 years. Years. Number 99. Matt Stone used to voice Kyle without making any technical changes, but now he uses Pro Tools to add a childlike inflection to help make the voice sound more like a fourth grader's. Number 100. Parker and Stone worked with composer Robert Lopez on their musical The Book of Mormon. During the collaboration, the duo asked Lopez to come to their studio and create an episode with them and workshop ideas. Their collaboration led to the episode Broadway Brodown. Number 101. At the turn of the century, many shows and products used the year 2000 in their titles. To make fun of America being obsessed with 2000, Parker started putting the number and episode titles for a while. Some of them include Quintuplets 2000, The Tooth Fairy's Tats 2000, Cartman's Silly Hate Crime 2000, and Timmy 2000. Number 102. We all know the running gag of Kenny Dye. But by now, Parker and Stone have pretty much abandoned the joke. So the last time we see Kenny die is in the episode Titties and Dragons, where Princess Kenny leaps from the top of the Sony building and falls to his death. Unfortunately, this time Stan and Kyle were not around to say, Oh my god, you killed Kenny! You bastards! Number 103. Another lesser known running gag on the show is an alien visitor that can be seen from time to time in the background or between frames of the show. Number 104. Kenny's death had an impact on pop culture. The character's death influenced Master P to write the song Kenny's Dead, which was featured on the Chef 8 album. Number 105. An introductory short precedes the episode Cartman Gets an Anal Probe. The short, called A Fireside Minute with Matt Stone and Trey Parker, shows Stone and Parker sitting in front of a fireplace with a dog named Old Scratch. Throughout the short, Old Scratch occasionally changes breeds. It's a different dog every time they cut to it. Bet you didn't notice that. Number 106. During the Guitar Hero and Rock Band craze, Rock Band added the song Timmy and the Lords of the Underworld to their official store for players to choose. Number 107. While his name is never revealed in the show, the lonely fat nerd in Make Love Not Warcraft is referred to as Noob's Pony 
Boner in the episode script. With 25 years under its belt, South Park is an institution of satire, animation, and entertainment in general. The past few years have seen the series go through a number of changes, ups and downs, and of course, a global pandemic. So let's take a closer look at what Stan, Kyle, Cartman, and Kenny have been up to over the past few seasons. This is 107 Facts About South Park. Welcome to Channel Frederator, the cartoon central of the internet. Before we begin, we publish new videos every week, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Number 1. From its earliest days, South Park was created by Matt Stone and Trey Parker. And you won't be surprised to hear that the two are still working on South Park to this day. Number 2. In preparation for season 21, Parker took some time in an interview to reflect on season 20. Parker said that 20 was rife with difficulties, describing it as a head fuck, and saying how they were so happy when it was done. Number 3. For season 21, Matt Stone and Trey Parker and the rest of the team at South Park Studios wanted to go back to South Park's roots and focus on the kids. They had wanted to do that all throughout season 20, but didn't really get the chance. Number 4. At the time, they still had to lean into the story of Mr. Garrison as Trump. They couldn't avoid that plot point and had to balance it with the other stories that they wanted to tell. So, while Garrison would be included in season 21, he would take less of the spotlight. Number 5. One of the biggest struggles of season 20 was the serialization format that the writers were trying. Matt Stone said that in some ways it was cool and in some ways it trapped us, and that the way they do South Park is not compatible with serialization. Number 6. Matt Stone described how they spent the first 18 seasons of the show looking for each episode to have a resolution, where other shows specifically designed the ends of their episodes to lead to the next. Number 7. In that spirit, for the first episode of season 21, South Park Studios considered leaving that episode's ending open and without the sitcom ending resolution they'd done for so long. Number 8. Serialization in season 20 made Trey Parker better appreciate the tonal differences between each South Park episode in the past. He said he missed the variety. One week would be about the kids, another week would be about Randy. It was always changing focus. Number 9. Moving into season 21, Trey Parker had one part particular through line he wanted to do more, with Cartman's relationship with Heidi Turner. He liked her character and didn't want her to just disappear. He also thought it was funny that Cartman was now stuck in this relationship. Number 10. Remember how the end of season 20 heavily teased the looming, militant rise of member berries? Well, that's pretty much the last we ever hear from them, so why did this plot get dropped? Number 11. According to Trey Parker, member berries completely vanished because of the movie Ready Player One. He said that Ready Player One was the most memberberry thing ever invented. We can't out memberberry that. Turns out that all the memberberries left South Park to go be in Ready Player One. Parker said it himself, so that's canon. Number 12. With or without memberberries, season 21 officially debuted on September 13th, 2017, kicking off with the first episode, White People Renovating Houses. Number 13. Many parts of the episode are parodying the Unite the Right rally that took place in Charlottesville just a month earlier in August 20. 2017. This episode actually activated a number of viewers' Google Homes and Amazon Alexas. Hearing the episode, viewers' digital assistants were suddenly setting 7am alarms and adding all kinds of wild items to shopping lists. Of course, this was no accident. South Park Studios intentionally set out to mess with people. Number 15. The second episode of season 21, Put It Down, was nominated for a primetime Emmy for Outstanding Animated Program. Number 16. Episode 4, Franchise Prequel, was released as a tie-in for the latest South Park game, South Park The Fractured But Whole. This episode serves as a prequel and directly leads into the events of the game. Number 17. In fact, the final scene of the episode in Cartman's basement is nearly identical to the scene from The Fractured But Whole's promotional video from E3 2017. There's just a few differences in the dialogue. Number 18. Episode 5, Hummels and Heroin features a song by hip-hop artist Killer Mike, specifically written for the episode called They Got Me Locked Up In Here. Number 19. Just a day before Hummels and Heroin came out, South Park released the new video game that I mentioned earlier, The Fractured Butthole. You guys getting 
I'm tired of that yet? Number 20. The game was published by Ubisoft in collaboration with South Park Studios. Number 21. Like the Stick of Truth, the preceding South Park game, the fractured butthole is written entirely by Matt Stone and Trey Parker themselves. Number 22. The fractured butthole is actually twice as big as the Stick of Truth. The final script ended up being about 360 pages long, around the same length of about four to five feature films according to the game's executive producer, Frank C. Agnon II. Number 23. Between the two of them, Matt Stone and Trey Parker alone recorded about 20,000 different lines of dialogue for the game. Number 24. At one point during development, Trey Parker got sick and needed emergency gallbladder surgery. He actually managed to convince his doctor to let him leave the hospital for a time to record lines. Number 25. The game originally had a different title, The Butthole of Time. However, Ubisoft wouldn't let that fly. The publisher said that retailers would refuse to stock the game with butthole in the title. Number 26. And so, Trey Parker sat at his desk, determined to find out a workaround. Sure enough, he found a family-friendly way to sneak butthole into the title with the fractured butthole. Number 27. Funny enough, unlike the Stick of Truth, the Fractured Butthole was released worldwide without any censorship. The game's associate producer, Kimberly Wiegened, said that it wasn't because the game was less raunchy. Instead, she suggested that censorship standards had likely evolved to be more flexible. Number 28. Season 21's sixth episode, Sons of Witches, is a Halloween episode. Therefore, the South Park opening was modified to have a Halloween theme for this episode. Number 29. Episode 7, Doubling Down, aired on November 8th, 2017, one year after Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. The episode even throws out a happy anniversary at the end. Number 30. In Episode 9, Super Hard PC-ness, Kyle starts Millennials Against Canada, a direct callback to his mom's Mothers Against Canada from the 1999 South Park movie, South Park. Bigger, longer, and uncut. Both even have MAC shirts. Number 31, in episode 10, Splatty Tomato, you can see Ike riding a dog. A true Canadian, Ike rides a Newfoundland, a dog breed native to Canada. Number 32, and so season 21 was finally finished. Season 22 would debut just about a year later on September 26, 2018 with the first episode, Dead Kids. Number 33, leading up to season 22, Comedy Central aired sarcastic commercials urging people to reach into their hearts, make the right decision, and for good and all, cancel South Park. Number 34. Well, the joke might have hit a little too hard. When Dead Kids debuted, it hit a 1.09 viewership rating, making it the lowest rated season premiere in South Park's history. Number 35. Unsurprisingly, episode 2, A Boy and a Priest, was denounced by the Catholic League for Religious and Civil Rights. The group stated that the episode's assertions were factually inaccurate and that, and I'm quoting them here, the cartoon victim carrier should have been depicted as adolescents, not kids. That is a real quote. Number 36. The suggestion for Father Maxi to be sent to the Maldives is a joke under itself. The only legal religion in the Maldives is Islam, and the country is considered one of the most anti-Christian countries in the world. Number 37. The title of episode 3, The Problem with Apu, is a direct reference to the 2017 documentary The Problem with Apu, which examines racial stereotypes depicted by Apu from The Simpsons. Number 38. The title isn't the only cancel culture reference either. The whole idea of Mr. Hanky taking Ambien and tweeting racist stuff is making fun of Roseanne Barr. She had tweeted some offensive material at the time and also blamed them on the same drug. Number 39. Episode 4, Tegrity Farms, is the first episode to feature what would become the long-running joke-slash-setting of, you guessed it, Tegrity Farms. It all started here. Number 40. Both the title and plot of Episode 5, The Scoots, is a parody of the Alfred Hitchcock horror classic classic, The Birds. Number 41. Set on Halloween, this episode features a number of background characters wearing different superhero Halloween costumes referencing heroes in the fractured butthole. You can also spot some Fortnite costumes thrown in there too. Number 42. Episode 6, Time to Get Serial, is part one of a two-episode plot centering around, yes, 
Al Gore, and Man Bear Pig. The follow-up episode is titled Nobody Got Cereal. Number 43. The two episodes make fun of climate change denial, including South Park's own denial from back in the day. South Park originally introduced Al Gore and Man Bear Pig to make fun of the alarmism behind global warming. Well, turns out he was right and South Park was wrong, so these two episodes are a way for South Park to point the finger at themselves. Number 44. When asked about the updated portrayal, Al Gore said he thought it was a hell of a statement by South Park and he appreciated it a lot. Number 45. For Nobody Got Cereal, the fight between Man Bear Pig and Satan is actually modeled after the fight between the Hulk and the Abomination in 2008's The Incredible Hulk. Number 46. In episode 9, Unfulfilled, Jeff Bezos is depicted as a Talosian from the 1965 Star Trek pilot The Cage. Talosians are actually the first aliens ever shown on Star Trek. Number 47. There's another more subtle Star Trek reference in this episode, too. Larry Zawiski has a Klingon Empire flag on his bike. Number 48. Larry was actually played by Casey Nicola, the choreographer and co-director of the Book of Mormon with Trey Parker. He also appears in the next episode. Episode. Number 49. The end of episode 10, Bike Parade, features a number of cameos from some long absent South Park characters, like Dr. Mephesto, Mr. Slave, Big Gay Al, and even Mr. Garrison, who hadn't appeared all season. Number 50. Season 23 debuted on September 25th, 2019, with episode 1, Mexican Joker. Number 51. Just two episodes in, South Park managed to ruffle even more feathers with Band in China. And yes, indeed, the episode episode was banned in China. Number 52. In fact, after this episode, the entire South Park series was banned in China. All 23 seasons were completely removed from the Chinese internet. All traces of the show were scrubbed from Chinese movie review website Dubon, and nothing comes up if you search South Park on popular Chinese social media site Weibo. There are even more examples. The Chinese government South Park erasure was thorough. Number 53. So why exactly was South Park banned? Unsurprisingly, it's because the episode was critical of the Chinese government's rampant censorship, specifically when it comes to the Dalai Lama, homosexuality, and Winnie the Pooh. Number 54. South Park Studios actually cast the episode's Winnie the Pooh impersonator Brock Baker just two days before the episode debuted. He also voiced Piglet in the episode. Number 55. Banned in China was actually released on October 2nd, 2019, just one day after the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Number 56. South Park responded to China's ban with an official apology, leading in with, just like the NBA, we welcome the Chinese censors into our homes and into our hearts. Number 57. Those shots fired at the NBA are in reference to the Houston Rockets general manager Daryl Morey. Morey once posted, fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong. In response, Chinese mega company Tencent, NBA's partner in China, suspended all business dealings with the Houston Rockets. Not long after that, Morey profusely apologized for supporting the protests in Hong Kong at the time. Number 58. On October 8th, protesters in Hong Kong actually played the banned South Park episode in the Shem Shui Po district, just as a middle finger to the government. Number 59. Also, the songs that Crimson Dawn plays are real metal songs. The song they play at the fair is Useless Sacrifice by Death Decline, and the song in the barn, A Second Skin by Dying Fetus. Number 60. Oh, and the animation of the scene where Randy strangles Winnie the Pooh is a direct callback to the early strangulation scene from No Country for Old Men. Number 61. Episode 3, Shots, is actually the 300th episode of South Park. Number 62. The episode even slightly references this accolade. Randy celebrates that Tegrity Farms has made $300,000. Number 63. Also, for the first time in 300 episodes, Randy and Cartman's mom Leanne actually directly interact with each other. Number 64. Cartman's comments about free speech and Taco Tuesday are both digs at LeBron James. Around the time the episode came out, LeBron cautioned Hong Kong protesters that free speech has negative consequences, and he even tried to trademark the phrase Taco Tuesday. Number 65. Also, the Goo Man in this episode is a parody of Daniel Plainview, Daniel Day-Lewis's ruthless, oil-hungry character from There Will Be Blood. Number 66. Episode 
5, Tegrity Farms Halloween Special also got its own special Halloween themed opening number with Randy at the center of the action. Number 67. The events and even the music of this episode are based on the horror movie Creep Show. Number 68. There's a tiny Easter egg in the background of Randy's party. You can see OG South Park Cryptid Scuzzlebutt carved into a pumpkin. Number 69. The sixth episode season finale is not, in fact, the season finale. Instead, the title refers to the end of marijuana growing season for Randy and Tegrity Farms. Number 70. Mr. Garrison suggests that Randy use a system called Darvo. Deny, attack, reverse victim, and offender. Turns out Darvo is an actual strategy that psychologists have studied being used by psychological abusers. Number 71. The row of Tegrity jars in the background at the end of the episode are named for the first six episodes of the season, except for the rightmost one which reads Tegrity Burger. The last one is still an allusion to the substitute meat of Let Them Eat Goo. Number 70. 72. In episode 7, Board Girls, we learn PC Principal's actual name, Peter Charles. Turns out those were his initials. What did you think they stood for? Number 73. Also, Heather Swanson, aka Blade Swaggart, is visually and orally based off the late great wrestling champion Macho Man Randy Savage. Number 74. South Park actually shouts out some real life board gaming YouTube channels in this episode. At the Dice Studs meeting, they name drop BGG, Board Game Geek, Game night and the Dice Tower. BGG and the Dice Tower actually thanked the South Park team on Twitter. Number 75. In February of 2022, Trey Parker actually went on Dice Tower's channel as a guest to talk about his top 10 favorite board games. Number 76. Also, in a way, this episode subtly references the events of a different episode, Freemium Isn't Free. Board Girls follows up on Stan's interest in board games as an alternative to addictive gambling and mobile games. Number 77. When it first aired, episode 8, Turd Burglars only managed to pull in 660,000 viewers, making it the lowest viewed episode in South Park series history. Number 78. Also, this is the first time we hear Kenny's unmuffled voice since Mysterion Rises from 2010. Number 79. Episode 9, Basic Cable, drops some extra Terrence and Philip lore. Turns out the show has 23 seasons, just like South Park itself. Number 80. We also get the same info on the Queef Sisters. Their show has had 10 seasons since they first debuted in season 13. Number 81. But forget the Queef Sisters. Basic Cable sees the brief return of the Crab People with their own show. This is the first time they've appeared on South Park since their debut in South Park is Gay as the Queer Eye for the Straight Guy cast. Number 82. The end card of the episode offers the opportunity to buy streaming rights to the Scott Malkinson show, urging interested parties to call Trey. Well, that's a real number you can call. The Fair Play Colorado number number goes to a voicemail read by Trey Parker, offering streaming rights for a number of shows mentioned in the episode. Number 83. In fact, the whole episode is a meta joke about how the rights to stream South Park were bought by Warner Brothers and HBO from Disney-owned Hulu in October 2019. It's estimated that the rights went for $500 to $550 million. Number 84. As part of the deal, starting June 2020, all then 23 seasons of South Park would be made available on HBO Max. At least, that was the original plan. Number 85. Being banned in China is one thing, but episode 10, Christmas Snow, is actually the first episode of South Park to be banned in Russia. It's all thanks to the cocaine commercial. Number 86. When the COVID pandemic first started, South Park wasn't sure they'd even be able to keep going. Between quarantine and lockdown during the early months of the pandemic, Trey Parker thought the show was over. Number 87. Matt Stone was actually the first one to suggest working out a way to make the show from home. Sure enough, South Park Studios found its footing amid the new regulations. Number 88. On September 30th, 2020, season 24 kicked off with the hour-long pandemic special. Well, 48 minutes without commercials, that is. Number 89. This is actually the first time in South Park history that they've had an hour-long special like this. Number 90. Also, the pandemic special is the first South Park episode to be released on HBO Max as part of their new deal, 24 hours after the episode debuted. Number 90. Sure enough, the pandemic special was followed up with episode 2, the South Park U vaccination special, months later in March 2021. Number 92. Trey Parker and Matt Stone even have a brief cameo in this episode as themselves. On Mr. White's bulletin board of evil elites, there's a picture of them from the movie Basketball. Number 93. South Park would see another big shakeup in August of 2021. They sign 
signed a massive deal with Viacom CBS and MTV Entertainment Studios for 14 films to be released on Paramount+. Plus. Number 94. The deal also renewed South Park for an additional three 10-episode seasons through season 30, which is set to release in 2027. The deal was estimated to be about $900 million over the six-year term. Number 95. While Viacom described these new South Park projects as films in their marketing, Trey Parker and Matt Stone made sure to clarify that they were made for TV films. Parker said that these films could be as long or short as they wanted. Number 96. At the time, the South Park team was still working remotely, with the South Park Studios location closed. At one point, while making the specials in the previous year, Parker was in LA while Stone was in New York, and the two never actually worked face to face. Number 97. The first film episode as part of the Viacom CBS deal was South Park post-COVID. It was released on Paramount Plus November 25th, 2021, and was followed up a few weeks later with the second Paramount Plus special, South Park post-COVID, The Return of COVID, as a direct sequel. Number 98. These four specials would count as season 24, but season 25 would begin in earnest with Pajama Day. The episode aired on February 2nd, 2022 as a normal episode, not exclusive to Paramount+. Plus. It also appeared on HBO Max the next day. Number 99. Pajama Day was actually the first episode to air in South Park's normal time slot since the pandemic began. Number 100. In episode 3, City People, the Coney Island hot dog stand, is an actual restaurant in Bailey, Colorado. The show says that it's an Aspen Park, but it hasn't been there since 2006. Number 101. South Park closed out the season on March 16th, 2022 with the Credigree Weed St. Patrick's Day special. Freeman's Tacos, Morgan Freeman's Taco Stand, is actually an Easter egg. It's also a vendor in the Fractured Butthole game. Number 102. At just six episodes, season 25 is the shortest season in South Park history. By runtime, at least, season 24 is still shorter with only four episodes in the form of specials. Number 103. Two more specials would appear on Paramount+. Plus: Streaming Wars Part 1 on June 1st, 2022, and Part 2 over a month later on July 13th, 2022. Number 104. With that, South Park's 25th anniversary was just one month away to the date. The show first aired on August 13th, 1997 with Cartman Gets an Anal Probe. Number 105. Sure enough, South Park had big plans to celebrate. They held two concerts at the Red Rocks Amphitheater in Colorado on August 9th and 10th. The concert featured songs across South Park's history, played by Trey Parker, Matt Stone, and even bands Primus and Ween. Number 106. The concert aired on Comedy Central on August 13th, 25 years to the day of South Park's debut. It was available on Paramount Plus the next day. Number 107. At time of writing, season 26 of South Park is officially underway, having kicked off on February 8th, 2023 with Cupid Yay. Jokingly, Matt Stone, who's Jewish, is credited as sole creator, writer, and director, while Trey Parker, who's not Jewish, was only credited as his assistant. Who knows what the rest of season 26 has in store? You don't want to just hear about the show at large though, do you? You also want to hear about someone from the show who is large. The biggest of the original crew. So big in fact that we found 107 facts specifically about him. He's not fat, he's festively plump. He's Eric Cartman and around six years ago, this video racked up 2.2 million views. Respect his authorita. This is 107 Cartman facts you should know. Respect my authorita. If you thought Bart Simpson was a bad boy, then you probably lost your mind when you met Cartman. Hey guys, I'm Joe and we're here to check out everyone's favorite big bone resident of South Park and how he won hearts all around the world with his offensive and hilarious antics. He'll do whatever it takes to get what he wants, whether it's theft, blackmail, or a wacky business scheme. F you. So get ready for 107 facts about Cartman. Let's get started. <laughs> Cartman's full name is Eric Theodore Cartman. His birthday is on July 1st, which is technically Canada Day. It's pretty funny considering that the movie features a song called Blame Canada. So, blame Cartman? Cartman lives in his mother's home, located at 93345 Avenue de los Mexicanos, in South Park, Colorado. However, his backpack states that his address is 2120 East Bonanza Circle, South Park, Colorado. Maybe it was done so his enemies can't stalk him. Cartman made his first appearance in the short film The Spirit of Christmas, Jesus vs. Frosty, in 1992. In this short, Cartman is murdered by an evil tentacled Frosty the Snowman. When he's killed, one of the other boys exclaims, Oh my god! Frosty killed Kitty! 
Hey! Cartman showed up again in the second iteration of The Spirit of Christmas, Jesus vs. Santa, in 1995. In this short, all of the characters, including Cartman, are much closer to their eventual final versions. Cartman made his first TV appearance in the pilot episode of South Park titled Cartman Gets an Anal Probe. The pilot episode was too long, so some scenes had to be taken out. In the original version, Cartman farted fire because he was fed hot tamales. In this edited version, the cause of his fire farts was due to being anally probed by aliens, like the title suggests. The scene introducing Cartman was also cut out of the pilot. That scene was later put into season 1's fifth episode, An Elephant Makes Love to a Pig. By then, the show had already made the transition from stop motion via construction paper cutouts to digital animation, meaning this one scene is in the original format while the rest of the episode is digital. If Cartman had stayed on the same path that he was put on in the first episode, then the show would be a lot different. Co-creator Trey Parker said he was originally always going to be the kid with satellite dishes coming out of his butt. Cartman was partially inspired and named after co-creator Matt Stone's high school classmate, Matt Karpman. Cartman initially started out as that fat kid that everyone picked on. Clearly, he went on to evolve into someone more diabolical, who picks on everyone else. While developing Cartman, Parker noticed that everyone either remembers an annoying fat kid from their childhood, or that they can identify with having been the annoying fat kid. I'm not fat. I'm Big Boned. Cartman is voiced by South Park co-creator, writer, and director Trey Parker. Of all the South Park characters, Cartman is Parker's favorite. I'm sorry, Mama. In the early days of South Park, the four main boys didn't have very distinct personalities. According to the creators, Cartman was one of the first characters to really carve out a distinct identity. Within the first season, the creators realized that Cartman was similar to Archie Bunker from All in the Family. The creators were big fans of the 1970s sitcom and watched reruns of the show to get a better grip on Cartman's character. Character. Stone credits producer Norman Lear for the creation of South Park because Lear fought so hard for All in the Family and his other shows. Part of the appeal of Cartman was that as an eight-year-old, he could do anything he wanted. The audience accepts that he doesn't really know what he's doing because of his young age, even if that thing is dressing up like Hitler. We forgive him because he's reacting to his environment. Cartman and his friends have such foul mouths because the creators believe that's how little boys act when they are completely left alone. They don't really have much of a filter. Butthole, titties, bows. Speaking of which, Cartman's favorite curse word is tampon. He knows it's not as hardcore as the other curse words he uses, but he still thinks that it's really funny. Blood Prince, frozen tampon Cartman and the gang were in third grade during seasons one, two, and three. They finally went to fourth grade at the start of season four and have been there ever since. Cartman isn't the biggest fan of his gang of friends. He thinks that they all suck ass and aren't all that great. Me nah, you guys nah. Screw you guys, I'm going home. Cartman was the first of the boys to be seen without a hat on. This was in Season 2's episode, Merry Christmas, Charlie Manson. In that same episode, we see Cartman visit his extended family. His family looks and acts much like he does, so we can clearly see that he takes after his mom's side and not his father's. Amen. Cartman's mother was based on the idea of parents who were trying too hard to be their kids' friends instead of being their parent. It's this kind of parenting that the creators claim makes kids really evil. Cartman's mother came close to taming him by recruiting the help of Caesar Milan, aka the dog. Dog Whisperer. At first, she's able to follow the Dog Whisperer's advice to become the dominant animal of the house, so to speak. But she crumbles because in the end, she just wants to be Cartman's friend. Cartman's mom was once on the cover of Crack Whore Magazine. Cartman truly believes it's because she needed the money and ignores his friend's exclamations. In the season two episode, Cartman's mom is still a dirty slut. It's stated that his mom is a hermaphrodite. According to the show's logic, she impregnated a woman with an unknown identity who then gave birth to Cartman. In a 2005 interview, Matt Stone was asked if we would ever know who Cartman's real father was. He joked that it might be Oprah or Will Ferrell. Can you imagine? 12 years later, in season 14, the truth finally came out. The revelation about Cartman's mom being a hermaphrodite was a lie created as a conspiracy to protect the reputation of the Denver Broncos. Cartman's mother was impregnated by a Denver Broncos player, Jack Tennerman, meaning Scott Tennerman is Cartman's older half-brother. In an unaired pilot, Cartman actually had a father and sister living with him at home. The characters don't speak and only appear for a few seconds. He has a pet cat named Mr. Kitty, but it's not clear if Mr. Kitty is female or male. The creators explained this by stating that Mr. Kitty is probably a hermaphrodite. Runs in the family? Or is the kitty part of the conspiracy as well? Cartman has more than one pet. In addition to his cat, he has a pot-bellied pig named Fluffy. Parker and Stone's favorite episodes are the ones when Cartman messes around with butters. Hey, 
I gotta put in my suppository. Can you help me? What? Parker sees Cartman as the dark side of everyone. He feels that everyone has a piece of Cartman inside themselves, and even needs a little bit of him in their life here and there. So what bad things has Cartman done? How about we start off with... Oh yeah, Cartman once started a hippie extermination service. He was thrown in jail for illegally holding hippies prisoner in his basement before the town's hippie infestation forced the townspeople to look to Cartman for help. In the episode Obama Wins, Cartman rigs the 2012 election of Barack Obama versus Mitt Romney. He goes to swing states and steals ballots as part of a conspiracy orchestrated by the Chinese, who are promised the rights to Star Wars by Obama if he secures the presidency. And Cartman demands that the Chinese give him a role in Star Wars for his part in rigging the election. In the episode Ginger Kids, Cartman learns what it's like to be ginger. Kyle and Stan dye his hair red, bleach his skin, and draw freckles on his face. This leads Cartman to form the Ginger Separatist Movement, which seeks to kill all non-gingers in a pool of lava. This was technically payback, since Cartman originally started a campaign against redheads. We claimed our soulless and evil, and unfortunately, it seemed as though somebody agreed. In 2008, Canada's RCMP investigated a Facebook group called National Kick a Ginger Day, Are You Going to Do It? over concerns of real-life bullying and assault. The Facebook group was inspired by Cartman's anti-ginger plot. Come on, guys. Cartman is clearly someone whose footsteps nobody should ever follow. Ever. He is a terrible person. Remember how Cartman became HIV positive in an episode? Well, he then purposefully gave the virus to Kyle. Luckily, the two were both able to be cured. Cartman and Kyle sought out Magic Johnson to find the cure. In the episode Weight Gain 4000, Cartman won the school's Save Our Fragile Planet essay contest. How did he do it? By writing his name on a copy of Henry David Thoreau's Walden. Once, Cartman started up a business that forced crack-addicted babies to fight over crack cocaine for people's entertainment. To justify his actions, he tried to compare the baby's likenesses to real-life controversies around business deals between college athletics and the game's publisher, EA. Since he was two years old, Cartman had always wanted to have one million dollars. He finally gets his dream in the season five episode, Cartman Land. Eventually, Cartman gets bigger goals. It's no longer one million dollars anymore, it's now ten million. Cartman loves money, way more than he loves his friends. In Cherokee hair tampons, Kyle desperately needs a kidney transplant, and Cartman is the only one who is a match. Cartman refuses to give him the transplant unless he gets paid $10 million. In the end, Cartman is tricked into giving the kidney away without getting paid. But that's not all he's done for money. Cartman once pretended to be disabled in order to compete in the Special Olympics and win the $1,000 prize. While he didn't win, he still got the Spirit Award and a gift voucher. Cartman also lobbied Congress to decriminalize stem cell research. This was done under the guise of saving Kenny's life, but the true reason was that so Cartman could make money off of some dead fetuses he found. Cartman even founded his own church to scam parishioners out of their money. This was one of his many plots to get that $10 million. In Christian Rock Hard, Cartman starts a Christian rock band to win a bet against Kyle to see who can make a platinum album first. He makes the band Faith Plus One successful by plagiarizing love songs and replacing the word baby with Jesus. After watching Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, Cartman believes that the film is a call to arms against Jews. In this episode, he dresses as Hitler, forms a mob, and marches through the streets chanting an anti-Semitic war cry in German. Cartman's followers don't stick around, though, because they mistakenly thought that his campaign was for a resurgence of Christianity. Cartman has taken down another peg when Mel Gibson poops on his face. Funny enough, in the episode Juba Cabra, it's revealed that Cartman converted to Judaism after having a vivid hallucinogenic dream. When asked about the worst thing Cartman has ever done, Parker said that it was probably Probably the time when he tricked Scott Tennerman into eating chili made of the remains of his own dead parents. Yeah, that's uh, pretty bad. What made Cartman go so far? He wanted to get revenge on Scott for a series of humiliating stunts, including tricking Cartman into buying a bag of pubic hairs from him. This means that in his act of revenge against Scott, Cartman killed his own father and fed him to his own half-brother. Of course, he didn't know that until the revelation in episode 201 during season 14. After realizing that he killed his own father, Cartman feels bad about himself, not because he killed his birth parent, but because he realizes that he's half ginger. There was some serious debate as to whether Cartman's plan and Scott Tenorman must die went too far. The creators thought it was funny, but they felt that going through with the scene would be setting a new bar for the character. In the end, the crew decided to go through with the plot. However, they agreed that they couldn't have Cartman actually commit murder. This is why Cartman doesn't murder Scott Tenorman's parents himself. He merely creates an elaborate plan that resulted in them being murdered by someone else. The episode was divisive amongst fans. According to Stone, some thought it was hilarious, while others felt it went too far, even for Cartman. But Cartman has killed for lesser things before. When Kenny gets in an accident and is put on life support, Cartman arranges to have the plug pulled. Why? Because Kenny left Cartman his PSP in his will. 
duh. That said, Cartman has saved Kyle's life four times, so maybe he's not all that bad. The first time was when he saved him from a planetarium. The second time, he was tricked into giving Kyle his kidney. The third time was in San Francisco when he saves Kyle and his family from a smog storm. And the fourth, final time was when he brings Kyle back to life after Man Bear Pig attacks him. Cartman's been arrested six times, which is surprisingly low for all the crazy messed up things he's done. In the episode Spooky Fish, we can see Cartman's alternate self from another reality. This evil Eric is nice and selfless and has the classic goatee. Cartman also met his future self. After an enterprise that involved painting houses with poop for revenge, Cartman contemplates taking better care of himself and working harder. Future Cartman appears to tell him that this is the point in time his life turns around, but Cartman rejects the future Cartman and vows to overeat and do drugs, morphing the future Cartman into a fat plumber. In the episode The Sissy, Cartman pretends to be transgender and changes his name to Erica in order to get a special bathroom all to himself. Shenanigans ensue, and by the end of the episode, the school decides that anyone can use any bathroom that they feel the most comfortable in, with one exception. If anyone is uncomfortable with the fact that anyone can use any bathroom, there's a special private bathroom for them, and you know that that one belongs all to Eric. Like many little boys, Cartman dreams of being a pirate. He fulfills his dream by going to Somalia's capital with the other boys and becomes a pirate captain known as Fatbeard. At one point, when the boys made up their own anime ninja persona, Cartman chose the name Bullrog. He claimed that he's a tough ninja who fights against hippies with his powerful side. During another instance, Cartman took on the persona of Mr. Cartmanas to teach inner city youth how to cheat. Mr. Cartmanas is a parody of Jamie Escalante from the 1988 movie Stand and Deliver. How do I read these Another one of Cartman's many personas was Dog the Hall Monitor. This identity is a parody of Dog the Bounty Hunter. Cartman has a superhero alter ego named The Coon. The Coon parodies dark superhero stories such as the Christopher Nolan Batman films. Cartman later returns to his superhero persona to team up with Cthulhu. Together, they team up to attack synagogues, Burning Man, San Francisco, and Justin Bieber. In 2008, Cartman gave a short interview in his own voice with Julie Robner of NPR. Yes, the real NPR. After the interviewer asked Cartman what he wanted to be when he grows up, he bluntly answered that he definitely doesn't want to become an interviewer. Ouch. When asked what he would like to hear from God if he went to heaven, Cartman said, Eric, all of this is yours. I'm done. You're in charge now. Cartman actually speaks three languages, Spanish, German, and of course, English. Even though Cartman thinks it might be egotastical, that's the pronunciation he used, he considers himself his own hero. Why? Because everything about him is just so cool. His least favorite words are no, don't, and ecosystem. Wait, what does he have against the ecosystem. His motto is shut up, shut up stupid, I hate you. Um, words to live by? When asked what his favorite sound was, Cartman said that it was the sound of people he doesn't like crying, whereas the sound he likes least is babies laughing. Wonder if he likes babies crying. When Cartman grows up, he wants to eat stuff and play whatever the best Xbox is for a living. He doesn't think he'll have to earn money to buy the Xbox because his mom will get it for him. Cartman's idea of happiness is nobody being on earth but him. He said if he was in Will Smith's situation in I Am Legend, he would be extremely extremely content with it. Cartman claims that his favorite color is Caucasian. He likes Asian too, but not as much. Don't take him for a racist though, because he claims he's fine with black people. Cartman's cholesterol level is that of the 70 year old man. We learn this in the episode 1% when his bad health puts the school at the lowest ranking on the presidential fitness test. Cartman originally weighed 90 pounds when he was eight in the third grade. However, his current weight is unknown. Considering how much he eats, it's probably now a lot more than that, even though he looks the same visually. Cartoons, you know. In order to get out of wearing glasses, Cartman goes to the extreme to correct his vision. After laser corrective surgery goes wrong, Cartman decides to get a transplant, using Kenny's eyes after a succubus killed his friend. Thus, Cartman's eyes are actually that of a dead Kenny. Ugh. Cartman seems to be one of the only children who is completely aware of Kenny's multiple deaths, but doesn't really let them bother him. We know this because in Cartman land, Kenny's family tries to sue Cartman for Kenny's wrongful death, but Cartman states that Kenny dies all the time. Yuri on Ice featured a South Park reference to Cartman. In Jean-Jacques, J.J. Leroy's childhood flashback, J.J. wears Cartman's iconic outfit. Bonus fact, South Park also referenced Yuri on Ice in a shot looking through Ike's search history. Nice to see shows acknowledge each other across the world. In an episode of the Powerpuff Girls, Blossom can be seen in Cartman's outfit after stumbling into the iconic coat, hat, and mittens while chasing a real imaginary friend into the clothing rack. Cartman and his friends show up in The Simpsons when Bart and Milhouse watch South Park. Milhouse feels a bit disillusioned illusioned by the fact that South Park kids are voiced by adults. In reality, Milhouse is not only voiced by an adult, but by an adult woman. 
Pamela Hayden. In the Futurama movie, Bender's Big Score, Cartman's head, hat and all, is preserved inside of a jar, among many others. Cartman's favorite snack is Cheesy Poofs. In 2011, Frito-Lay partnered with South Park to sell Cheesy Poofs in real life. Why couldn't they keep existing? The show released a compilation of Cartman-centric episodes made up of two discs called South Park, The Cult of Cartman. Not only is there a DVD introduction, there are also episode introductions, all made by Eric Cartman himself. In 2000, the MTV Movie Awards included a South Park segment, which Stone and Parker created to parody Gladiator and Battlefield Earth. In it, the South Park boys are pitted against gladiators, only for Cartman to soil himself in fear. Oh, you guys, I crap my pig. Believe it or not, Cartman is featured on the South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut soundtrack. On it, he sings the musical numbers that he performs with his friends in the movie. In South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, Cartman has a V-chip implanted into his head that shocks him whenever he curses, which is a lot. It's then recircuited so that every time he curses, he can use a bolt of lightning as a weapon. The band Rush commissioned an intro short for their 2007 Snakes and Arrows tour, featuring Cartman and the other South Park boys. The boys form a Rush cover band playing Tom Sawyer, with Cartman wearing a wig to look like Rush singer Getty Lee. Cartman sings his own version of Tom Sawyer, in which he gets the lyrics wrong and confuses Tom Sawyer with Huckleberry Finn. In 1999, National Westminster Bank did a poll among eight and nine-year-olds to see who was their favorite celebrity personality. Cartman came in at number one, beating Bart Simpson, who got second place. Cartman and the boys make an appearance in the 2005 documentary, The Aristocrats. In the clip, Cartman tells a really long joke called The Aristocrats, in extremely graphic detail. How graphic, you might ask? Well, you're just gonna have to watch it for yourself to find out. And the father says, The Aristocrats. In 2002, Cartman was featured in promos for the NHL team, the Los Angeles Kings. The promos played live at hockey games and had Cartman interacting with, well, assaulting the other team's mascots. Cartman also introduced the starting lineup for the University of Colorado's football team during a 2007 game between them and the University of Nebraska. Cody Hawkins is the quarterback because he's the coach's son so he can do whatever he wants. Cartman is a playable character in the RPG, South Park, The Stick of Truth. He takes the player character, New Kid, under his wing and introduces you to the game. In the Stick of Truth, the kingdom of Koopa Keep is located in Cartman's backyard, and Cartman is the Grand Wizard. In the episode Black Friday, Cartman pokes fun at how long it took to develop the Stick of Truth. He tells Kyle not to pre-order a game. When you pre-order a game, you're just committing to paying for something that some assholes in California haven't even finished working on yet. <laughs> and I'm still waiting for the fractured but whole. If you can't get enough of Cartman from the episodes, a rendition of Lady Gaga's Poker Face with Cartman singing lead vocals was released in the rock band music store in 2010. Stone says that when it comes to bad impressions of Cartman, it's not so much the voice that people get wrong, it's the bad acting that make the impressions fall apart. Cartman's particular way of saying, hey, was introduced in the 2002 edition of the Oxford Dictionary of Catchphrases. So I guess, hey, now counts as a catchphrase? Stone feels that it's a total honor that Cartman is considered as iconic as Homer Simpson and Archie Bunker are in the animation world. We'd say that's a pretty high achievement. By the way, in case you haven't seen it, Cartman has a tiny penis, even for his age. How small? It's 1.4 inches. You are welcome. We can't just talk about Cartman, though. Some other characters have to get some love, lest his ego take over. To ensure all of this attention gets shared equally, let's talk about the kid with the biggest, orangest jacket. I'd reference a funny quote of his here, but gosh darn, is he hard to understand and even harder to impersonate without putting something over my mouth. It's time for 107 Kenny McCormick facts you should know. Oh my god, they made a 107 facts video about Kenny. You better believe we did. Kenny McCormick has been around since South Park's earliest days and he's not leaving anytime soon unless South Park decides to kill him off again. But I'm getting ahead of myself. This is 107 facts about Kenny McCormick. Welcome to Channel Frederator, the cartoon central of the internet. Before we begin, we publish new videos every week, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Number one, Kenny is voiced by South Park co-creator Matt Stone. Number two, Doing the Kenny voice is actually pretty easy. Stone simply cups his hands over his mouth, but he doesn't just mumble. Kenny has actual lines. Number three, like the other kids in South Park, Matt Stone originally did Kenny's voice without modulation, but it has since been digitally pitched up. Number four, because Kenny's lines are usually inconsequential, Matt Stone takes the opportunity to improvise with the character, often saying things that would make censors shudder. Number five, there are times that we do hear Kenny though. His voice can be heard unmuffled in episodes like The Losing Edge, The Jeffersons, and You're Getting Old. Number six, 
In a number of those instances, it's not always Matt Stone doing Kenny's voice. Sometimes Kenny is voiced by South Park animation director slash producer Eric Stowe. Number 7. You can also hear Kenny unmuffled by his parka at the end of the South Park movie. South Park. Bigger, longer, and uncut. Number 8. In that instance, when he simply says, goodbye you guys, he's actually voiced by Mike Judge, creator of King of the Hill and Beavis and Butthead, among other things. Number 9. That's also the first time we see Kenny without his orange parka. You can see his full face and even his messy blonde hair. Number 10. To date, this is the only time Kenny's full face has been seen without anything obscuring it, though he's appeared without his classic parka on a few different occasions. Number 11. When the boys are trying to help Mr. Jefferson's son Blanket escape, they sub Kenny in Blanket's place. You can't see Kenny's eyes due to the mask he's wearing, but you can see the rest of his face, including his hair. Number 12. You can also see Kenny completely unhooded in You're Getting Old. He's only wearing a birthday hat on his head at Stan's 10th birthday party. Number 13. In the episode The Losing Edge, while you can see most of Kenny's face, his hat is pulled down lower than the other boys, partially covering one of his eyes. Number 14. While we're on the subject, Kenny canonically has blue eyes. We first learned Kenny's eye color when a turkey pulled it out in the episode Starvin' Marvin. Number 15. You can also see Kenny's blue eyes when Kenny's traditional model is morphed into an anime style in Good Times with Weapons. Number 16. Funny enough, Kenny was actually inspired by a real person. Trey Parker had a childhood friend who wore an orange parka that muffled his voice. The kid was even named Kenny. Number 17. Also, just like the character Kenny, Parker's friend Kenny was the poorest kid in the neighborhood. When writing the show, Parker and Stone knew the kids needed to have a poor kid to capture the feeling that every middle class town had. Number 18. The real life Kenny would also regularly skip school. Parker would joke to his friends that Kenny died when he was absent, leading to the now famous long running gag in South Park. Number 19. The joke about Kenny dying first appeared in The Spirit of Christmas, Jesus vs. Frosty, a short made by Matt Stone and Trey Parker in 1992 while they were in college at the University of Colorado. Number 20. Kenny's wearing his signature orange parka. However, in this first iteration, you can still see his full face, nose, mouth, and all. Number 21. Even stranger, he's not called Kenny. Instead, the character that resembles Cartman is called Kenny, and he's the one who gets killed. Number 22. However, Kenny's next appearance would solidify the character as we know him. 1995's The Spirit of Christmas, Jesus vs. Santa. This time, the real Kenny gets killed, complete with the rats almost immediately swarming his corpse. Number 23. The running gag of killing Kenny would last throughout the first five seasons of South Park, with Kenny dying in nearly every episode. Number 24. In an unaired pilot version of South Park's first episode, Cartman gets an anal probe, Kenny is actually brought back to life in the end. However, he stays dead for the actual episode. Number 25. The first episode that Kenny survived was episode 9 of the first season, Mr. Hanky the Christmas Pooh. He had a number of close calls throughout the episode teasing Kenny's death, but Kenny managed to escape unharmed. Number 26. Parker and Stone decided they'd let Kenny live because it was Christmas. Of course, Kenny would go on to get killed in plenty of subsequent Christmas episodes. Number 27. Kenny did manage to survive a number of times during the early years of South Park though. Kenny's death in City on the Edge of Forever flashbacks took place inside of Stan's dream, so the real Kenny technically made it out alive. Number 28. In Rainforest Schmain Forest, Kenny gets struck by lightning, but lucky for him, his new girlfriend Kelly saves him with CPR. Number 29. For the two-parter episode, Do the Handicapped Go to Hell slash Probably, Kenny survives thanks to a continuity error. He appears to be killed when he's hit by a bus that leaves his body behind in the first part. However, in part two, his still alive body is scraped from the bottom of the bus. Number 30. A kid who's dressed as Kenny dies in the episode Fat Camp in a way that I won't dare describe on YouTube. Meanwhile, the real Kenny was alive and well in a New York jail for doing something to Howard Stern that I also won't dare describe on YouTube. Number 31. Of course, Kenny had a couple of close calls along the way. In the episode Terrence and Philip Behind the Blow, Kenny is shown having all four of his limbs cut off, but not actually dying. Number 32. Meanwhile, in Cripple Fight, Kenny is simply carried off by a hawk. However, he pops up later in the episode Among the Scouts, so he does turn out to be just fine. Number 33. 
Towards the end of Starvin' Marvin in Space, Kenny ends up getting frozen in Carbonite, just like Han Solo. Of course, we know Han Solo ended up surviving the process, so even though Kenny is never unfrozen in the episode, we can believe that he's still alive in there. Number 34. Kenny even had three different brushes with death in just one episode. Chicken Lover. First, he was almost crushed by a flipped car. Second, he gets sent flying into a brick wall. And third, he appears to be shot only to get up unharmed. Number 35. Stan had felt tricked so many times that he even got frustrated and said, damn it. Sure enough, Kenny gets killed at the end of the episode when a tree falls on him. Number 36. Some episodes, Kenny survives just by not being there. He doesn't appear in Pip, obviously, but he also doesn't show up in Cat Orgy or Two Guys Naked in a Hot Tub. Number 37. However, Kenny technically dies during the events of Cat Orgy and Two Guys Naked in a Hot Tub. Both episodes take place during the same night that Jubilee takes place, during which Kenny dies freeing Moses. It's a long story. Number 38. Just like in Jubilee, Kenny's deaths aren't always a freak accident. Sometimes he dies a hero. In the South Park movie, while he's actually dead for most of the film, he gives up his wish to come back to life to restore the world to the peace it enjoyed before the war with Canada. Number 39. In another example, Kenny gets electrocuted while connecting two wires to selflessly fix the generator for Hell's Pass Hospital. Number 40. Even while dead, Kenny still manages to save the day, like when he defeated Satan's army by using a golden PSP from heaven. Number 41. Of course, Kenny's known to be a great hero as his alter ego, Mysterion. As Mysterion, he even protected his sister Karen, saving her from a bully and getting sprayed with Dr. Pepper by their foster parents. Number 42. As for Kenny's other family members, he lives with his dad Stuart, his mom Carol, and his older brother Kevin. Number 43. Kenny also has a living grandfather. At least he did. Kenny's grandfather only appeared one time in the episode Fat Camp. He doesn't have a name or one that we know at least, and didn't even say anything in his brief appearance. Number 44. Also, in a way, Kenny is part of Stan's family. In the episode Volcano, Stan's uncle Jimbo makes Kenny his honorary nephew. Number 45. While Kenny's brother Kevin has been around since the early days of South Park, Karen didn't actually appear until 2005 with the episode Best Friends Forever, the same one where Kenny saved heaven with the golden PSP. Number 46. The whole premise of that episode was based on the real-life case of Terry Schiavo. The whole premise of that episode was based on the real-life case of Terry Schiavo, a woman in a vegetative state like Kenny's with her husband and parents legally fighting over her medical custody. Number 47. Actually, Best Friends Forever is the episode that won South Park its first Emmy. Number 48. Oh, and Matt Stone and Trey Parker themselves confirmed that the they and the bastards in They Killed Kenny is self-referential. Kyle is referring to the creators of the show themselves. Bastards, breaking the fourth wall. Number 49. Of course, the running gag became something of a catchphrase for the whole show. The line appeared in all kinds of late 90s, early 2000s material as reference, such as Boy Meets World, Xena, Warrior Princess, and even the Animorphs books. Number 50. The series of Fallout video games have referenced Kenny a number of times. In the first Fallout game, there's a character named Deputy Kenny. Sure enough, when he's killed, a message pops up on his computer that reads, Oh my god, they killed Kenny. Number 51. Fallout 3 has a few Kenny shoutouts too. In the Operation Anchorage DLC, there's a character named Major McCormick, spelt with a K, not a C. When he gets shot in the head, another soldier shouts, Oh my god, they killed McCormick! You gotta kill those bastards! Number 52. Also, in the Point Lookout DLC, there's a little kid named Kenny living in the swamp, raised by the swamp people of the area. He's skilled at setting traps and even whistles part of the South Park theme song. Number 53. Oh My God, They Killed Kenny has also appeared on a slew of South Park merchandise. Everything from shirts, hats, to bumper stickers. Number 54. The whole joke even got its own song, Kenny's Dead by Master P, a parody of the Curtis Mayfield song, Freddy's Dead. Number 55. Kenny has even popped up in the world of academia. Southern Illinois University philosophy professor Randall Oxler penned an essay titled Killing Kenny, Our Daily Dose of Death, which details how Kenny's regular death gag can help viewers come to better terms with their own inevitable demise. Number 56. 
Oxler's essay actually appeared in a whole book analyzing South Park called South Park and Philosophy. Bigger, longer, and more penetrating. Number 57. Another Kenny-based essay by Karen Fry, a professor at University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, is about Kenny's character and how it relates to the themes of existentialism. Number 58. Fry's essay appears in a different South Park and Philosophy book, the one subtitled, you know, I learned something today. Number 59. At the University of Strasbourg, Sovi Rutschman discovered a mutation in adult fruit flies which caused them to die two days after they're infected with a particular bacteria. She named the mutation gene Kenny after the character from South Park. Number 60. By the end of season 5, Parker and Stone were sick of the gag themselves, so they decided to kill Kenny off for good with episode 13 of season 5, fittingly titled Kenny Dies. Number 61. While coming up with creative ways for Kenny to die had been fun for a while, Parker and Stone got tired of constantly thinking of new, interesting ways for it to happen. Number 62. They were actually originally considering to kill Kyle off, but that was only planned to be for a year. Number 63. By this point, the creators considered Kenny to be less of a character and more of a prop. Stone even called him an orange blob that just moves around. With no discernible way to develop his character, South Park officially gave Kenny the axe for keeps this time. Number 64. As for his death in that episode, he died of a terminal case of muscular dystrophy, or at least that's what he appears to have had. We never got a proper diagnosis. Number 65. At the time, a small portion of South Park fans were so outraged by Kenny's seemingly permanent death that they threatened to boycott Comedy Central, the channel that aired and still airs South Park. Number 66. As far as the friend group goes, Kenny was effectively replaced by Butters Stotch, who even got his own episode as the season finale, fittingly titled Butters' Very Own Episode. Number 67. Butters' episode was designed as a kind of formal introduction for him, as he was planned to take a bigger role in the spotlight for the next season. Number 68. Butters was picked because at the time he was quickly becoming one of the more popular characters among fans. Number 69. As the season went on, Butters was eventually booted as Kenny's replacement in the crew, replaced by the hyperactive, coffee-addled Tweak Tweak. Number 70. Though Kenny was officially dead, he was still there, spiritually and literally. Later in the season, Cartman drinks Kenny's ashes, thinking they were chocolate milk mix. Kenny's soul then inhabits Cartman's body, occasionally possessing Cartman and chiming in as Cartman channeled his words. Number 71. From here, Kenny's soul is exercised from Cartman's body into a pot roast, which is then eaten by Rob Schneider, making him Kenny's new host until he also dies, presumably freeing Kenny's soul. Number 72. Rob Schneider actually died by being impaled by a flagpole, just like how Kenny was in the episode Weight Gain 4000. Number 73. Kenny wouldn't reappear in his own body until the end of season 6's finale, Red Slay Down. He simply shows up, totally fine. Turns out he'd just been hanging out the whole time, no explanation given. Number 74. Kenny was alive and the running gag was dead, but South Park would occasionally bust it out from time to time. After his return in Red Slay Down, Kenny wouldn't die again until Saddam Hussein destroyed him with laser vision in the season 7 finale, It's Christmas in Canada. Number 75. While there's no explanation given as to how Kenny returned, we do eventually get some explanation as to Kenny's curse of immortality. The earliest in-show explanation actually appears in the season 4 episode, Cartman Joins Nambla. Number 76. In this episode, we see Kenny die only to be reborn as a totally different baby, his soul seemingly returning to his mother's womb. Number 77. Carol even mentions that it's the 52nd time that it's happened, making that newborn Kenny the 52nd incarnation of him. Number 78. The most recent explanation comes from the series of episodes featuring Kenny's run as Mysterion. Kenny's superpower is that every time he dies, his mom gives birth to him once again and he awakens in his bed, aged up to the same age. Number 79. Though he remembers everything, including how he died, Mysteriously, nobody else in his life remembers him ever dying. Number 80. Turns out that Kenny's ever-continuing cycle of rebirth and immortality may have some connection to the cult of Cthulhu. Carol mentions that she and Stuart never should have gone to those cult meetings. Number 81. There's even a picture in the Necronomicon showing a group of cultists standing in a circle around a pentagram.
pentagram, attempting to summon an old one. At the center of that circle is a baby. It's possible that this ritual was performed on Kenny when he was a baby, giving him his powers. Number 82. For the record, it's not like Kenny's parents were devout Cthulhu worshippers. They just said they went to the cult meetings for the free booze. Number 83. However, while Kenny himself says that nobody ever remembers his deaths, this contradicts a couple of moments from earlier in the series. For example, in Cartman Land, when Cartman is being sued for Kenny's death, he protests that he dies all the time. Number 84. Other times, other characters have reacted to Kenny's death like it was business as usual, which it was at the time. In Chef Goes Nanners, after Kenny explodes from drinking water and eating antacid tablets, everyone laughs, and Stan says that was a good one. Number 85. Also, in fourth grade, when Kenny dies on a sled, Stan plainly states, well, who didn't see that coming? Number 86. Thing is, many of these early season deaths aren't considered canon in the way that his death in Kenny dies or the Mysterion episodes are. Number 87. Even before the now seemingly canon explanation of Kenny's power, Trey Parker offered a few different explanations. At one point, when asked why Kenny dies, he simply explained that it's because he's poor. Number 88. Parker has also said that Kenny was a supernatural demigod, and even his resurrection in Red Slade Down was somehow tied to Jesus' death in that same episode. Number 89. Whether canon or not, in total, Kenny has died 126 times across the entire South Park franchise, including the series itself, movies, shorts, and video games. Number 90. Kenny even dies during South Park's opening number. From season 7 to 11, you see Kenny get his head cut off by a pair of scissors during each episode's title sequence. Number 91. Despite what he's famous for, Kenny is more than just his deaths. He's a multi-talented renaissance man. For example, we learn that he's fluent in Romanian when he talks to the quintuplets in Quintuplets 2000. Number 92. In this same episode, we also see firsthand how talented of an opera singer Kenny is. Even before he makes it big in Romania, he sings La Donna Immobile from Rigoletto, an opera by Giuseppe Verdi. Number 93. Kenny can do more than just sing though. He can also play the drums. He played the snare drum during a Civil War reenactment and was also the drummer in Moop playing alongside Stan and Kyle. Number 94. He can play more than the drums, too. We can see that he clearly knows his way around a five-string bass when he's playing Second Skin by Dying Fetus as part of Crimson Dawn. Number 95. Kenny's a music fan, too. In particular, he seems to dig Peruvian flute music. He couldn't help but dance anytime the boys pass by a Peruvian flute band at the mall. Number 96. It's not enough for Kenny to sing and dance. He's a full-on triple threat with a penchant for theatricality. He managed to capture hearts and minds the world over as his enchanting alter ego, Princess Kenny. Number 97. Also, he's able to deliver passionate performances as his luchador wrestling persona, El Pollo Loco. Number 98. Kenny is certainly athletic enough to be a wrestler too. We've seen him do a backflip while infiltrating a military base and easily walk on his hands without stumbling, all while his butt is sticking out of his hood. Number 99. Also, we've already talked a bit about Kenny's gaming prowess too. He managed to reach level 60 in Heaven vs. Hell, passing God's test to be become the Keanu Reeves of heaven and defeat Satan's army. Number 100. Perhaps even more impressively, Kenny played a human hunter in World of Warcraft, a race class combination that wouldn't be possible in the game for another four years until the Cataclysm expansion. Number 101. Kenny is also shown to be a ruthless Magic the Gathering player. He's defeated the likes of Slaughterhouse and even the legendary Gadnook, Breaker of Worlds. Number 102. Kenny's even more dangerous as a weapons expert, as Professor Chaos has seen first hand, Kenny is perfectly accurate with a ninja star. Number 103. Firearms are no different for him. Kenny quickly took to hunting in the volcano episode when he handily took down a ram with a shotgun. Number 104. Kenny was also able to get his hands on a sniper rifle in Poor and Stupid, but wasn't able to put it to work before losing it to a security guard. Number 105. Kenny loves NASCAR. That's the whole reason he acquired the sniper rifle in the first place. He loves NASCAR so much that he was looking to take Cartman out so he'd stop ruining it. Number 106. Six. We've also seen that Kenny has an aptitude for demolitions and explosions. While he wasn't able to defuse the bomb on Timmy's wheelchair in time, he did manage to destroy the future telling device with an explosion large enough to be seen from space. Number 107. Finally, as we see in the future timeline of South Park post-COVID, Kenny eventually goes on to become a Nobel Prize winning humanitarian and scientist, keen to share his kindness and discoveries to make the world a better place. Remember when there was a South Park movie in theaters? Remember the 90s? Remember staying up late to watch adult cartoons on your CRT television? Remember when the dollar store actually had things
items that cost a dollar? Sorry, I've been eating a lot of member berries lately. But the first question still stands. South Park was a big enough hit when it first hit the scene to make it all the way to theaters. None of this streaming wars wackiness. You had to go out and buy a bucket of popcorn and sit in a big room with a bunch of other people to laugh at all the dumb stuff that the good folks at South Park were up to. To help you remember, without the aid of any creepy cute berries, here's 107 South Park the movie facts you should know. When South Park debuted, it both changed and challenged the boundaries of network television with its envelope pushing sense of humor. Not even two years later, creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone set out to do the very same for featured films, proving that animated movies could be more than the happy-go-lucky Disney films that dominated the genre. And we're here to check out just how they did that. Hey everyone, I'm Justin with Channel Frederator, and today we're going to take a look back at 107 facts about the South Park movie, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut. South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut centers around Stan, Kyle, Cartman, and Kenny going to see the new R-rated Terrence and Phillip movie, Asses of Fire, which expands their vocabulary in a way that ignites the fury of Kyle's mom. She begins a war against Terrence and Phillip's home country, Canada, for soiling the minds of America youth. The central theme behind Bigger, Longer, and Uncut is the danger of censorship and the importance of free speech. It's also self-reflective of the reception that the show had received at that point in time, both positive and negative. The film was directed and co-written by series co-creator Trey Parker, though his most notable success at the time was the South Park TV series. The film Bigger, Longer, and Uncut wasn't his first time in the director's chair. Having created the film's Cannibal the Musical and Orgasmo, pre-production for a South Park film began as early as midway through the production of South Park's first season, way back Back in 1998, with Comedy Central being very confident in the show's success. The reason the studios pushed for a South Park film so early was to cash in on the South Park phenomenon while it was still hot, explaining that the film Beavis and Butthead Do America wasn't quite as successful as Paramount wanted it to be due to the fact that it was released several years into the show's run. The film's creation was part of a contract Parker and Stone had signed in 1998 that required them to create episodes until at least 1999, which also granted them a slice of the merchandising royalties within the show's first year. The contract also stated that the creation of a feature film would result in an unspecified seven-figure cash bonus. Parker and Stone were personally dissatisfied with the quality of the second and third seasons of the show and thought the series would be cancelled soon. The duo decided to take this supposed last hurrah as an opportunity to do whatever they wanted, and what they wanted to do was a full-blown musical. The decision to make the film a musical was also a jab at the Disney Renaissance era that ran from 1989 until 1999, a period during which Disney films mainly consisted of musicals, making the style seem obligatory for the feature-length animation genre. The film was a joint production between Paramount Pictures and Warner Brothers due to the fact that Comedy Central, the home channel of the TV series, was owned by both studios' parent companies, those both being Viacom and Time Warner. Though Viacom gained full ownership of Comedy Central in 2003, the transition didn't relinquish full ownership of the South Park film franchise to Paramount. Warner Bros. retained the right to co-produce any sequels until 2013 when WB gave up the rights as a part of a deal to co-produce the Christopher Nolan film Interstellar. Paramount pushed Parker and Stone to aim for a PG-13 movie in order to make the film more accessible, even showing the duo a chart of how much more money a PG-13 rated film could make than an R rated one. The rebellious creators stated they wouldn't work on a South Park film unless they went for a hard R rating. The season 1 episode, Death, served as a huge influence on the film's script. In Parker's own words, quote, After about the first year of South Park, Paramount already wanted to make a South Park movie, and we sort of thought this episode would make the best model just because we like the sort of pointing at ourselves kind of thing, end quote. Trey and Matt used the movie Beavis and Butthead Do America as inspiration for the film, but not in the way one would expect. While fans of the Beavis and Butthead TV series, the duo was personally disappointed by the film, seeing it as more of a feature-length episode of Beavis and Butthead instead of a project that could stand on its own. They wanted bigger, longer, and uncut to be its own thing. Many of the staff members that worked on the film were also simultaneously working on the third season of the series, resulting in extreme scheduling mishaps that led to multiple changes being made to the film as close to two weeks to its release. The movie's artists used a multiprocessor SGI Origin 2031 multiprocessor, Origin 2000 serves with a whopping 1.1 terabytes of storage for both rendering and asset management. In layman's terms, this means the backgrounds, characters, and other items could be saved separately or as fully composited scenes, with quick and painless access to the assets later. Bigger, Longer, and Uncut was the first ever feature-length R-rated animated film to be created using computer animation. While not 3D like Sausage Party, it was created using, well, computers. The film was created using 3D alias Wavefront, Power Animator software running on Silicon Graphics 02 and Octane workstations. Characters were designed with texture mapping, and shading resembled the 2D paper cutout stop motion that the series was initially founded on. Parker and Stone intended to fill the film with as much vulgarity as possible as a means of revenge towards the MPAA for giving their previous film Orgasmo an NC-17 rating. Bigger, Longer, and Uncut would constantly get the NC-17 rating from the MPAA, with the 
Association frequently requesting that they remove key elements to give it an R rating, which Stone and Parker would do, only to replace the content with even more vulgar content. Matt and Trey claimed that the MPAA rejected the film's original title, South Park, All Hell Breaks Loose, due to a policy that MPAA allegedly had that all films must have a G-rated title. According to MPAA spokesperson Richard Taylor, this was a blatant lie, claiming All Hell Breaks Loose was never a potential title for the film while they were involved. According to Trey Parker, the film's title is a dick joke that went way over the heads of the MPAA. It wasn't until after the film was released that the association put two and two together. The film originally opened with Saddam Hussein being executed via electric chair, but was cut for how gory it was. One part of the scene survived, which is the response to the question, quote, any last words? This instead was given to Philip as he and Terrence are about to be executed toward the end of the film. He says, how's the boot get me the fuck out of this chair? How's that for last words? The original idea for the internet video of Cartman's mom involved her having sex with a horse off screen, but the MPAA rejected the idea due to bestiality, even though the movie features a picture of a man having sex with a horse. When they pitched the idea of a German man taking a dump on Miss Cartman, they gave it the green light. Originally, Winona Ryder was supposed to shoot ping pong balls out of her vagina as the joke initially suggests, but the creative team was forced to make a bait and switch joke by the MPAA, resulting in her hitting them with a ping pong paddle by her crotch. Conan O'Brien originally pulled out a gun and shot himself in the head, but the MPAA rejected that method due to the recent school shooting at Combine High School in Colorado. There were plans to originally feature a scene that took place in a concentration camp located in the town. Kyle would have been issued a yellow star for doing well in school. Kyle's brother Ike was originally meant to accompany the boys on the battlefield, as is seen in early trailer footage and promotional screenshots, but his role was cut down for pacing. The attic scene was added in at the last minute to explain his absence. As a punchline to the Operation Human Shield joke, every male character except for Chef was meant to die in the war, with all of them being revived by Satan in the end. In the final cut, the only casualty is Mr. Garrison. In an earlier draft of the script, it was revealed that Cartman's favorite snack, Cheesy Poofs, were actually a Canadian product and therefore banned in the United States, much to his annoyance. Kenny originally had to get Snacky S'mores' proof of purchase in order to get his wish granted by Satan. A remnant of this subplot remains in the movie when Kenny's ghost asks Cartman for Snacky S'mores. Wendy originally went on multiple dates with Stan to go see Terrence and Philip, only to get bored with both the movie and him, claiming that the movie was the only thing they really had in common. The film was screened for the MPAA a total of six times before they gave in and granted the film its R rating. This was mainly due to a plea by an unnamed Paramount exec who stated that making drastic edits in animation is really expensive. The last cut the studio screened for the MPA was given an NC-17 rating, which caused an unnamed Paramount marketing executive to call Stone and Parker and tell them that they quote, needed that R rating. This prompted Matt Stone to call and freak out on producer Scott Rudin, which in turn prompted Rudin to call and freak out even harder on the MPAA. The next day, the film was given an R rating without any alteration or reason. The original trailer for the film took tasteless jabs at Walt Disney and the Disney Animation Studio, something that really angered Parker and Stone, stating it was quote, everything we didn't want the film to be. Paramount took the songs from the film to create a music video that aired on MTV, which had all of the R-rated elements cut out to appease standards and practices. Paramount sent the tape to Parker and Stone over a weekend for their approval and needed it back by the following Wednesday to air it accordingly. Furious by the edits made, Stone threw the tape into the trunk of his car, an action that almost provoked Paramount into suing the duo. Much like the opening of the show, the film's credits tell us that the celebrities parodying the film had no involvement or endorsement for their portrayals. Among these mentioned are Conan O'Brien, Brooke Shields, US President Bill Clinton, Winona Ryder, and the Baldwin brothers. While the celebrities in the film weren't portrayed by their real-life counterparts, some of them were played by other celebrities. The Baldwin brothers were played by Canadian comedian David Foley, while Minnie Driver lent her voice to the film's iteration of Brooke Shields. While Gregory was primarily voiced by Trey Parker, his singing voice was courtesy of Broadway actor Howard McGillian. McGillian is perhaps best known for playing the Phantom from Phantom of the Opera longer than any actor in the show's history. All members of MAC, Mothers Against Canada, were played by actress Mary Kay Bergman, who voiced practically all of the show's female characters throughout the first three seasons. Bergman unfortunately passed away not long after the film was released. A few soldiers in the film were played by famous musicians. One US soldier was played by the police drummer Stuart Copeland, and a Canadian fighter pilot was voiced by Nick Rhodes of the British band Duran Duran. Dr. Gouache, the surgeon that fails to save Kenny, was played by Hollywood actor and director George Clooney. Clooney is a huge fan of South Park and previously voiced Stan's dog Sparky in the episode Big Gay Al's Big Gay Boat Ride. George Clooney as Dr. Gouache is a reference to his role of Dr. Doug Ross on the TV show ER, which he played for 108 episodes. When he removes his hood at the end of the film, Kenny was briefly played by Mike Judge, the creator of iconic adult animation like Beavis and Butthead and King of the Hill. Matt and Trey collaborated with songwriter Mark Shaman when creating the film's iconic lineup of songs. Shaman said that the work he did on the movie was the most important gig of his career, crediting it with getting him work as a 
musical contributor on the Broadway musical, Hairspray. The establishing song Mountain Town is a parody of the opening number of Disney's Beauty and the Beast, Belle, both in the music and choreography of the scene itself. The song Uncle Fucko was originally titled Motherfucker, but the wording was changed to achieve an R rating. Parker and Stone stated that this is one of the few times the MPAA's meddling actually made something funnier. Shaman devised the fart tap dancing break that occurs during Uncle Fucka. He asked South Park Studios for their entire library of fart sounds and spent hours listening to them and arranging them in a way that created tap rhythms. When the orchestra of a film comes to record the score, they typically don't want to hear the lyrics of the song in order to better focus their effort, but they will often be open to hearing the playback. Shaman recalls one of their viola players listening to Uncle Fucka in its entirety for the first time and then walking out of the room in disappointment muttering, quote, four years in the conservatory. Blame Canada was the fourth attempt at creating a song for Sheila Broflowski to sing that would clearly convey the film's conflict of the enforcement of censorship. Fourth time's a charm. One alternative idea involved the Disney-esque villain visual in which Sheila would transform into a Maleficent-like character. This was dropped to avoid demonizing parents. Blame Canada was partially inspired by the aftermath of the tragic shooting of Columbine High School in the respect that parents, law enforcement, and the media would try to blame the actions of the gunman on the likes of video games, movies, and music. Kyle's Mom's a Bitch is the only song in the film to originate from the TV series. It was originally featured in the episode Mr. Hanky the Christmas Poo, albeit shorter. When Cartman shows us how kids around the world sing Kyle's Mom's a Bitch in different world languages, it's not just gibberish. Shaman actually commissioned Trey and Matt's assistants to get translations for the songs in as many languages as they possibly could. All of the translated performances were sang by Shaman himself, sped up. While What Would Brian Boitano Do wasn't a song from the original series, it is a callback to the original short from which South Park was birthed. The Spirit of Christmas short involved the boys watching Jesus and Santa fight each other and asking themselves, what would Brian Boitano do? The three-part episode Imagination Land was originally conceived as a theatrically released feature-length sequel to Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, but was ultimately used for the series due to a lack of ideas for episodes at the time. Though initially denied by Paramount, it was confirmed in a 2001 interview with Metallica that the vocals for the song Hell Isn't Good were performed by Metallica's lead singer, James Hetfield. For whatever reason, the song Hell Isn't Good is missing from the film's official soundtrack. It has never been added in reissue either. Eyes of a Child is meant to be a mockery of the pop versions of Disney songs that would often appear in the credits of their feature-length films during their renaissance, like Beauty and the Beast, A Whole New World, and Can You Feel the Love Tonight? Troy Parker and Matt Stone wanted to produce a music video of Eyes of a Child in which Michael McDonald would be on a beach singing with the song projected onto a white sheet, but the studio rejected it. The song Up There was a jab at the seemingly obligatory songs in Broadway musicals in which the characters would always sing about what they want in life. Troy was also inspired by the song Part of Your World from the Little Mermaid. The song La Resistance was inspired by the number One More Day from the musical Les Miserables, of which Trey is a huge fan. Shaman had never seen it, requiring him to study the entire soundtrack constantly in order to get the feel of the song right. Let's check out some movie tidbits you may have missed. First off, Satan has a framed photo of actor Skeet Ulrich mounted above his bed. Ulrich is known for his roles in the film Scream and as good as it gets. In the film's final battle, Cartman's V-chip considers Barbara Streisand a swear word. On the emergency room schedule, Dr. Chermsky's job is to dis in Bowel Kenny. In Mr. Mackey's room, there is a poster that reads Get High on Poetry. This is based on a quote that was said to Matt Stone by one of his high school teachers. The exact quote being, Son, you need to know not to use pot as a natural high. Instead of getting high with pot, get high with poetry. The pianist that appears during Big Gay Al's Super is modeled after the film's co-songwriter that we've been talking so much about, Mr. Mark Shaman. The doctors replacing Kenny's heart with a baked potato is a reference to the song Spadoinkle from Trey Parker's film Cannibal the Musical, which contains the lyrics, my heart's as full as a baked potato. Contrary to popular belief, the film was never banned in Iraq. Paramount actually never made any attempt to release it there due to its portrayal of their leader, Saddam Hussein. According to a pie chart that appears in the film regarding the Canadian economy, most of the country's money is made from Terrence and Phillip, the snowball machine, tourism, the log industry, pornography, and filming the X-Files. Among the flags outside the United Nations are a skull and crossbones pirate flag, as well as a rainbow flag symbolizing gay pride. One of the black soldiers in the film blurts out, used to think West gonna die. This is a reference to Jar Jar Binks from everybody's favorite Star Wars film, The Phantom Menace, which was released very close to Bigger, Longer, and Uncut in May of 1999, making this a very quick response in true South Park fashion. On top of screening Asses of Fire, the movie theater is also showing the films Mecha Streisand Takes New York, The Milk Song, and Rat Kicker. As we've stated in our 107 South Park facts, the show's creative team likes hiding the alien visitors from the plot in various episodes. And the movie is no different. One can be seen on the dollar bill handed to Conan, while other Others can be seen in a photo frame in Cartman's room. Also, a final one can be seen within the crowd during the reprise of Mountain Town. The film contains 399 swear words because the MPAA had told the filmmakers that had they included 400 curse words,
afterwards, the film would have received an NC-17 rating outright. The 399 curses are just another middle finger in a long line of middle fingers directed at the MPAA. When the boys are watching the Miss Cartman porno video, the stop button on the toolbar is replaced by an obscene drawing labeled sphincter. Throughout the film's 81 minute run, Stan vomits a total of five times. Kyle's mom's organization, MAC or Mothers Against Canada, is a spoof of the real life nonprofit organization known as MADD or Mothers Against Drunk Driving, which seeks to stop underage drinking and drunk driving while also supporting those who have been hurt by such actions. The film contains an after credit scene featuring Kyle's younger brother, Ike. Unlike most post credit scenes, this one appears after the closing corporate logos. There is a framed portrait of former US Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall on the wall within Mr. Garrison's classroom. Marshall is noted as being the first African American justice to serve. The end of the film credits the characters with performing the film's musical numbers, not the actors who actually portrayed them. Real crew members are listed as writing and producing them though. After three full seasons on the air, the theatrically released film marks the first time Kenny's unhooded head was revealed to the audience. At the end of the film, Saddam Hussein is credited as being played by himself. In reality, Saddam is played by Matt Stone. The film opened first in the United States on June 30th, 1999 and raked in over 14.7 million during its opening weekend alone. The film grossed a whopping 83 million worldwide by the end of its theatrical run, making it the highest grossing R-rated animated film of all time, a title that it held from 1999 until 2016 when it was dethroned by Sausage Party. Due to the controversy surrounding Bigger, Longer, and Uncut's R rating, the MPA began backing up their ratings on posters by providing explanations for why a film is rated the way it is. Due to the backlash received over South Park's theatrical release, the president of the MPAA, Jack Valenti, has gone on record as saying he regrets granting the film an R rating instead of an NC-17 rating. During its theatrical run, there were numerous reports of underage children purchasing tickets to the PG-13 Will Smith flop, Wild Wild West, in order to gain entry into South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut. Legendary film critic Roger Ebert gave the film 2.5 stars, writing that it was the year's most slashing political commentary. In his review, he also stated that it was too long and runs out of steam, but it serves as a signpost for our troubled times. Just for the information it contains about the way we live now, thoughtful and concerned people should see it. After all, everyone else will. Bigger, Longer, and Uncut achieved 81% on Rotten Tomatoes' Almighty Tomato Meter, with the critical consensus being that its jokes are profoundly bold and rude, but incredibly funny at the same time. Bigger, Longer, and Uncut was named the sixth greatest animated movie of all time by Time Magazine, beating out other animated classics like Toy Story and Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Monty Python member Terry Gilliam placed the film on his personal list for the top 10 animated films of all time, something Stone and Parker must feel very proud of since they are such big fans of Monty Python's Flying Circus, which was a big inspiration for South Park. Comedian Chris Rock cites South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut as the funniest movie he has ever seen, stating to this very day, no movie has ever made him laugh so hard. Parker and Stone screened the scene of Conan O'Brien's death in the film for the man himself on Late Night with Conan O'Brien. O'Brien responded that his interns found the scene hilarious, but were quite annoyed by the fact that the late night set in the film is at the top of the GE building when it is in fact on the sixth floor. While most celebrities targeted by South Park tend to respond with outrage and lawsuits, Brian Boitano saw the movie and responded to his inclusion with appreciation and laughter and referred to the musical number as surreal. As mentioned in our South Park 107, while Matt and Trey did not require permission to use Brian Boitano's name or likeness for the film, Brian Boitano required their permission to use the phrase, what would Brian Boitano do for t-shirts Brian Boitano was selling for a charity event. South Park was honored at the 2000 Academy Awards with Blame Canada being nominated for Best Original Song. Unfortunately, it was beat out by Phil Collins' You'll Be In My Heart from Disney's Tarzan. The song was to be performed live at the Academy Awards, but ran into trouble with ABC's Standards and Practices Department, which demanded that the song be altered to be more TV family friendly. Shaman commented that that action was ironic given the fact that the film, as well as the song itself, was about censorship. Blame Canada was performed live at the 2000 Academy Awards by legendary comedian Robin Williams. Albeit a bit altered for the network, despite this, Matt Stone stated that he was pleased with Williams' rendition and was impressed by the production value. Trey and Matt showed up to the Oscars in dresses, with Trey wearing a replica of the Versace dress Jennifer Lopez wore to the 2000 Grammys, while Matt wore a replica of the pink Ralph Lauren dress worn by Gwyneth Paltrow at the 1999 Oscars. Years after they attended the Oscars, Stone and Parker claimed that they also took acid before the show and were essentially tripping out the entire time. Though Parker and Stone felt that they had no chance of winning the Oscar for Best Original Song, they were both shocked and offended that they lost to Phil Collins. They responded to this personal tragedy in Season 4 by ridiculing Collins for two episodes straight in Cartman's Silly Hate Crime 2000 and Timmy 2000. The original DVD release of the film was somewhat scrutinized by the public, as the only bonus features it offered were three theatrical trailers. This 
This was due to the fact that little to no documentation of the film's creation exists. The film was even released on the infamous Laserdisc format in January 2000 and has since proven to be an extremely rare collector's item. Bigger, Longer, and Uncut earned itself a spot in the 2001 edition of the Guinness Book of World Records, taking home the record for the most swearing in an animated film besides containing 399 swear words, it also contains 128 offensive gestures and 221 acts of violence. On their The Mark, Tom, and Travis show tour in 2000, Blink-182 would often end their songs with lines from the film's song Uncle Fucka. This can be heard on the live album of this tour. Illinois-based wrestler Evan Galestico of the Lethal Wrestling Alliance has used the rock version of What Would Brian Boitano Do as his entrance theme music. He claims it's his favorite song he's ever used. Trey and Matt watched the film for a second time in 2009 for the commentary track on the Blu-ray re-release, only to admit that neither of them had any recollection of creating the film due to their hectic work schedules. Upon watching the movie again, Trey and Matt regretted not having Butters appear in the film, as he would become one of their favorite characters over time. Butters didn't become a prominent character on the show until after the film was made. Ah, uh, shoot, did I disparage streaming in the last one? Ah, uh, well, there's also 107 facts about South Park streaming wars right here for ya. Don't worry, I was just goofing before. Hey there, South Park fans. Welcome back to Channel Frederator. Today we've got something super special for ya. We're diving deep into the chaos, comedy, and hidden gems of the South Park The Streaming Wars movies, both part one and part two. So grab your cheesy poos, yell at Kitty, and let's get started. And remember, if you're not already part of our two million strong community, hit that subscribe button. Number one. South Park The Streaming Wars is not just another episode, but technically a made-for-TV movie. Number two. The creators of South Park, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, have always been known for their sharp political satire. The Streaming Wars is no exception as it tackles the proliferation of streaming services, making puns not just on media streaming but also on the streaming of water. More on that later. Number 3. The movie is part of South Park's 25th season, which had a unique structure. Instead of a full season, fans got only six episodes, making The Streaming Wars a much-anticipated addition. Number 4. On August 5, 2021, Parker and Stone made a deal with Comedy Central, extending the South Park series to 30 seasons. Number 5. The deal ended up being worth $900 million. Number 6. This also included the creation of 14 feature-length films, exclusive to Paramount+. Plus. Number 7. These would be rolled out as two events per year. Wonder what's next? Number 8. Down the road a little, it turned out that these movies weren't exactly, well, movies. Instead, they're more like television specials. Stone and Parker said that Viacom CBS decided to advertise them as movies. Number 9. The Streaming Wars Part 1 and 2 are available for streaming on Paramount+, Plus, a fitting platform given the subject matter. Number 10. Part 1 released on May 11, 2022. Number 11. Part 2 released very shortly afterward on June 29, 2022. Number 12. These specials are the 319th and 320th overall episodes of South Park. Number 13. The quick turnaround time of South Park allows it to comment on current events. This is evident in the streaming wars where the creators managed to include a subtle nod to Will Smith's infamous Oscars slap of 2022. Number 14. Randy, during one of his Karen rages, says to get that f***ing name out of your f***ing mouth. His name is Karen Marsh. You better get that f***ing name out your f***ing mouth! Referencing the slapping incident during the 94th Academy Awards. Number 15. In the streaming wars, Randy Marsh is called a Karen throughout the special. Can you tell me why everyone is calling me Karen? This is a nod to the infamous internet term used to describe entitled individuals. Number 16. During the specials, Randy learns what it means to be a Karen and actually just continues to act accordingly. I have the right to call the cops when things happen! That's fine, Karen. Number 17. Randy Marsh's alma mater is revealed to be the University of the Mountains, as seen in his workroom. Number 18. In this special, Kyle and Kenny are the only boys seen at the bus stop. Number 19. Kyle and Kenny are seen and heard very little during the streaming wars as well. Number 20. Leanne, Cartman's mother, is visibly annoyed with Cartman's behavior in this special. She no longer gives in to his demands, marking a shift in their relationship. 
Number 21. Cartman wants his mother to get breast implants to impress the golf course owner across the street, but she says no. Number 22. Cartman, not one to take no for an answer, raises money for the surgery himself, and when she says she won't get the surgery, he gets the breast implants himself. Number 23. The Cartmans also live in a new abode. It's an old hot dog stand shaped like a hot dog and all. Number 24. Cartman tells his friends that it isn't his fault that his mom lost the house, resulting in their Frankfurter situation. It's not my fault that my mom lost her job and we had to move, you guys. It's really not so bad. Uh, yeah, maybe some other time. However, this is a lie. In fact, it's exactly his fault as demonstrated in the episode City People. Very classic. Number 25. Man Bear Pig is back after years of inaction. You might remember this character from Season 10, introduced by Al Gore as a personified stand-in for global warming. Number 26. The use of Man Bear Pig in the streaming wars seems to suggest that Matt Stone and Trey Parker may have changed their minds about climate change over the years. In the original episode, it appeared to represent hysteria that only got worse when you tried to do something about it. Number 27. In the streaming wars, Man Bear Pig is real and was actually causing problems that needed to be solved. Come to your own conclusions about this though. Number 28. The weather report in the streaming wars explicitly talks about Man Bear Pig as climate change though. Very interesting. Man Bear Pig is to blame. That's right, Tom, it appears Man Bear Pig has done a lot more damage this year than originally predicted. Number 29. Tolkien's dad, Steve, is attacked by Man Bear Pig after discovering that the water park owner, Pee Pee, is behind Denver's water problems. Number 30. Oh yeah, Pee Pee plays a big role here, which is fun after he got introduced as a joke character years earlier. Number 31. The infamous water park, Pee Pee's Splash Town, makes a return as well, and it's revealed that it can now operate on 100% Pee. Unlike in the episode P, where a flood occurs under such a condition. Number 32. Coming back to Steve, he is the third character to survive a man bear pig attack, the first two being Kyle and Ned. Number 33. Steve is voiced by Adrian Beard, who also voiced Tolkien. Beard is also the lead storyboarder for South Park and the art director. Talk about multi talented. Number 34. Man Bear Pig racks up a body count in the streaming wars, killing a real estate agent, the water commissioner, and more. Of course, this just makes the situation all the more super serial. Number 35. The movie features a water rights plotline that is based on the film Chinatown. The water commissioner is even dressed identically to Jake Giddis from the film. Number 36. The water commissioner is also always smoking a joint. A shout out to all the cigarettes smoked in film noir and neo noir movies. Number 37. Ariana Grande is humorously mentioned by Kenny in his famous muffled speech. Yes, man. I was that Ariana Grande was kind of sucking on ass with a gun, but then she found it and then cut out a goat. Adding to the series' long history of celebrity references. In this case, Kenny claims that he dreamed that Ariana Grande has a certain male anatomical feature. Google it. I'm not risking anything. Number 38. The movie includes several songs like Slippery When Wet, WAP, and Use Me, which are heard during various scenes. All of these definitely check out when you think about the themes at play. Number 39. Slippery When Wet is heard while Randy waters his farm and during the intro. Number 40. WAP is heard during Stan and Token's montage with their streaming service boats. Try not to think too hard about those popsicles. Number 41. Use Me is heard when the town of Denver, Colorado uses Pee Pee's pee water. Ugh. Number 42. The Man Bear Pig map in the movie labels different areas with humorous terms like eek, whoa, uh oh, wow, yikes, zoinks, golly, holy cow, yowza, jeez, and oh my. Tag yourself. Number 43. Cartman demonstrating that hairspray is super flammable is a reference to a scene in South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut where Kenny lights his fart on fire. So then Clyde said that if a chick uses hairspray, you can actually light her head on fire. Now what's better, a blue angel or a hairspray flamethrower? Number 44. Music from South Park The Stick of Truth is heard when Steve looks up at the town's mountains, a questing he will go. Number 45. Matt Damon, the long-running butt of jokes in South Park, is mentioned again during the streaming wars. 
His last mention was in the episode Pajama Day. Number 46. While shooting for PP's streaming service commercial, Matt Damon appears hesitant in consuming products produced with P, but mutters, fortune favors the brave before taking them. Number 47. This is a dig at Damon's much derided Crypto.com commercial, where he adopted a similar slogan while implying that if you're brave, you should totally buy into crypto. Number 48. Kelly Rutherford Menskin is seen reading a J.R.R. Tolkien book titled Masterpieces, adding a literary touch while also winking at the character Tolkien's name. Number 49. Randy's Closet is a treasure trove of callbacks, including articles of clothing like those of Lord, the magician's vest worn during cock magic, and his Jamaican vest from Shots. Number 50. Randy returns to his profession as a geologist after four years of being a weed farmer, recalling his past contributions in episodes like Volcano and Two Days Before the Day After Tomorrow. Number 51. His geology skills help come up with an alternative solution to P-Powered Denver, a desalination plant. Number 52. When Randy discusses water molecules while selling his water, he offers up way less than he thinks he does. He says that he will offer 6 million molecules of water, which ends up actually only being a sixth of a billion of a microgram. Doesn't seem like much, does it? Number 53. In addition to Matt Damon, The Streaming Wars also ridicules notable celebrities like Larry David, LeBron James, Gwyneth Paltrow, and others for promoting cryptocurrency and NFTs. Number 54. These crypto hawkers are shown supporting PP's plan to replace all water in the state of Denver with P. A crude analogy, but it checks out. Number 55. Cartman threatens to run away and live with his grandmother, despite her having passed away in a previous episode. I bet he'd do it too. Number 56. The black and white portrait of John Elway, the boss of the Denver Broncos, can be seen in the background of the Denver Council meetings. Number 57. The protractor which Cartman uses for his drawing has an incorrect number of markings in some sections. It's a small detail, but one that eagle-eyed fans might catch. Number 58. The plastic surgeon introduces himself as Dr. Stevens, but his name tag instead displays Dr. Rick. Okay, hello Mrs. Cartman, I'm Dr. Stevens. I understand you're interested in breast augmentation. I guess as long as no pickles are involved with this doctor, we're good. Number 59. In Nobody Got Cereal, Man Bear Pig was supposed to return in five years. That episode aired in 2018, making his appearance in the streaming wars a little early. Number 60. The signs at the swimming pool read locker rooms instead of locker rooms. I'm sure nobody really minds that they're missing an R though. Number 61. The courtroom judge in the beginning appears to be Penny S. Ascarate, the judge of the John C. Depp II v. Amber Laura Heard defamation trial, having her same outfit, glasses, and brown graying hair. Number 62. The scene of Randy smoking his Thanksgiving special is strangely reminiscent of the scene where Doctor Strange uses his spell in Spider-Man No Way Home. If only it actually looked that cool, eh, Randy? Number 63. Randy heavily complaining about his flight seems to be a pretty Karen thing to do, wouldn't you agree? Possibly a reference to the plethora of videos of people freaking out about their airport issues out there. Number 64. Cartman quietly asks his mom to buy him a Wendy's Frosty. I wonder if they got any Wendy's money for that shout out. Number 65. The fourth recording Yates shares with Randy is a parody of a lady yelling at skaters for trespassing at recording without her permission. I'm sure if you've ever watched a Karen compilation, you've seen that one before. Number 66. When Sergeant Yates tells Linda Black, when I find your husband, and I will find him, I'm going to shoot him. It's a reference to Brian Mills' famous quote from the film Taken. Number 67. The waterfall full of pee that Steve wakes up near looks identical to the waterfall cliff from Casa Bonita, a previous episode in the series. Number 68. Under the bench Randy was sleeping on after going nuclear Karen, a bottle of barefoot wine can be seen on the ground, compounding the Karen image. Number 69. Add that to the change in hairstyle and the open US magazine and you've got someone going full Karen. Number 70. Iggy Azalea can be seen on the cover of Randy's magazine. Number 71. Man Bear Pig isn't the only quote unquote fictional character this time around. He's got a girlfriend and a child. Number 72. 
His child, Chuck Chuck, resembles an Ewok from Star Wars, and his girlfriend, Pig Bear Girl, resembles Raquel Welch's Loana from the film One Million Years BC. Number 73. It's also possible that Chuck Chuck is based on Chaka from the 70s TV show Land of the Lost. Number 74. Chuck Chuck is voiced by Betty Boogie Parker, Trey Parker's daughter. Number 75. Betty Boogie Parker, great name by the way, is known for playing other South Park characters with childish voices, like the Member Berries, Ike Bravlovsky, and more. Number 76. Pig Bear Girl is played by Nela Kentu. Number 77. Love, Faith, and Fear by Fitness Glow plays while Cartman, Tolkien, and Butters walk down on the water supply. Number 78. Several animated promo clips from the trailers have differed from the final movie, such as Randy being pushed by women and Cartman whining in front of his mother in the hospital. Number 79. Another scene that was in promotional material but didn't quite make it involved Randy yelling at a grocery store full of people and telling them that he would put them on TikTok. They're all getting fired. But in the end, nobody got fired. Number 80. Randy was seen buying a box of snacky cakes in his shopping cart in a recording. Mm, I love snacky cakes. Number 81. When Randy is in Madrid, the equestrian statue of Felipe III in Plaza Mayor is visible behind him. Number 82. South Park The Streaming Wars Part 1 is the fourth South Park movie, if you consider it a movie. It also happens to be the third made-for-TV South Park movie. Number 83. Part 2, of course, is the fifth movie and the fourth made-for-TV movie in the series, just in case you couldn't figure that part out. Number 84. Before the streaming wars, there were two other South Park special events, South Park post-COVID and its follow-up, COVID Returns. Number 85. The former school bus driver, Jose Venezuela, is replaced with a female bus driver. Did South Park just go woke? Ah, uh, I'm just kidding. Number 86. This new bus driver is voiced by series regular April Stewart. She also voices Sharon Marsh, Leanne Cartman, and Shelley Marsh. Number 87. Parts of the series title sequence are seen with limited characters in the background, possibly hinting at the reduced roles of some characters in the movie. Number 88. In the news website seen on Randy's computer, one of the articles in the side panel reads, War, what is it good for? Referencing the song by The Temptations. Number 89. The owner of the golf club is named Talnua Cussler, possibly a reference to Talnua Distillery, based in Arvada, Colorado. Number 90. Despite the streaming wars making a big point of Randy changing back into his original outfit, the outfit's last appearance was in season 25's Help, My Teenager Hates Me. Number 91. Randy returning to his geologist ways and donning his old outfit is accompanied by a song. This song is custom made for him, letting him know how much he's been missed. Sing along down in the comments. Number 92. At the time this two-part special hit streaming, the entirety of Colorado had been suffering from a drought crisis with their reservoirs, mirroring the plot of the movie. However, this wasn't too surprising, considering the frequency of drought conditions in Colorado. Number 93. We've gone pretty far without explaining the whole streaming wars part. No, it's not about convenient ways to consume digital media. Well, not explicitly. It's about sending little boats down a stream. Get it? Number 94. Steve and Randy learn that they can make some money by selling part of their water supply if the stream reaches Denver's reservoir. Number 95. The boats are used to prove that the water reaches the intended location, but they gotta send them down every day. Stan and Token are then recruited to make more of these boats. Number 96. Eventually, a rival steps in, ready to pay the boys $15,000 for a fleet. This is how Cartman manages to afford his implants. What a world. Number 97. Randy's little boat gets blasted by the new fleet and demands that their deal ends. Number 98. Pee Pee gets cut off from Steve's service, which inspires him to make the Pee Pee streaming service. Number 99. Butters has a nice little rant that makes the joke a bit more clear, wailing on how at the end of the day there's only going to be like three streaming services anyway and everyone's going to get bought out. Good eye, young man. Number 100. PP's streaming service, which he pitches to the Denver Council, is called PP Plus. Pretty similar to a lot of other services, eh? Number 101. PP's commercials apparently haven't been proofread. Each time the word briny shows up, it's spelt with an E between the N and the Y. Number 102. Speaking of briny, remember that desalination plant we discussed earlier? And Cartman's implants? 
Well, it turns out those plot points are closely related. In the end, all of the women in Denver with breast implants, as well as Cartman, drain their saline to power the plant. That is a wild plot point. Number 103. Of course, most of the main characters are still voiced by who you'd expect. Trey Parker plays the roles of Stan Marsh, Eric Cartman, Randy Marsh, Detective Harris, PP, the Water Commissioner, and Clyde. Number 104. Matt Stone voices Kyle Broflovsky, Kenny McCormick, Butter Stotch, Men Bear Pig, and the Custlers. Number 105. Kimberly Brooks plays Linda Black. Number 106. And hey, would you look at that? Towley's here. He's voiced by Vernon Chapman. Number 107. The Streaming Wars was largely well-liked by fans and critics, garnering generally positive reviews across the board. After 749 facts about all sorts of South Park characters, movies, eras, and more, you probably know a whole lot about the show. But do you know which character you are? Are you a Stan? A Kyle? Perhaps a Cartman? Maybe Mr. Garrison? Well, if you can't figure it out, we're here with a helpful guide that will definitely make you feel good about yourself. Let's face it, South Park isn't really known for its, eh, realism. But the world of South Park is absurd by design. Space aliens can kidnap fourth graders, pop divas can become robotic kaiju monsters, and someone's dad can secretly be Lord. Yet, no matter how outrageous the show can get, and remember, this is the show with the singing Christmas poo, South Park's shenanigans boil down to one of the most memorable casts from the past decade or so. And no matter how crazy things get, there's still a little bit of each of us in South Park somewhere. Hey, what the hell is going on? I'm Kirsten with Channel Frederator, and today we're asking one of life's most important questions. Which South Park character are you? Ready to find out which character you most identify with? Let's get started. Stan Marsh do you often find yourself being the voice of reason? Are you a caring and dedicated friend and or sibling? Are you generally affable with a strong moral compass and inclination to do what's right and stand up for the little guy? Are you more or less normal? Congratulations, you might be like Stan. An average fourth grader in a not so average town, Stan Marsh is the closest thing to a leader the group of South Park boys have, even if Cartman might disagree. You, as Stan, will go the extra mile to help out those who are important to you but also have the ability to see things a little more objectively than your peers. That being said, you're not immune to hijinks every now and then. Even the straight man in the show isn't totally straight. Stan Marsh. <laughs> Stan Darsh is more like it. <laughs> Kyle Broflosky, are you smart and compassionate? So stubborn that you constantly end up butting heads with other people? Are you the moral center of your group and still have hope that the world is a salvageable place? And that somewhere, deep down, people are good? If so, you're probably like Kyle Broflosky. Along with Stan, Kyle tends to be the voice of reason on the show. Like Stan, he frequently comes to the defense of the less fortunate, but unlike Stan, Kyle doesn't like to back down when he's convinced he's right. He'll go to great lengths to prove his case, which often leads him into some pretty absurd situations. Or, at the very least, a bet with Cartman. But those two are often the same thing. Eric Cartman. Are you a horrible person? Are you arrogant and confident to almost a superhuman degree? Are you constantly up in arms about some cause or another, usually for manipulative reasons? Then you're like Cartman, and we probably shouldn't be friends. On the upside, Eric Cartman is basically a poster child for what's possible when you believe in yourself, and he certainly would love to literally be a poster child. Unfortunately, Cartman uses that confidence for selfish gain and really couldn't care less about the feelings of others. But he's a real artiste when it comes to manipulation and deceit, which often makes it just about impossible for him not to get what he wants. Kenny McCormick, are you constantly dying? Do you feel like you are the very image of perseverance, so much so that you constantly cheat death itself? Do you suffer from severe sailor mouth, but do few people understand you? Like, literally understand what you're saying? Then, oh my god, you're like Kenny! Kenny McCormick actually has quite a foul mouth, but it's really hard to tell with that parka. He's very amused by toilet humor and has an impressively high ceiling for doing disgusting dares, especially when there's money involved. That being said, you as Kenny definitely have a moral compass when it matters and can be selfless to the point where you will literally die for a cause. Like, 
literally. Wendy Testerberger. Are you politically aware and involved in social justice campaigns? Then breathe a sigh of relief because you're like Wendy Testerberger. Wendy is well liked and respected by her peers, but has never been afraid to go against the grain and do what she thinks is right, even if it flies in the face of what everyone else thinks. She's understanding of people's biz to a point, and then she will put you in your place and even dole out a good beating if people are asking for it, which they usually are. Butter Stutch. Are you the butt of your friend's jokes? Are you effervescent, innocent, and way more naive than is frankly permissible at this point in time? Is your attitude G-rated? These are the traits of a true Butters. Butter Stutch has an impressive imagination and isn't afraid to let him run wild every now and then. He's a complete anomaly among his peers. Not that he really notices. He's just doing his own thing because he doesn't know how not to. Which means you, as Butters, may have trouble fitting in and may feel melancholy about not belonging from time to time, but don't even sweat. We all need our Butterses. Randy Marsh. Prone to spurts of intense obsession? Are you incredibly passionate, but can that passion drive you to act impulsively and immaturely? If you're willing to admit that you're not always the brightest bulb in the shed, you may be like Randy Marsh. Randy has all the confidence and conviction in the world, but comes from a naive and usually well-meaning place. Although Randy is certainly known to act out of selfish reasons. His intense passion about causes and fads is commendable, but it's easy for that passion to overpower him, sometimes driving him into violence. If you're like Randy, you may also be a little too fond of the bottle, so be careful with that, please. Mr. Garrison, are you having trouble confronting some difficult psychological conundrums to the point where you may offset those aspects of your personality onto, say, a puppet? Do you have a suppressed aggressive streak? Do you tend to act out in extremes regardless of whether you're in denial or finally in the throes of long-awaited acceptance? Then you're like Mr. Garrison, or Mrs. Garrison, depending on your season. Mr. Garrison's certainly been through a lot, so we're here for you if you need to talk. On the bright side, you tend to confront whatever you're suppressing eventually, and then, oh boy, do you act on it. But you're being true to yourself, and you'd make Mr. Hat proud. Probably. No character flaws here, right? Were you a Cartman? No? Well, still, I bet someone was. And if that's the case, they're about to feel really evil. The kids in South Park are pretty terrible as a whole. They're all vulgar, mean, and selfish. But for all their faults, the kids have redeeming qualities. All of them, perhaps, except Eric Cartman. Cartman may very well be the meanest kid in all of cartoons. Scratch that, Eric Cartman might be the meanest person, kid, or adult in all of cartoons. Cartman has very few moments of humanity. Most of the time, he seems content to find the way to inflict the most harm possible in the least amount of time. And he doesn't settle for standard evil, like taking over the world or getting revenge. Cartman destroys people in very personal, intimate ways. To put it bluntly, Carmen does some effed up stuff. Some of the most effed up things in all of cartoon history. So let's celebrate the best of the worst. My name is Tim and today on Channel Frederator we're counting down the top 9 effed up things Cartman has done. Let's get started. <laughs> Number 9. Cartman Helps the South to Rise Again Cartman takes bets very seriously, seriously enough to wage entire wars across the country. When he joins the Confederacy in a Civil War reenactment, he declares he can win the war. After the boys bet on it, he not only rewrites the outcome of the current battle, but convinces his southern brethren to march all the way to Fort Sumter and beyond in a glorious campaign, filled with a lot of letters to the home front and all the s'more schnapps you can drink. That's why the whole town goes along with this, by the way. They're drunk on s'mores schnapps. This is quite a way to start off a list like this, but with the exception of Kenny, nobody gets hurt. No lives are destroyed. Carmen wants to win a bet and enslave Kyle and Stan, but he's not invested in the South's victory beyond that. It's effed up, but comparatively speaking, it's pretty mild. For the record, he doesn't win the war either. Stan and Kyle outwit him by reenacting Lincoln and Jefferson Davis negotiating a surrender. Therefore, Cartman as Robert E. Lee has to stand down. Number 8. Destroying a Television Nanny Cartman's mother has had enough of his shenanigans, and considering what her son is capable of, it's a miracle she lasted as long as she did. So she hires every nanny she can think of, 
from television. Eric Cartman responds about as well as you'd expect, though it does present a fun look at the authority behind a timeout chair. It's startling how much kids will do because they're told they have to, even if there's nothing forcing them to obey. Like all television nannies, this one is hoping for an emotional conclusion. The cameras love a story about a kid's vulnerabilities and learning to communicate them. So when Cartman opens up about being scared about his life changing, she pounces. She answers all of his questions like a loving nanny, and he tricks her into talking about herself. Until he finds the chink in the armor. She was never able to have kids, or a relationship, and he twists that knife over and over until she breaks, storming out. There's a lot of sadistic characters in television, it's a trope at this point, but few have the calculating power of Eric Cartman. He finds and exploits every weakness until there's nothing left but a husk, and this is one of the more merciful ones on the list. Number 7. Entering the Special Olympics Under False Pretenses Cartman is evil, but he's also an enterprising boy. When Jimmy and Timmy are entering the Special Olympics, Cartman learns the best athlete gets $1,000 cash. Set on winning it and thinking he can beat the average competitor, Cartman fakes a mental disability in order to enter and win prizes. It's a lot like the movie The Ringer, but with less reverence and more steroid abuse. Turns out, despite all his effort and research, Cartman is nowhere near capable enough to best the other athletes. He comes in dead last in every event. It's effed up, but seeing immediate comeuppance helps soften the blow here. Also, it's a bit overshadowed by Jimmy using steroids and beating up his girlfriend, which is also effed up. Number 6. Faking Tourette's to say what you want Apparently, Cartman has a streak of faking disabilities. When Cartman meets a kid with Tourette's, he's confused and mean, and then after learning more, sees a golden opportunity. He decides to fake having Tourette's so that he's allowed to say whatever he wants to anybody. Cussing, insults, deep personal secrets he doesn't want anyone to know? Okay, the last one is more punishment than something he wanted. Somehow this seems worse than faking to get into the Special Olympics to me. The Special Olympics gambit requires at least some athletic effort and has a rational reward of $1,000. This doesn't. Carmen just goes out of his way to curse and shout and be mean and a nuisance. Credit where it's due though, I laughed way too hard at his rendition of I Got a Golden Ticket. Number 5. The Christmas Critters Story Cartman has an active and healthy imagination and comes up with an original Christmas story for the whole class to hear. It involves a bunch of cute animal critters asking for Stan's help in creating a manger for their savior. Stan obliges with all their requests, even killing a lion that had been harrying the poor creatures, only to learn that they worshipped Satan and were attempting to bring the Antichrist into the world. The story then goes off the rails and becomes a story about trying to administer an abortion to stop the Antichrist's birth. And then Kyle being possessed because he's Jewish, it's horrifying, anti-Semitic, and definitely effed up. I know Mr. Garrison didn't ever care about his job, but even still, I can't believe he lets the story continue for as long as he does. It's not surprising that Cartman would take a dig at Kyle, but this story just has so much horror baked into it. It's almost like watching a Disney movie and then learning about the much darker story it's based on. Number 4. Cartman ruins his future life out of spite. It turns out there's a whole business in faking future versions of kids to try and scare them into doing the right thing. At least that's what the parents of South Park think. It turns out the whole thing is a sham and the kids aren't as bad as their parents think they are. But the idea of future selves gets Cartman thinking about his own future. He realizes that maybe he should eat right and mellow out. At the moment he makes that decision, his own future self comes in to congratulate him. This future self, unlike the others, is successful, saying that Cartman becomes the CEO of a time travel company. To be fair, it's reasonable that Cartman would suspect this is a sham. The other future self were. Cartman decides to spite this hopeful future by choosing to eat whatever junk foods and do drugs whenever he feels like. You see his successful future self transform into a miserable mechanic. Cartman doesn't just ruin other lives out of spite, he will ruin his own life out of spite. Number 3. Using stem cells to create a pizza parlor. Cartman doesn't seem like the kind of person that would approve stem cell research to save a life. He doesn't care about the lives of others beyond what they can do for him. Why should he expend any effort to help anyone else that's sick? Why does he do it here? Well, he doesn't lobby for stem cell research to save a life, but rather clone a pizza parlor. The way he figures, if a stem cell can become anything, then enough should be able to take the shape and become a pizza place. It succeeds, or at least it nearly succeeds, in defiance of all science and reason, but the fact that Cartman can just smile and look over this horrible amalgamation of cells in roughly pizza shape is definitely effed up, no matter how you look at it.
Number 2. Cartman responds to anger management. When Cartman misinterprets a height chart in the school hallway, his anger gets the best of him, leading to an unfortunate misunderstanding and public male anatomy chart. The principal thinks it would be best if Cartman got a few anger management sessions in, so that he can be calm and think through situations. Fair enough. So Cartman goes to anger management and seems pretty cool-headed. The counselor tries to pry rage out of him by insulting his size. If you've been paying attention, crossing Cartman in any way is a mistake. Or is it? Despite all the counselor's prodding, Cartman just sits there. He might be the most even-tempered kid ever. Look at him, he's just texting. Until, of course, the counselor gets a phone call. His wife is babbling about a police report and an underage girl and infidelity before killing herself. After this all goes down, Cartman puts down his phone and just says, I'm not fat, I'm just big boned. It's utterly chilling. And finally, number one, the Chili Con Carnival. We're not going to pretend this was anything other than number one, the quintessential evil Cartman moment. When older kid Scott Tennerman tortures and bullies young Cartman, Cartman decides he has to counter prank Scott to alleviate his torment. At least, that's the nice version of what happens. Cartman doesn't just solve the problem or get simple revenge. What he does is so much worse. He deliberately puts himself in a position where Scott thinks he can pull a big prank on Eric, via chili cook-off. In reality, Cartman expected this prank and reveals his own. He murdered Scott's parents and cooked them into the chili. Scott eats his own parents. Eric uses all of his encounters with Scott to learn more about him, and then annihilate him. That's why he keeps talking about training a horse to bite off Scott's wiener. It's so that Scott will try and get rid of the horse, which will in turn lead to his parents trespassing on the farm and getting shot. And that's not enough. While Scott's crying in horror, Cartman licks his tears and revels in the anguish. It is the gold standard of effed up things any character has ever done. Also, Cartman has Scott's favorite band Radiohead show up just in time to call him a crybaby. Where are you guys? He's an evil genius and merciless mastermind, thriving on the chaos and misery of all mankind, all while wearing a red jacket and blue beanie. That's right, evil has a name, and it's Eric Cartman. This kid would gladly screw his friends over for a cheesy poof, but whether you love or hate this big bone foul mouth fiend, we all know there's more than just a few messed up Cartman moments worth mentioning. What's up guys, I'm JD with Channel Frederator, and because Cartman is just a special kind of effed up character, and keep in mind, even Satan is on this show, it was hard to sum up his jerk moments with just one list. So, we've got nine more effed up things Cartman's ever done. Let's get started. Number 9. Cartman Puts a Price on Kyle's Life The episode Cherokee Hair Tampons shows exactly how effed up Cartman can be, especially when it comes to messing with Kyle. I mean, these two really hate each other, guys. It's bad. In this Season 4 episode, Kyle is dying due to kidney failure and needs a transplant. But the only person in South Park with a matching blood type is Cartman. So basically, rest in peace, Kyle, right? Because when Cartman is confronted about it and begged for mercy, Cartman literally dances and sings the word no. No soft blows here. Although Cartman does eventually agree to give a kidney to Kyle, but for the price of $10 million. Gee, thanks friend. We all know Kyle survives, but it takes a cunning trick to get Cartman to sign the release forms for the surgery. So, much to his discontent, Kyle's life is saved, but it definitely wasn't Cartman's first choice. <laughs> what a buddy. Number 8. Cartman's totally effed up bet. This evil moment involves a contract, a leprechaun, and an epic tale that continues over three episodes. Of course, I'm talking about the deal Cartman makes over whether or not leprechauns exist in the Imagination Land trilogy in Season 11. If you've seen the trilogy, you know how effed up this deal is. It's a little too effed up to say out loud. So instead, I'll just say it sucks for Kyle when Cartman actually proves that leprechauns do exist. In fact, the boys discover that all fantasy creatures exist in a place called Imagination Land, a magical world that gets overrun by terrorists during their visit. Luckily, the boys manage to escape, but Kyle is captured by the government just moments before settling his debt with Cartman. So, Cartman infiltrates the Pentagon to find Kyle. Now that's some crazy dedication. He follows Kyle into Imagination Land to settle their debt, but Kyle's had enough. He finally stands up to Cartman and tells him he's not going to go through with his sucky end of the bargain. So what does Cartman do? He uses his imagination to make Kyle's disgusting payment a reality, and he makes Kyle watch. Now that's evil and gross. Number 7. Casa Bonita Kidnapping Casa Bonita is one of the best Mexican restaurants in all of Denver. In fact, they call it the Disneyland of Mexican restaurants, which is why it's one of Cartman's favorite places to go. And can you blame him? I want to go too, like right now. But in Season 7, what Cartman does for a chance to go there is a whole new level of evil, because 
when Kyle announces he'll be celebrating his birthday at Casa Bonita without Cartman, it quickly becomes a federal case. Since Butters was invited to go instead, well, it's no surprise that he suddenly turns up missing. The entire town is in an uproar over his disappearance, but while the search parties are on the hunt for Little Butters, Cartman has locked him away in an underground bomb shelter, just so he can take his place at the restaurant. Eventually, Butters is found living in the city dump a week later. He'd been completely convinced that the world had ended because of Cartman's evil scheme. He returns to a non-post-apocalyptic South Park, and Cartman is busted before Kyle's party even starts. So to recap, Cartman actually kidnaps another child just for a shot at some Mexican food and cool attractions. But to be honest, I'd even kill for a taco. Number 6. Ginger Vitus Presentation Spreading hate speech is just one of Cartman's usual routines. It's nothing new to the residents of South Park, so no one blinked an eye when suddenly Ginger Kids were his next target of interest. For a class assignment in Season 9, Cartman uses a PowerPoint presentation about his version of Ginger Vitus to slander the Redhead Kids, which causes the other kids in South Park to panic and bully the poor redheads in school. The boys decide to give Cartman the taste of his own medicine the only way they know how, by breaking into his house and transforming him into a redhead overnight. I mean, you can't really argue with that logic. Afterwards, the school kids shun Cartman, so to exact his revenge, he rallies all the redhead kids to stalk and kidnap the other kids in town. It's definitely something out of a Stephen King novel, and it's friggin' scary. Cartman plans to exterminate all non-redheaded kids by throwing them into a pit of lava. But just as the murderous rampage begins, Kyle whispers the truth about the prank into Cartman's ear, leaving him with the realization that the joke is on him. So, like with most his evil plans, everything falls through at the last minute. But this episode definitely makes the list because it left us with a ton of effed up ginger jokes, which is why my redheaded friends hate this episode. Number 5. Cartman Almost Destroys Humanity Another classic makes our list with his all-time favorite moment from Season 4's Trapper Keeper episode. When Kyle gets a brand new Dawson's Creek Trapper Keeper for school, he's happy. And apparently, that's not okay with Cartman, because immediately he upstages Kyle with the very best Trapper Keeper money can buy, which is, of course, also Dawson's Creek. Otherwise, the evil deed wouldn't be complete. Well, a cyborg from the future shows up, claiming that he was sent back in time to destroy the Trapper Keeper because it eventually takes over the planet. Just a normal day in South Park. So, you'd think that Cartman might just hand it over, right? Of course not. This is Eric Cartman we're talking about. Why would he give up an awesome Trapper Keeper to save mankind? Instead, he does the exact opposite and merges with the Trapper Keeper to form this giant evil blob that starts attacking the town and eating people, including Rosie O'Donnell, another super selfish deed by the one and only evil monster, Cartman. And as always, he's defeated. After ingesting Rosie O'Donnell makes him sick, Kyle is freed so he can disconnect the Trapper Keeper, and all goes back to normal in South Park, until Cartman's next evil deed. Number 4. Crack Baby Basketball This is hands down one of the most evil and effed up get rich schemes Cartman has ever accomplished. And I'm talking about his business plan for the Crack Baby Athletic Association. You know the one. When Carmen starts volunteering his time down at the crack baby ward at the hospital, we already know it's too good to be true. And it is. We find out that he's going there to film these poor addicted infants to fight over a ball full of crack. He posts the videos online under the name Crack Baby Basketball, and it gets so popular that he starts generating crazy amounts of cash. He also insists that the business is a non-profit organization, so that none of the money goes to the crack baby. To make matters worse, he starts recruiting new players, or slaves as he calls them, by offering the mothers crack rock for a contract. That's a mighty strong exploitation. As evil as his plan is, Carmen does take a lesson in scheming on this one. It, sorta. Of. When he makes a video game deal with EA Sports, he doesn't realize he's signing over the rights to the company, and he ends up being left with nothing to show for it. Tough luck, Cartman. You're evil, and apparently so is EA Sports. At least in South Park's version. Number 3. Adolf Cartman If there's one thing you should know about Cartman, is that you should never admit he's right. It'll only fuel his evil power. There was only one time Kyle admitted that he was right. In the episode, The Passion of the Jew, and it caused Cartman to go full-blown Hitler. It was really only a matter of time, considering how often Cartman puts down Jews. In fact, the word Jew is almost said in every time Cartman and Kyle get together. But when Kyle admits the Passion of the Christ had an emotional impact on him, just as Cartman said it would, Cartman's prejudice goes to a whole new level. He suddenly takes it upon himself to help spread Mel Gibson's message, which apparently he interprets as completely anti-Semitic. He starts spreading hate speech to the people of South Park, again. But once his following is established, it takes nothing short of Mel Gibson himself to stop Cartman in his genocide pursuit. The townspeople give up once they see exactly how insane Mel Gibson has become over the years, and they decide to just respect each other's beliefs. That's when Mel sharts all over Cartman's face. So, as it turns out, there's a happy ending to this after all. A gross one. It, it's South Park. Number 2. Cartman kills hundreds of hippies. It's no secret that Cartman hates hippies. They're often his number one target for hate crimes. And over the years, we've seen Cartman do some pretty evil things to hippies just for the heck of it. And this one takes the cake. In Die Hippie Die, when more and more hippies start congregating in South Park, 
Carmen warns about the possibility of an upcoming music festival, the size of which would completely overwhelm the town. Obviously, he's laughed at and ignored. Shortly after, he gets arrested for keeping 63 hippies locked in his basement, which on its own is very Silence of the Lambs effed up, and definitely not normal. However, this is one of the few instances where Cartman is actually right, because hippies do consume the town, leaving the people of South Park to beg for his help. So, Cartman assembles a team to infiltrate the music festival in a machine he designed called the Hippie Digger, which tunnels through the massive crowd of people, literally tunnels through them, as in a bunch of people get run over and drilled through. It's basically a giant murder machine. The machine carries them through the crowd to the main stage, where they blast some death metal music that chases the hippies out of town. So, in a weird way, Cartman kind of saves the day, but he still killed hundreds of people on the process, and feels not an ounce of remorse about it. Stone cold hearted. Number 1. Cartman and Cthulhu So this one has to top the list, because while on a superhero kick, Cartman literally manipulates the Dark Lord Cthulhu into doing his evil bidding. Together, the two wreak havoc on the country in the pursuit of making the world a better place, despite thousands of people dying along the way. In Mysterion Rises, Cartman, or the coon I should say, uses his adorable kitten manipulation tactic on Cthulhu to persuade the Dark Lord into getting revenge on his group of super friends, coon and friends who kicked him off the team but decided to keep his name. Oh, and they totally still use his basement as their headquarters too. That's the ultimate middle finger. With Cthulhu's help, he hunts down his friends and banishes them to a hell-like dimension, all over a game of superheroes. Man, you really don't want to get on his bad side. Afterwards, Cartman continues to rid the world of evil, by which I mean kills hippies and Justin Bieber for no reason. If that isn't evil, I don't know what is. Sadly, there's a lot more moments we could have added to the list, but we'll stop here for our stomach's sake. Yep, after watching two episodes of all the worst things Cartman has ever done, well, there's gonna be some soul searching. Hopefully nobody watching this video has ever fed someone's parents to them at a chilly cook-off. But if you have, at least there's a kindred spirit out there in the form of a rotund little Coloradan. On the topic of messed up stuff, why not enjoy a breakdown of eight South Park episodes censored and banned from TV? It just seems right. No one could have ever guessed that an offbeat animation about four rude, crude little dudes would eventually become a pillar of success for the Comedy Central. But here they are, 20 years later, still bringing laughter, cheesy poofs, and swear words. What's going on guys? I'm Justin with Channel Frederator, and today we're taking a look at some of the best examples of censorship throughout the history of South Park, the show whose very claim to fame is controversy, so come on down and have yourself a time. This is 8 Censored Moments in South Park. Number 1. The Pinewood Derby In 2009, MTV created a huge controversy over a last minute decision to pull the South Park episode titled Pinewood Derby from their Latin American channel broadcasting in Mexico. Immediately, fans questioned the nature of this decision, wondering if Mexico's government was to blame for the censored contents. For those of you who haven't seen the episode, several of the world leaders are depicted including Mexico's president Felipe Calderon, as they attempt to deal with an international crisis of intergalactic proportions. Of course, this is South Park, so spoiler alert, they fail miserably. The episode doesn't make the best statement about mankind, and that includes a rather shady depiction of our world leaders as well, who end up taking bribes of space money and spending it rather frivolously. So when the episode was pulled just a few hours before airing on MTV Mexico, people started wondering about their reasoning behind it. The official story reports that the permits required to broadcast an image of the Mexican flag had not arrived in time, and so rather than blur the image in the episode, MTV felt it would be better to wait until they received the proper paperwork because, you know, it turns out there are some pretty big fights for broadcasting casting the Mexican flag without permission. It wasn't until several months later that Mexico's Ministry of the Interior granted the network approval to air the episode. Number 2. Proper Condom Use As if teaching sex ed in public school wasn't painfully awkward enough, Matt and Trey took it to the next level in Proper Condom Use, a cringeworthy episode featuring the wonders of puberty, which was alongside an even worse portrayal of middle-aged teachers tackling the subject. The episode was so revolting that several countries chose to censor it, however they saw fit. Australia broadcast the episode a full half hour later than the usual time slot. The British channel Sky One banned the episode completely because of violence combined with strong sexual content, and it's one of the few episodes not syndicated within in the US, although it still airs on Comedy Central. Surprisingly enough, only one scene was censored to meet network standards, despite such strong reactions towards the episode as a whole. The horrific scene where Mr. Garrison demonstrates how to apply a condom using only his mouth was significantly altered. As you can probably tell by the sound of it, there's no question as to why this scene was edited 
before broadcasting, although the full scene actually did air on Comedy Central once before it was then changed to display the children's reactions rather than the full event. Scarring. Number 3. Sponsored Content Season 19 was heavily focused on the 2016 election, featuring Mr. Garrison as the show's representation of Donald Trump. Since politics are already a hot button issue for the public, especially the 2016 election in particular, the season was bound to ruffle a few feathers, as was the intent. Still though, minus a few obscenities, the whole season managed to air with considerably low criticism regarding offensive material, which is something like an A-plus by South Park standards. Unfortunately, since Censorship eventually worked its way into the season, but the controversy wasn't within the US, it was in the Netherlands. Due to the terrorist attacks in Paris around the time of its debut, the South Park Netherlands network decided to edit the scene where Mr. Garrison talks about dealing with the Syrian refugees. They simply cut out his response, which was, ahem, <clears throat> to f them all to death and switched over to the next scene instead. When fans tweeted the network asking why the scene had been censored, Comedy Central responded with a meme of PC principle claiming that quote, it just wasn't PC enough, end quote. So while it must have been a tough call for the network, it's good to know that they still have a sense of humor about it because you know, we can't forget this is South Park. Number four. Closet Gate. The episode Trapped in the Closet proved itself to be an Emmy-nominated hit for the franchise. It's now dubbed a classic among South Park fans, but it was almost completely removed from syndication in 2006. Once the rebroadcast of the episode had been cancelled without notice, a huge controversy broke out which was eventually dubbed Closet Gate by the Los Angeles Times. According to Matt Stone, the decision came from Comedy Central's parent company, Viacom, and their issue was over the rather zany portrayal of Tom Cruise in the episode. If you haven't seen the episode, Tom Cruise locks himself in Stan's closet once Stan is dubbed the reincarnation of L. Ron Hubbard by the Church of Scientology, at which one point, the entire town begs Tom to just come out of the closet. The implication was beyond blatant here, and because Viacom also owns Paramount Pictures, the studio behind the Mission Impossible franchise, a controversy stirred. Tom Cruise was on a publicity tour for the release of the third Mission Impossible film when the Trapped in the Closet episode first premiered on Comedy Central. Supposedly, Tom threatened to boycott the tour unless the episode was pulled off air. In response, Matt and Trey threatened to terminate their relationship with the network unless the episode was rebroadcast. Ugh, yikes. Needless to say, the episode was rebroadcast a few months later, and Comedy Central denies allegations that Tom Cruise specifically was the reason behind the cancellation, and when the actor himself was questioned about it, he simply stated he would not dignify such rumors with a personal statement. But what do you guys think? Number 5. Bloody Mary Ironically, this episode aired the night before the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, a recognized Catholic holiday, so naturally there was some backlash over the rather offensive depiction of of the Virgin Mary bleeding out of her backside. But you know, it was much larger than expected. The Catholic League of Religious and Civil Rights immediately demanded an apology and that Comedy Central remove the episode from broadcast and DVD release. And to make matters worse, a Viacom board member by the name of Joseph A. Califano Jr. was a practicing Catholic at the time. He joined an effort to ban the episode and successfully removed Bloody Mary from rebroadcast. However, that episode eventually returned to TV the following year in 2006. That same same year, Bloody Mary was scheduled to air on New Zealand's C4 network, but was boycotted by the New Zealand Catholic Bishops Conference. Prime Minister Helen Clark had issued an official statement claiming that the episode was allowed to air on the network, but it was still met with some pretty heavy resistance. Advertisers withdrew from the network, and there was a boycott of C4 affiliates. There was even a court order to stop the broadcast from a company similarly named C4 Productions, on the grounds that it may result in a negative impact on their company, needless to say things blew up. Because, you know, C4, alright, sorry. Of course the courts ruled against the order, but the entire situation had become a media frenzy. Once word got out that there was outrage over the episode, the Australian network SBS pulled Bloody Mary from its scheduled broadcast, claiming that they'd rather dodge any bad publicity from the worldwide controversy, which they did by a long shot. The episode didn't air on the SBS network until a full decade later. Number 6. Super Best Friends One of the most amazing feats that the series has managed to accomplish 
was the somewhat successful depiction of the Muslim prophet Muhammad in the 2001 episode Super Best Friends. We use the term somewhat successful because at the time, the episode was able to air with very little to no controversy, but unfortunately, that's no longer the case. The episode was later pulled in 2006 due to the concerns of public safety. The episode depicted several religious figures, including Muhammad, which were drawn in a Super Friends style parody as they combat a nationwide crisis, a brainwashing cult created by David Blaine called Blaineology, which as you might have guessed, is also poking fun at Scientology. For those who don't know, the drawing of Muhammad is extremely taboo in the Muslim community. No matter how he's depicted, it's a big no-no. In 2006, more than 200 people died over Muhammad cartoons that were published in a Danish newspaper, along with international protesting, boycotting, attempted murder of the people involved, and even full-fledged terrorist attacks. According to Denmark's Prime Minister, it was the worst thing to happen to their country ever since the Second World War. Artists and publications from around the world responded by republishing the cartoons claiming their right to freedom of speech, the result of which only led to more death threats. As a result, Comedy Central completely erased Super Best Friends from broadcast, syndication, online streaming, and DVD release in an attempt to remain on the safe side of the controversy. Screen-capped images can still be found online, most of which have black boxes covering the image of Muhammad as a safety protocol. Number seven, Cartoon Wars. Matt and Trey commented on the international crisis caused by the Muhammad cartoon in the two-part episode Cartoon Wars. The episode also served as a personal insult to the writers of the show Family Guy, whom Matt and Trey have often expressed their distaste towards for various personal reasons. Originally, this episode was scheduled to kick off the 10th season, but Comedy Central postponed the episode's schedule date due to the terrorist attacks that were happening around that time. There was so much much reluctance over the airing of the episode that Matt and Trey decided to include the resistance they faced from the network into the plot, and it mimicked the entire ordeal beautifully. In the episode, when Fox announces that Family Guy will be airing an image of the Islamic Prophet, citizens of South Park panic over the news, fearing that it will result in a terrorist attack. So Kyle and Cartman set out to prevent the episode from airing, but an uncensored version is broadcast anyway. Now, in reality, an actual image of Muhammad was planned to air in the episode, but the network decided to pull the scene completely and replace it with a black slate reading Comedy Central has refused to broadcast an image of Muhammad on their network. Despite disapproval from the creators and fans alike, Comedy Central and Viacom both claim it was simply a matter of public safety. Number 8, 200 and 201. This isn't the first time this dual episode landed itself on one of our lists. You may remember it from our six band episodes of Cartoons video. It's been dubbed the most controversial two-part episode in the history of South Park. Outright banned in several countries, including Sri Lanka, which banned the entire series solely for its obnoxious portrayal of Buddha within the episode. Buddha, don't do coke in front of kids. The series 200th and 201st editions named accordingly debuted during the 14th season and are highly recognized for two reasons. They were nominated for a Primetime Emmy Award back in 2010 and they resulted in personal death threats. The latter are terrifying. Unless you're like afraid of getting awards. To celebrate their 200th milestone, Matt and Trey were dead set on revisiting previous controversies, including a third attempt at depicting the Prophet Muhammad. It had been a solid four years since the international crisis, but when a group of extremists caught wind of the episode, they posted a direct threat online regarding the possible repercussions of the scheduled broadcast. And to really drive their point home, they posted the addresses to Matt and Trey's offices in Los Angeles and New York. That's when Comedy Central went frantic. Hastily, the network completely blacked out all images of the Islamic Prophet, along with censoring any mention of his name, and they removed Kyle's conclusive, I've learned something speech. Both episodes were removed from broadcast, removed from syndication, and removed from online streaming. The DVD release features only the censored versions, except for some countries such as Denmark, Australia, and the UK, which have removed both episodes from their releases altogether. And so far, any attempts to post the uncensored versions online have been met with immediate dismissal, making this one instance of censorship that just keeps on censoring. Let's keep these good times rolling with a trio of South Park theories that will shake your worldview and blow your brains right out the back of your skull. Yes, they're that good. Have you ever told a story about when you were a kid and thought, man, this would make an awesome TV show? In hindsight, the things you did as a kid were pretty awesome, but in reality, they were probably pretty lame. Well, this doesn't really seem to be the case for the kids from South Park. Their lives are insane. When those kids grow up and retell their childhood antics, their stories are going to be pretty fun to listen to. Or wait, 
What if they're already doing that? Is the entire series of South Park actually just a bunch of adults retelling their childhood stories? This conspiracy states that all of South Park is actually just the retelling of the gang's childhood adventures as adults. Like How I Met Your Mother, but with more fart jokes. However, there are a couple different versions of this one concept. Some believe that the adult retelling these stories is an older Butters in therapy. Others believe that it's Cartman's therapy sessions as he's suffering from schizophrenia. Other versions state that it could be stories told at Cartman's funeral by another member of the gang. But we can cover the specifics of the who and where of this conspiracy later. For now, let's focus on why it could make sense that the series is told from the perspective of a reminiscing adult. Some really crazy things happen in South Park. I mean, Earth being an alien reality TV show and meeting Cthulhu? These things are just weird and crazy enough that only a kid could make them up. And if you've ever had a kid tell you a story, they're pretty confident in the validity of their tale. I'm a cop and you will respect my authority! So if this is really the adult versions of these kids retelling their stories, they could be exaggerating them even more. The kids in South Park say and do a lot of things that would get the average fourth grader grounded for life. So if it's adults recounting these tales, their mature humor and cynical viewpoint on life is probably going to bleed through. And the way that an adult would phrase things would also skew the dialogue, which explains all of the endless profanity. No, he's talking about You can't say in school, you Kyle! In addition, the events of South Park span over years and years, Yet the characters don't age or change much. And finally, you can't talk about South Park without bringing up Kenny. The theory explains Kenny's frequent deaths in the show as the kids talking about their friend Kenny who happened to be absent from school a lot. A darker explanation would be that Kenny died in the early years and his friends throw him into the stories as an homage to him. So could South Park actually just be the retelling of a childhood story? South Park is full of crazy twists and turns, so we can't really rule out this theory just yet. As we mentioned before, there are lots of different versions of this conspiracy, so let's take a look at which one would explain this the best. The first version being that the series is an adult Butters talking to his therapist. But how could Butters recount the stories that don't directly involve him, or even those that happened before he was introduced in the series? Well, it's possible that maybe he's just repeating these stories that the other kids told him. Butters is by far the most gullible character in the series, so of course he's going to believe all of these crazy tales that his friends are telling him. All right, Butters, will you go document the vampire's movement so we know what their intentions are? Really? Do you think that's best? Well, after an understandably troubled childhood and being pulled in and out of therapy several times, it makes sense that he would ultimately end up there as an adult. But what if it was Cartman in therapy instead? Others believe that Cartman was so traumatized by his childhood that he ultimately developed schizophrenia. And he's attempting to recall his childhood memories, but they're getting mixed in with these hallucinations. And going back to Kenny. Oh my God, they killed Kenny! There is actually a little bit of truth in this theory. Creator Trey Parker had a childhood friend who wore the same orange parka and was difficult to hear clearly. This friend would skip school quite often, causing his friends to joke about him actually being dead. So this could be what the adult versions of the cast of South Park also did. Maybe Kenny's not really dying. Maybe he's just ditching school a lot. Honestly, this theory could make a lot of sense in several variations. The only thing I'm not buying is a narration. Unlike other flashback shows, such as How I Met Your Mother, there isn't a past tense narration. Over the years, Cartman, Kyle, Stan, and pretty much everyone in the city of South Park have witnessed their friend Kenny die, like, hundreds of times. Yet he always seems to return the next episode with zero recognition of his gruesome death, only to die again merely minutes later. Most fans probably write this off as one of the show's longest running gags. But is it possible that there's an even bigger explanation to Kenny's frequent demise? Does time in South Park move incredibly slow because of Kenny's immortal abilities? There have been several theories attempting to explain the reason for Kenny's frequent deaths, as well as why, despite being on television for 17 years, the kids in South Park don't seem to age. But a theory found on Reddit offers this interesting explanation. Due to an encounter with Cthulhu, Kenny has immortal abilities, which warp reality every time he dies. Time is actually resetting around him and his surroundings. 
which also explains why no one in South Park can remember his many deaths. This is also why after 17 years, three presidential terms, eight Christmas, six Halloween, and seven Thanksgiving episodes, the residents of South Park have only aged two years. It's also why Kenny dies in practically every episode, only to return later. Now some of you might be wondering exactly what Cthulhu is. Well, Cthulhu is an ancient deity created by writer H.P. Lovecraft in his 1928 short story, The Call of Cthulhu. Cthulhu is often described as having an immense power that manipulates the minds of human beings. Lovecraft introduces many other deities in his works, but Cthulhu is the most well-known and considered one of the great old ones. He's the top dog or squid, dragon, demon type thing in the Eldritch Mythos. In the season 14 episode, Mysterion Rises, it's revealed that Kenny is a superhero Mysterion whose special power is the ability to never die. And in the following episode, Coon vs. Coon and Friends, we learn that Kenny's parents used to be members of the Cult of Cthulhu. It is yet to really be revealed if Kenny was sacrificed to Cthulhu or exactly how he got this immortality. However, it is shown that his mom gives birth to a newborn Kenny every time he dies. And he quickly ages to his previous state in a matter of hours. Now, reality warping isn't a new thing to H.P. Lovecraft's Eldritch Abominations. Eldritch Abominations are a type of creature known for their complete disregard of the natural laws of the universe, such as space, time, physics, etc. Is it possible that Kenny is an Eldritch Abomination? And is he the reason the citizens of South Park simply reset every time he dies? On the surface, South Park might seem like the kind of show to throw continuity to the wind, much like its fellow adult animated shows. <coughs> Family Guy. <coughs> but any dedicated South Park fan will say otherwise. That Kenny's frequent deaths are no accident. Creators Matt Stone and Trey Parker have been alluding to Kenny's mysterious powers for quite some time. In their commentary for the episode Coon vs. Coon and Friends, Matt and Trey reveal that there is a quick shot at a spoiler that reveals Kenny's past, hinting that it is not spoken, it's sort of a hidden thing. So let's take a look at this quick shot of what appears to be the Necronomicon, which is a fictional grimoire appearing in H.P. Lovecraft's works. This page seems to be depicting otherworldly realms and some sort of ritual that involves a baby? In the episode, it is implied that Kenny was supposed to be sacrificed, but then his parents stopped attending the meetings. So while we don't know exactly if Kenny was sacrificed or not, his effect on time and reality in the city of South Park is very similar to that of H.P. Lovecraft's Eldritch Abominations. And unfortunately, this theory in its entirety has not been confirmed on the show yet. But thanks to Matt and Trey, we've got a pretty good feeling it's coming soon. Have you been watching South Park lately? Because the last few seasons have really been something else. And as it continues, it's just as strong as it's ever been. The show's previous season, its 19th, provided us with this overarching, gripping narrative about the changing dynamic of the town. And at the center of it all, there were two major catalysts to this sea change. PC principle and the ever-present threat of ads. You know the threat they're talking about. Ads are everywhere. You might have even seen one before this video. And according to South Park, ads have evolved so rapidly that they've developed their own artificial intelligence. Ads walking around disguised as humans. We even saw one in the character of Leslie. And at the end of the season, we see PC Principal and Leslie face off in a final confrontation that was... maybe a bit rushed? If you think so, you're not alone. A lot of South Park's fans thought that the season kind of petered out into this really abrupt conclusion. But still, some fans think there's a reason for that. Despite what the show may have told us, the ad war is not over. If PC Principal is one of the champions against ads in South Park, which we saw at the end of the season, there's one big thing that makes you do a bit of a double take. At the end of episode eight of season 19, sponsored content, we learn the dark secret of the ad's intelligence. Shortly after, we see an ad for State Farm, which shows Leslie being pushed on a swing. Nothing unusual so far since, you know, Leslie's an ad herself, but who's that pushing her on the swing? It's none other than PC Principal himself. Because of his supposed connection Connection with Leslie before the events of the season finale, we have to ask, is PC Principal an ad? And if so, is he even aware of it?
The strongest evidence for this theory is, of course, the ad we see PC Principal in with Leslie. This was unmistakably the biggest thing that got people talking about PC Principal's as of yet unknown origin. And since Leslie is clearly established as an ad, PC Principal's supposed close association with her is obviously worth questioning. But the weirdness with Leslie doesn't stop there. Throughout the whole season, one of the biggest running gags was PC Principal's antagonistic attitude towards Leslie. He picks on her more than anyone else, usually telling her to shut up when he sees her talking to somebody. Is it possible he does this because he knows the ads are trying to spread their influence to the kids, compromising Leslie at school functions in order to stop her? And if he actually does know the ad's plan, that would again make you question where he got this information from, unless he was an inside man. By the way, if you didn't watch the last season but you are watching this video, the ad's plan that I mentioned is that the ads wanted to spread toxically, causing gentrification throughout the world and consequently, according to Randy, pricing humans out of existence. Yeah, it was a bit of a weird season finale. But the link with Leslie isn't all we have to look to. PC Principal says in the season finale, PC Principal Final Justice, quote, I don't know what they are, but they use me and others like me to try to change the planet. We, the viewer, are probably meant to interpret this as the ads using PC culture in order to spread their influence, which is kind of obtuse and convoluted when you think about it. But remember, one of the last episodes in the season was named, and also mostly about, sponsored content. Ads masquerading as news stories in order to sell a product or push an agenda. And a lot of fans have noted that apart from politically correct, PC is also conveniently an acronym for another term. And no, not the one that Jimmy publishes in Super School News, a another acronym. Paid content. This has led some people to believe that PC principle could actually be a symbol for how these fake news articles are able to convince people of being something that they're not. In the case of sponsored or paid content, the goal is to make people believe that an ad is the news. And in PC principle's case, his goal is to convince us that he's human. As well as doing some of that not-so-subtle social commentary that Trey Parker and Matt Stone have become known for. So, is that it? Is PC Principal secretly an ad? Lying in wait, poised to strike back like Leslie said ads do in PC Principal Final Justice? Will we see a resurgence of the ad's presence in future seasons? Is there anything here we can expand upon? So, Let's talk artificial intelligence. First, I want to talk about something called the Turing test. For those unaware, the Turing test was developed in 1950 by English mathematician, logician, and computer scientist Alan Turing. The goal of the experiment, in short, was to test a machine's ability to mimic human behavior. When Turing conceptualized the test, however, it originally was only intended for communication over text. Like, say, through a computer. This is because it's a reasonable way to achieve complete impartiality when testing. You can't tell who's sitting on the other side of a computer, whether it's a human or a... a computer. That's why the test is here. The actual setup of the test involved three components. The first party, a human, would converse with a second party, a computer, over text. The third party, an impartial human, would observe the text conversation playing out. They would then be asked to determine which of the participants was human and which a machine. If the observer couldn't reliably or confidently answer the question, the machine is then considered to have passed and succeeded in the imitation game. A term that's pretty self-explanatory. The Turing test has become incredibly well known and has become a staple of the philosophy of artificial intelligence. And while it's been met with its share of criticism, other similar types of tests and thought experiments have been added in an attempt to build onto this conversation. Things like John Searle's Chinese room argument. It's a really interesting response to the Turing test, and if I had more time to go into it, I would. You should check it out on your own time though, it's a really great read. But when it comes to the Turing test, a more tangible example that you might remember is Cleverbot. It and other efforts on the internet have a similar end goal. That goal being to learn how humans talk and then adapting to sound more like them until they become indistinguishable from humans. I actually went back to Cleverbot when writing this episode for old time's sake, and it told me that it didn't like Scary Story, and then it called me Richard, even though I never gave it my name, and then it asked me why I was in jail. So yeah, it's not exactly Skynet. 
But what does any of this have to do with South Park? Think back to the scene where Jimmy discovers Leslie's secret in sponsored content. All Jimmy does is talk to Leslie for a bit before realizing that she is, in fact, an ad. And the scene also provides the viewer with an unsettling atmosphere and music cues to give us the same realization. The scene appears to be its own spin on this kind of test. Only Jimmy plays both human roles in participant and observer, in trying to determine if the other party is a machine or not. And in this case, Leslie actually fails the test because Jimmy is able to tell she's an ad very quickly. And because Jimmy can, we also can because the scene is structured to make us feel the same way Jimmy does. This brings us to a pretty substantial point against PC Principal being an ad. Jimmy, who is said to have a unique gift for finding undercover ads, didn't notice or say anything that would suggest that PC Principal wasn't human, which seems to shoot down our theory fairly quickly. But who's to say PC Principal hadn't just passed this Turing-like test, skillfully pretending to be human with Jimmy and everyone else being none the wiser. Though if that previous point were true, it would also imply that PC Principal was the most advanced ad ever devised. In the 19th season, Leslie is shown to be the pinnacle of the ad's abilities when it comes to mimicking humans. But if PC Principal could actually successfully pass as a human, in an authority position no less, it would mean that PC Principal is leagues ahead of Leslie when it comes to AI. So if we're to accept the ads as their own sort of unseen super army that PC Principal was once a part of, why would he be a champion in the battle against ads? We would have to figure that he was never aware of his being an ad to begin with. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense for him to, you know, do the things he does in the season finale. Unless he's really, really ridiculously deep undercover. But it's equally possible he could have gone rogue. There's no shortage of sci-fi stories where an artificial intelligence gains awareness, and the reactions of the beings in these stories can range from pensive to vengeful to everything in between. PC Principal would, of course, land somewhere in the... in, in the vengeful area. But that's pretty baseless speculation. What can we take a look at that's already appeared in the show? Well, in PC Principal Final Justice, Randy, when showing his family the previously mentioned State Farm ad, says that putting PC Principal in the ad with Leslie was done intentionally by the ad... Hivemind? Collective? What do, I, what do I call it? The ads. Anyway, it was done intentionally to distract, mislead, and divert him which can be interpreted in a couple of ways. If we assume PC Principal isn't an ad, we can take everything Randy says at face value. PC Principal could have just been placed in the ad to confuse him and make him question things. But if you found yourself photoshopped into a situation that you clearly weren't in, would you freak out in the same way that PC Principal did at the end of sponsored content? Of course not. You'd probably just try to find out whoever, I don't know, hypothetically photoshopped you riding horses with Vladimir Putin, Eric. But if we assume PC Principal is an ad, this strategy would probably be more effective. If he's an artificial intelligence, that leaves the door open to tampering with his memory, making him unable to recall certain events, like, for example, the fact that he's an ad at all, which would certainly confuse him if he saw the truth that he was an ad. It would drive him nuts, unsure of what's even real, which would explain his shock and disbelief at the end of the episode. Finally, let's talk about the doublespeak theory, that PC could stand for paid content as well as political correctness. It's no secret that PC principle is primarily used to poke fun at PC culture. That's right, folks. South Park may not actually be politically correct. We provide only the most shocking revelations here on Cartoon Conspiracy. But with that, there's no refuting that the PC and PC principal's name definitely stands, at least in part, for politically correct. But that doesn't entirely discount the paid content argument either. When hearing about the ad's plan to gentrify the planet using PC, again, it sounds like a pretty roundabout way to go about it. But what if, when taking quotes directly from the show, for instance, PC Principal's words at the end of PC Principal Final Justice, your species took PC and twisted it for evil purposes, he actually is referring to paid content. In our own world, ads posing as news stories have an incredible power to mislead the public into believing something that isn't true, and they're often pretty successful at it. And that kind of paid content can lead to unpredictable consequences. So while the PC and PC Principal's name might not actually stand for paid content, there's undoubtedly some really impressive wordplay going on this season, whether it was intended by Trey Parker and Matt Stone or not. 
We've covered a lot of ground today and found a couple of ways to look at this theory. But at the end of the day, it's pretty hard to make a judgment on whether or not PC Principal is human. But if nothing else, we can absolutely confirm that if he is an ad, PC Principal has passed the Turing test with flying colors. And if he has, Who's to say others haven't as well? There's a lot more speculation we can make about this theory. Like, if PC Principal is still a threat, why hasn't he had much screen time this current season? But come on, 2016 was an election year. Trey Parker and Matt Stone weren't gonna let that slip through their fingers. So with all that said, is PC Principal an ad? Will he become a more important character in future seasons because of this? I honestly have no idea, but I'm leaning slightly towards him being human because some of the rational explanations we've provided, like photoshopping him into the ad, like Jimmy not saying anything about PC Principal because there's nothing to say. They all make pretty practical sense. So with that in mind, I'm going to rate the conspiracy of PC Principal being an ad two Whole Foods out of five. But what do you think? Do you think PC Principal might be an ad? Do you think his story will be explored more in later seasons? And what do you think of South Park's newfound relationship with continuity? Personally, I'm into it, but do you think it works or should the show go back to being more episodic? Make sure you let us know what you think of these theories down in the comments and add your own for good measure. South Park isn't just an incredible incredibly successful and long-running TV show with a handful of feature-length movies to round things out. It's also a video game empire. Yeah, South Park is for the gamers. And they're not just dinky little tie-ins meant to cash in on popularity, they're fully realized RPGs with interesting mechanics and unique stories. There's also a mobile game, but we're not talking about that today. For now, we've got a bushel of videos about the stick of truth and the fractured butt hole, and they're a whole lot of fun. There are comparisons, Easter eggs, facts, and more. Enjoy. After the success of the Stick of Truth, Matt Stone, Trey Parker, and Ubisoft have invited you to come on down to South Park once more with their newest installment of everyone's favorite game franchise, Full of Farts. Hi, I'm Jacob with the Leaderboard, and we're here to tell you 107 facts about South Park the Fractured Butthole. And before we get started, make sure to subscribe and click the bell icon to become part of our notification squad. <laughs> South Park's creators, Matt Stone and Trey Parker, said they learned so much from making the Stick of Truth that they felt they could make an even better game, and this motivated them to go and make The Fractured Butthole. The Fractured Butthole is the sequel to The Stick of Truth and picks up where The Stick of Truth left off. In fact, the very next day after. The story this time is that the kids have been playing superheroes, but have gotten into a big fight about their franchise and are now in the Civil War phase of their superhero plot. Matt and Trey said their goal was to recreate that feeling of being a kid when you did things like put your underwear outside your pants and run around trying to save the town while pretending to be a superhero, implying that I don't still do that as an adult. The game references phases for their superheroes, which spoofs the phases that Marvel uses to structure and market their cinematic universe, but I don't think we'll ever see a Marvel movie with this caliber of fart jokes. Matt and Trey wanted to get into the idea of who you are in South Park and allow you as a player to define who you are. In the last game, you were cool because you rose to basically become king, but in this game, the kids have switched what they're playing, so you're back to just being a regular old douchebag again. While I can't really relate to the new kid in Stick of Truth, I can relate a whole lot to the being a lowly douchebag part. The creators also wanted to use the kids changing genre and therefore your social standing to poke fun at the RPG convention of going back to being weak in the sequel even after you became so strong in the last game. Parker said that they needed to give the character the emotional motivation that every superhero has to go and fight crime. For your character, that's the emotional trauma of catching your parents having sex in the middle of the night, which to be fair would be much more traumatized than a bat phobia. Oh yeah, I guess Bruce did also have that whole murdered parents thing. Whatever, details. Stone explained that the appeal of the game is that it allows the audience to experience the town of South Park in a way that wouldn't be possible in the linear narrative of a TV show. The game was originally going to be titled The Butthole of Time, but retailers wouldn't put that title on a shelf. The Fractured Butthole was a play on words that Stone and Parker offered as a compromise so that no shop customers had to be confronted with buttholes if they didn't want to be. Ubisoft knew that the success of the Stick of Truth came from the authentic of the South Park experience, and so giving gamers that authentic experience this time around was their goal from day one. While there have been a few episodes about the Coon and Friends superhero personas, they were limited to the main characters, Cartman as the Coon, Kenny as Mysterion, and all of the others. For the Fractured Butthole, however, the cast of heroes was expanded to include kids like Scott, aka Captain Diabetes, Dr. Timmy, and Jimmy as Fast Pass. Parker and Stone are both gamers, and had a very hands-on approach to the development of the Fractured Butthole. They brought the Ubisoft team into their earliest 
meetings when conceptualizing the game. While conceptualizing the game, Parker and Stone knew early on that they wanted it to be about superheroes, and that they wanted you to play as the same kid from the last game, because why not? Alter egos go a long way. According to the game developers, Parker is a hardcore RPG gamer and plays a lot of tabletop games. This meant it was easy for the developers and Parker to come up with a common shorthand while developing combat systems and other gameplay mechanics. Stone is more of an action gamer who doesn't want to be held back from cool experiences. This contrast to Parker helped the developers create a game that they think appeals to both hardcore and casual players. Unlike the Stick of Truth, which went through multiple publishers, the Fractured Butthole worked with Ubisoft from start to finish, meaning that the game was created with a consistent vision and team, and that Parker and Stone's vision didn't have to be censored in any way. Game director Jason Schroeder said that when he started working on the game, he had to fight his impulses as a fan. When he got scripts in, he initially didn't want to read them and get spoilers, but he obviously had to because he was working on the game. When developing the Fractured Butthole, Parker said that he watched a streamer play Stick of Truth to see a fan play the game and react in real time. Developer said that the camera was a challenge to figure out because South Park is shot like a camera over construction paper and the game engine had to be able to match this when zooming out. While it may look simple, the hand-drawn slash digital construction paper look can actually make the animation process more complex than your usual AAA game with high-end graphics. Even the trees in South Park each have an individual hand-drawn look. Full assets from South Park, characters, backgrounds, etc. were sent to the developers so that they could work fast, like the show does, and get the best jokes in place. In most games, the character looks and moves like a skeleton, but for the fractured butt hole, the developers moved the characters more like puppets to better replicate the feel of the show. It used the process of switching parts to create the illusion of movement as opposed to actual movement. As a show, South Park obviously could not be done without the work of their huge team of in-house animators. Bringing them on to work with the game engine was essential to Ubisoft so that they could create an authentic South Park experience. At first, the instinct of the animators was to make the South Park characters move as much as possible with all body parts like a person does. They quickly realized that's not how South Park works, and the look of the show lies in how so much comedy comes from so little movement. A detail you might have missed in the South Park TV show is when the characters are talking to each other, a lot of the time they actually face the camera, not each other. The development team realized that they had to do the same thing during game combat and have the characters in conflict face the camera in order to create the same look. When developing the combat, Parker wanted to keep the turn-based element of combat from the Stick of Truth because turn-based combat makes it much easier to incorporate story elements and it also makes it easier to integrate comedic timing into every part of the gameplay. And don't worry, you don't fight alone. You're also joined by characters from the show, all of whom have their own unique sets of powers in what developers would categorize as a tactical RPG. There are differences in developing the show and the game. Parker and Stone turn around an episode of South Park in six days, which is insane, by the way. But of course, a game can't be made in that time, so the process had to be elongated. That said, the developers strove to make it possible for Parker to try things out in his usual improvisational fashion during development. The South Park art department from the show wanted to recreate the fun from the last game of dressing up your character, so the game provides a large number of concepts, allowing you to dress your character as good or as terrible as you want. Parker said it was important for them to have a balance between complexity so that the game was fun and engaging to play, and simplicity so that it still felt like South Park. They didn't want a game that was like a movie where you press X a lot. The game developers felt that building your own South Park superhero identity and recognizing yourself in the game was very important, so they deliberately made sure that your character's appearance and what they wear had nothing to do with your abilities, unlike most other RPGs. The game has three difficulty settings, the highest of which is Mastermind. The game developers feel that Mastermind is the best place to see the depth of the RPG mechanics on display. 2013's The Stick of Truth was censored in both Australia and Germany due to its controversial content. However, the Fractured Butt Hole was not adjusted in any way for the Australian release, meaning that Australians were able to experience the game's total ass control farting mechanic just as the creators intended. Matt Stone has said that he believes that the interactivity of the games makes people more uncomfortable with edgy content than they would be in a linear medium like TV. He pointed out that content that was censored from the last game, The Stick of Truth, would have aired on TV without issue. South Park The Fractured Butt Hole was given an M rating by the ESRB, which isn't a surprise, but the rating's description that justify their choice is pretty entertaining. It explains the rating is due to scenes that include blood and gore, mature humor, strong language, urinating and defecating, a character performing a lap dance while emitting flatulence, a towel character performing obscured sex, all in a cartoony and over-the-top manner. Honestly, the over-the-top part seems just kind of redundant to me. With farts being such a prominent feature in the game, the developers gave fans the opportunity to submit fart sounds via an online contest called I Am The Fart, all for the chance to have their farts featured in-game. The winner was chosen by popular vote. Democracy in action. The game suffered two delays during development, once from December 2016 to March 2017, and then once again to October of 2017. Game director Jason Schroeder said that a big reason the game took so long to make 
critique was an obvious one. Good comedy. He said delays were more about polishing the content they had so that they didn't have to compromise on any jokes. The script for The Fractured Butthole was a massive 360 pages, which for reference is the length of two feature films. It's also twice the length of their first game, The Stick of Truth. The new gameplay mechanics may seem fun now, but it added a lot of challenges to the writing process. This coupled with an extended script was another reason for the multiple delays in the release of The Fractured Butthole. One of the challenges in development was the back and forth between Ubisoft and the South Park production offices, with Ubisoft waiting on scripts while South Park's offices waited to see gameplay. Parker said that he felt the best parts of the game are those where the gameplay is the joke rather than just putting jokes in with gameplay or vice versa. Even if the game was delayed, you can't accuse Trey Parker of not caring. During development of The Stick of Truth, he had to have emergency gallbladder surgery and following the operation, he convinced his doctor to let him leave the hospital temporarily to get the dialogue laid down. On his way back to the hospital, he said, I just want this game to be sweet. Well, let me tell you, that story sure is. One mistake that Stone felt they made with The Stick of Truth was that they set out to make Skyrim when they should have been making a more linear game. This time around, they were keen on avoiding this problem during development. Because of the fast turnaround for an episode of South Park, they can satirize things that happen just days before the episode airs. That wasn't quite possible with The Fractured Butthole, although they did manage to get jokes in about events that happened two or three months before release, which is pretty impressive for a video game timeline. Lead narrative designer Jolie Menzel said that letting Stone and Parker play early builds of the game was key to helping them realize their vision and articulate it to the team at Ubisoft. South Park's game engine, Snowdrop, is the same game engine that powers The Division, but that's probably where the similarities between the games end. Oh, other than Snow, both, both games have that. While the game developers may have been working with cutting-edge software, Menzel said Stone and Parker wrote their scripts on Movie Magic Screenwriter, an ancient screenwriting program. Her guess is that they started using it when they worked together in college and just never stopped. The script for The Fractured Butthole was written by Stone and Parker like a traditional movie script with the stage directions between dialogue being the action that Ubisoft's team would translate into gameplay. Ubisoft said that they saw themselves as the straight man in the process of collaborating with Stone and Parker, saying that they handled the punchlines while it was Ubisoft's job to set up the shots so they could slam it in. Game director Jason Schroeder said it was his job to tell Stone and Parker no when necessary. They wanted someone who could get things done, not someone who would be a pleaser. A lot of the jokes about the nature of video games came from the times that Stone and Parker would find a creative choice or change impossible because of the constraints of the video game medium. When they found that they weren't allowed or able to do something, their response was to make fun of it, leading to even more comedy. Schroeder said that he could always tell when Parker was going to ask him to make a last minute change because he would always start the call with, how much is it gonna bum you out if, insert unreasonable demand here. I mean, at least he's nice about it. Saturday Night Live alum Bill Hader was involved in the game, but not quite in the way you would expect. He's a frequent collaborator on the TV show, and when the 20th season of South Park began to air while the game was still being developed, Jason Schroeder joked that Bill Hader was the muscle making sure that Stone and Parker didn't take too much time away from working on the TV show to work on the game. Most games have a system in their animation for their character movement that generates in-between poses when they move from point A to point B. Ubisoft found that they could do that for South Park, and while it didn't look bad, it just didn't look like South Park. So they ended up animating everything by hand rather than using a physics system. South Park The Fractured Butthole is available on Xbox One, PS4, and also PC. That means that some of the controls had to be adapted. The example given by developers was a lap dancing sequence in the game. It was originally envisioned with an analog control, but for PC, it had to be adapted to keyboard. There's a lot of jokes hidden deep in the game, along with jokes that players can create for themselves. Ubisoft's playtesting labs around the world were an essential resource for these, making sure that players were able to find the hidden jokes and skits and have as much fun as possible. While references and callbacks are fun for committed fans of the show, it was important to Stone and Parker that the game didn't put them in unnecessarily. Parker would always ask if there was a good reason that a reference was being made. Members of the Ubisoft San Francisco team had also worked on another popular game with absurd action, No More Heroes 2. The Fractured Butthole's game director, Jason Schroeder, also worked on Marvel Ultimate Alliance and used his experience working on a superhero property in the past to help him with this project, but he also kept in mind the important difference that the South Park characters are just kids playing pretend. Jolie Menzel was a comic book major in college and has a BFA in sequential arts, so she was also an expert on the superhero subject matter of the game. During the development of The Stick of Truth, music was pulled directly from the show, but for The Fractured Butthole, the lead audio designer, Nicholas Bonardi, worked with longtime South Park composer Jamie Dunlap to create a more original sound. The game's score pays homage to iconic superhero films in very specific ways. For example, the music accompaniments for Mysterion and the Coon are heavily influenced by the score of Christopher Nolan's Batman films, while the group antics of Coon and Friends are accompanied by more Avengers-style music. The game's music isn't just limited to superhero films. When the player encounters the Vamp Kids, we're treated to a soundtrack reminiscent of Castlevania and the Konami rock sound. The game score was handled mostly by Dunlap, but sound effects were entirely done by Ubisoft. They were given access to the show's iconic sounds, from doors to the school bell to vocal cat meows. One sound effect that had to be 
recorded from scratch was fart sounds, with Ubisoft using a huge variety of instruments and mixing techniques to create a menagerie of fart options. As they worked on it, all fart sounds were sent to Stone and Parker for approval, and they ended up with a library of over 100 fart sounds to use in the game. Bernardi said his favorite superhero scores growing up were the soundtracks for the old Christopher Reeve Superman movies and Danny Elfman scores, but there was a limit to how much those influences could be brought to the game, because you can only Elfman so hard. In terms of contemporary superhero movies, Schroeder says that he most admires what's being done with the Captain America franchise. Can you see any Cap influences creeping into the game? Lucas Walker, a senior animator on South Park who moved over to Ubisoft to help with the launch of the game, said that his favorite South Park episode to work on was Pandemic, because despite the show's six-day production schedule, they were able to perform the technical feat of integrating a live-action hamster into the animated episode. The fractured butthole is longer than the stick of truth because Trey wrote a longer experience, meaning it's not just for the sake of dragging out playtime for gamers. When developing comedy moments for gameplay, like for puzzles or combat, the key word the developers kept in mind was unexpected, because they wanted to make an experience that feels like a normal puzzle, but then surprises you and makes you laugh. One of the most famous examples of the kids playing heroes in the show is the episode Good Times with Weapons. It depicts the kids in full-blown anime while periodically revealing that they're just playing pretend. The developers cite that episode as an example of the kind of comedy they wanted in the game. To promote the game, South Park and Ubisoft created the Nauseous Rift, a riff on the Oculus Rift. The Nauseous Rift is a device that creates an immersive experience by filling your nose with a fart odor every time your character lets one loose in the game. Ubisoft actually constructed the device and gave it to convention attendees. Fortunately, it's not currently available in stores. Unless you're into that sort of thing, in which case you're probably disappointed. True to the spirit of the show, a mini game is included that allows you to poop in every home in South Park. It's not just the push of a button either, it's a full rhythm game reminiscent of a Guitar Hero or Dance Dance Revolution that gets more challenging depending on which toilet you try to... conquer? Sure. As a reminder that kids are playing a game within a game, if you're battling on the street, all characters will periodically have to get out of the way of traffic and wait for it to pass while adults berate you for playing in the street. There are three types of superheroes you can play in the game. Brutalist, like The Thing, Blaster, like Cyclops, or Speedster, like The Flash. You can eventually mix and match powers from over a dozen different classes. The two additions to combat were the use of space and the use of time. Space means, unlike the Stick of Truth, characters are no longer restricted to one position in combat. You can move into tactical positions to attack your enemies, move behind cover, push and pull enemies, etc., but be careful because they can do the same to you. New Kid's magical butthole in the first game was legendary, and that hasn't changed. Stone and Parker wanted to continue this, uh, memory story element, so your character's farts are now so powerful you can rearrange the fabric of time, which in combat means you can rearrange the turn order. Sixth graders are the most feared enemy in the world of South Park. Even mobsters fear them, because sixth graders are willing to do literally anything to get what they want and have no scruples. The game asks you to choose between one of two sides in its civil war, the Freedom Pals led by Mysterion, aka Kenny, or the Coon and Friends led by the Coon, aka Cartman. The adults in the fractured butthole are far more aware of the kids than they they are in the stick of truth when they were pretty oblivious to the children's actions. The adults can also be harmed much more by the kids this time around, with many more real attacks like tourists that are created by the kids and directed at adults. Even member berries make an appearance in the game. There are 14 different pots of them hidden around the town of South Park, and don't forget, they're an essential crafting ingredient for your time fart attack. Another collectible you can search around for is the 40 pieces of artwork hidden around the town, all of which feature Tweak and Craig in the Japanese yaoi art style. Craig's dad will give you money for every piece of artwork you find, and if you want a hint, once you unlock the Sandblaster ability, you can find a map of all the locations in Bebe's basement. Happy hunting. While South Park has a history of disdain for authority, the creators don't look kindly on cheating in their video games. Early in the game, you need a password from Cartman's diary to get into his basement, but if you type it in without reading said diary, a window containing Cartman dressed as Bill Belichick will pop up and tell you not to cheat. A key gameplay difference between the Stick of Truth and the Fractured Butthole is that the turn-based strategy in the Stick of Truth was more of a classic retro RPG turn-based combat system, whereas the Fractured Butthole incorporates a grid system, reminiscent of Final Fantasy Tactics and Fire Emblem. Choosing your team isn't just about a balance of power. You also get to see characters' attitudes towards each other on full display. Put Wendy on a team with Stan and she's full of compliments, but put her on a team with Cartman and she treats him with the contempt she's had for him throughout the show's run. There was a prequel episode to The Fractured Butthole released on Comedy Central, appropriately titled Franchise Prequel. The story showed Professor Chaos, aka Butters, using an army of trolls to spread fake news about the superhero kids, which eventually leads to their split, and Mark Zuckerberg is somehow involved because it's the internet. The developers wanted Cartman's abilities in the game to reflect his obvious self-delusion,
Legion, so it shows him exaggerating his physical power while we see his clear physical weakness and incompetence in real life. Most character creation systems in games only give you the option to be a boy or a girl, even in a day and age when many feel that these definitions don't express their true identity. The Fractured Butthole sets itself apart by allowing you to build a very specific gender identity via a detailed questionnaire that you fill out for the school counselor, Mr. Mackey. Like the RPGs that inspired it, the game lets players inflict or suffer from typical status ailments such as burned or chilled, however, you can also inflict something more specific to the world of South Park, such as grossed out, which characters typically suffer from after being hit by bodily fluids or gases. Unlike the Stick of Truth, the Fractured Buttholes battles are impacted by the place you start them. Ever wanted to slam Randy Marsh into the side of his car? Of course you have! Start a fight with him near it and you can! The game doesn't just spoof and give nods to superhero movies, but superhero games as well. The Fractured Butthole uses a detective mode to help the player examine their environment, a feature lifted directly from the popular Batman Arkham series. Your character sheet stats in South Park are mostly self-explanatory. Brawn is strength, dexterity affects your ranged attacks, but your magical abilities, instead of calling the stat mana or magica like most games, the Fractured Butthole calls the stat that measures your inner magical and special abilities spunk. Can't say I'm surprised in the slightest, really takes balls for them to change that. Kenny's inability to permanently die is perhaps South Park's most famous running gag. It's now purpose for Kenny's superhero alter ego, Mysterion, whose powers are that he can never die. Need a little extra help in the game? Special editions of the game, including the collector's edition, add a Towley feature, in which the popular character Towley will pop up at key moments in the game and advise you about your next steps. Fancy yourself a chef? This game allows you to use your farts to light a stove, which is a fun easter egg with a practical application. Just don't try this at home. Please, in re don't do it in real life, it's a bad idea. One of the villains you encounter in the game is Mitch Connor, who challenges you to decipher his riddles, and he looks an awful lot like Cartman's left hand. The kid's ultimate attacks used in battle are clearly a shout out to Final Fantasy summons, as they allow a player to use visually insane powers to rain destruction on their enemies. Cartman, aka the Coon's attack, however, isn't about fire or lightning. Instead, we see him on magazine covers and being interviewed like a star, reflecting his deluded dream of creating a superhero franchise and getting rich. The game doesn't just try to fill every moment with snark or satire, it makes time for character moments too. At the core of the game, Stan is trying to deal with his dad's alcoholism, Craig is working through issues with his ex-boyfriend, and Kyle is pushing away Away his annoying cousin when he should be connecting with his family. South Park isn't generally known as being a show that painstakingly adheres to canon the way other fictional universes do, as they prefer to focus on making the joke work. However, there were ways that more recent developments in the show impacted the Fractured Butthole story. Jolie Menzel had a physical map of South Park which she updated every week to match developments in the show. PC Principal, a key character from Season 19, plays a prominent role in the Fractured Butthole. There was speculation that he may have been killed off, but Stone and Parker kept getting more jokes out of him, so he was brought back for the game. The impact of gentrification on South Park reflected in the game too, with the continued presence of Soto Sopa, a shopping district that was built around Kenny's house. God, that kid really just can't catch a break. Want to express your inner beer snob while you play the game? Don't worry, you'll be able to drop into Crunchy's bar turned microbrewery in the game map. There's a selection of 12 buddies you can choose from in the Fractured Butthole to build your party for battle, which is double the number that was available to you in the Stick of Truth. Most of the superpowers that the kids have are things they've invented in their imagination for the game they're playing, but a few of the kids have genuine superpowers which are revealed within the game's narrative. There are times when what happens in South Park might be seen as unfair and you have the rug pulled out from under you during gameplay, but the developers think that that doesn't matter as long as it's funny. South Park returns to the world of video games with its second major title that's continuing to make us laugh, think, and feel a little weird about what we're laughing at. What's up everyone, I'm Jacob with the Leaderboard, and today we're going to dish out seven facts about South Park, the fractured butthole, so get ready to have yourself a time by hearing that title over and over again. We're all very mature here at the leaderboard, so no giggling allowed! South Park The Fractured Butthole is the sequel to 2014's highly successful South Park The Stick of Truth. The game picks up right where the last one left off, but a lot happened behind the scenes before our favorite dirty-mouthed fourth graders could continue on whatever wacky, weird, and mildly disturbing journey they choose to go on next. Prior to South Park The Stick of Truth's release, Matt Stone and Trey Parker both stated that they would be interested in developing a sequel to The Stick of Truth depending on the game's success, and boy did that game succeed seed selling well over 5 million copies, so naturally it was decided that a sequel would be made. But it wasn't an easy road from being announced to actually hitting the shelves as the game was delayed several times before its release. The Fractured Butthole was 
originally announced for a December 2016 release before that date was pushed back. After this first delay, Ubisoft announced that the game would hit the market in the first quarter of 2017, but when that time came, Ubisoft announced that the game would instead hit the market sometime before March 2018, and luckily this time they hit their target with their incredibly imprecise aim. It certainly took more than six days for this game to air. Oh, what's that? Is that a reference to the eye-opening 2011 documentary Six Days to Air about the production of South Park? Although the original game was developed by Obsidian Entertainment, the sequel was instead developed by Ubisoft. This was because of the appeal of working within a larger studio and the fact that they animate using Autodesk Maya, allowing for the game to have a smoother pipeline. But luckily, there seems to be no hard feelings about the switch from Obsidian, with CEO Fergus Urquhart saying, We are super excited to see another South Park game getting made, and we can't wait to play it ourselves. They seem to be taking it well, and we're glad, because we can't wait to play it either. So the last game was inspired by Tolkien-esque fantasy, so when thinking of what to do for the sequel, Matt Stone and Trey Parker were like, Ah, been there, done that. What's next? What's big? Superheroes. Matt Stone explained this choice, saying, Superheroes and video games, there's just a lot to take the piss on. Which is more than enough of a reason to go after it from our perspective, as well as theirs. Even though Matt Stone and Trey Parker are notoriously known as two of the biggest jokesters in the entertainment industry, that doesn't mean that they don't work their butts off. In preparation for the fractured butthole, the duo watched hours of Let's Plays of Stick of Truth so they could gauge from the point of view of the players what was and wasn't working. And by figuring out and correcting the flaws in the original game, Stone claims that the fractured butthole is much, much better. As stated previously, the game takes place right after the events of Stick of Truth, but now Stan, Kyle, Cartman, Kenny, and all of their pals are sick of playing fantasy and decide that they're going to play superheroes instead. Egos get hurt when the boys are planning their billion dollar superhero cinematic universe and the kids split up into two opposing factions in a Civil War-esque scenario. Y you see, the sides are fractured, but whole. You play as the same new kid in town character from the Stick of Truth, but now due to the switch of playing superheroes, nobody cares about your prior accomplishments from the last game and you have to work hard to regain everyone's respect yet again. One of the biggest complaints about the Stick of Truth was the fact that the turn-based RPG combat system got repetitive and boring as the game went on. Parker Stone and the development team all brainstormed together on how they could make the fights within the game more interesting and involved. Stone and Parker are both big board game enthusiasts, so they, along with the rest of the team, experimented with different combat ideas on tabletop before transferring it into the game. The team felt it was necessary to maintain the turn-based combat system because it lends itself to comedic timing, something that's very important to keep in mind for a South Park video game. To help with this, the team took a look at how other games with turn-based systems experimented within these limitations and ended up using a more tactical and grid-based system, similar to what you would find in XCOM, or slightly more topically, Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle. So the two key elements that the team added for combat in this game is the player's ability to affect space and time. The player controls the space by choosing where to place the characters within the fighting area for strategic advantage, such as allowing the character to push enemies into dangerous obstacles, or even into other characters who supply an extra dose of butt fracturing. Now, how does the player control time? Well, as introduced in the previous game, the player's character has an incredible gift, insanely powerful farts. In fact, in this game, the character's farts are so powerful that sometimes you can bend time itself, shuffling the order of the turn-based combat. Another piece of feedback the team received was a desire for a deeper character creation system. Many aspects of the character creator from the last game are relatively unchanged. In the last game, you were able to pick your character class from the choices of fighter, thief, mage, or Jew. Classic South Park. Similarly though, with a few more choices, you choose what powers your superhero will have, with the options of brutalist, blaster, speedster, elementalist, gadgeteer, Mystic, Cyborg, Psychic, Assassin, Commander, Netherborn, and Karate Kid. One major difference in the Fractured Butthole is how it deals with gender. In the Stick of Truth, the player is only given the option of playing as a male character, but in the Fractured Butthole, you're allowed to create a female character that is still implied to be the same character who participated in the Stick of Truth. How is this done? Well, near the beginning of the game, your character visits Mr. Mackey, South Park Elementary's guidance counselor, to confirm the gender of your character. If you choose to create a female character, Mr. Mackey will awkwardly yet politely call your parents to explain that the school was under the misconception that your character was male and apologize. What's super cool is that you can also choose to have your character be gender neutral and lead to similar results. The game even acknowledges the difference between sex and gender, and after Mackie asks for your gender, he'll ask if you're cisgender or transgender. If you answer that you're transgender, Mackie will have another awkward yet polite conversation with your parents on the phone about how he was unaware of your situation, but supportive. Another major aspect of character creation added to this game is some pretty major racial commentary. The design Designers combined the sliders for the race of your character and the difficulty of the game so that the darker
darker your character's skin tone is, the harder the difficulty of the game is. Though on this selection screen, Carbon clarifies, don't worry, this doesn't affect combat, just every other aspect of your whole life. What he's referring to specifically is that the difficulty you choose affects how people in the game treat you and how much money your character makes. Wow, things just got incredibly real. Uh, gonna be honest, I think it's safe to say that none of us expected some of the most interesting character creation choices of recent years to be found in a South Park video game. But then again, isn't that unexpectedness what makes South Park so memorable? When making a comedic video game, the designers have to think about how the mechanics of the game tie into the comedy. Similarly, the writers have to think about how to write comedy within the context of a game. Somehow, Ubisoft and South Park Digital Studios made it work by designing a whole bunch of really cool game concepts that are also really funny. In the Stick of Truth, you were able to play a minigame in some bathrooms that would allow you to create projectiles by pooping in the toilet. This same minigame is brought back and expanded for the fractured butthole. In this game, you're allowed to poop in any toilet in all of South Park and play that fun pooping minigame, which is expanded to include all sorts of expert pooping techniques. The game also includes a side plot where you have to rise in popularity as a social media superhero superstar. You do this by increasing your number of followers on your Coonstagram account, the social media network named after Cartman's alter ego, the Coon. You gain followers by taking selfies with characters throughout the world, but people will only take a picture with you if you have a mutual friend with them. One of the highlights of this is that you can eventually take a picture with Morgan Freeman while he works at a Mexican fast food restaurant. Being that this is a video game based on a TV show, there are plenty of South Park Easter eggs to be found throughout the game. For example, a very popular episode from season 19 of South Park called Tweak and Craig is about the entirety of South Park becoming so infatuated with the idea of Tweak and Craig being in a homosexual relationship with one another. In reference to this, there is of course yaoi fan art of Tweak and Craig hidden throughout the game. Another little tidbit is that all of the child superheroes in the fractured butthole have previously appeared on the show. However, during most of the arc in which they assume these identities, the identity of Mysterion is a mystery. Hence the name Mysterion. Get it? It's very, it's a very subtle name. At the end of this arc, Mysterion is revealed to be Kenny, and in the announcement trailer for the game, Cartman just refers to Mysterion as Kenny, so I guess he's not so mysterious anymore. Another cool behind-the-scenes scoop is that the animators of the Fractured Butthole, as well as the Stick of Truth, were given the full library of South Park assets to work with. This means that the characters in the game are fully accurate to the design of the show, and this allows the developers to draw from a wider variety of characters, so pretty much any character that's ever appeared on the show could hypothetically appear in the game. And that is sweet. South Park just wouldn't be South Park if there weren't some controversies to go along with it. I mean, the show has its own Wikipedia page solely dedicated to its controversies. In the weeks leading up to the release of the game, the race difficulty slider started to get a lot of media attention. There were a lot of vocal opinions from all sides, some claiming it to be insensitive, while others believe it to be ingenious. Either way, it certainly was a bold choice. Matt Stone and Trey Parker are no strangers to poking fun at religion, either, considering that they wrote the Tony Award-winning musical The Book of Mormon and are personal enemies of the Church of Scientology. One of the earliest plots in the game is that Carmen sends you to the local Catholic church to figure out your deepest fear, and while you're there, you run into a few priests with, uh, less than holy intentions, if you catch my drift. I'm sure the Catholic Church is thrilled to have the spotlight on them again. This video is killing it with these movie title references. The biggest question we probably all have about the game, though, is what was the inspiration behind this awkward and hilarious name, The Fractured Butthole? Interestingly enough, this name was created as a form of rebellion. The game's original name was South Park and the Butthole of Time, but the publisher said that the retailers wouldn't sell a game that had the word butthole in the title. And we all know Matt Stone and Trey Parker are not the type to take no for an answer, so they just kept brainstorming until they could think of a way to sneak that oh-so-naughty word into their beloved game title. But of course they did. It's not like Parker and Stone haven't done this before. Looking at you, South Park, bigger, longer, and uncut. What game allows you to use fart attacks, make enemies poop their pants, and win a more popular than John Lennon trophy? Of course, it's South Park. South Park The Stick of Truth came out in 2014 and quickly went down as one of the best South Park games ever made, with character customization beyond our wildest dreams. Though the creators had to abide by a lot more censorship rules than the show, they still managed to make a hilarious and kick-ass game full of quests with our favorite characters. Even Mr. Hanky. Hi, I'm Jacob with the leaderboard, and we've got all the tidbits on this Imagination Land-driven game, so get your vibro blade ready, because we've got 107 facts about South Park The Stick of Truth. Let's get started. South Park The Stick of Truth is the sixth video game adaptation of the television series. It's the most highly rated game released because, as the saying goes, sixth time's the charm. Number two, South Park The Stick of Truth was developed by South Park creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone. The game, as well as the entire series, takes place in Colorado because it's the home state of Parker and Stone. 
Number 3. The first South Park game was released on the Nintendo 64 and was a first-person shooter simply titled South Park. Number 4. Matt Stone said he didn't care for the early versions of South Park in video game form. To be exact, he said, they stank. So we can assume he doesn't think the Stick of Truth stinks. Number 5. In the Stick of Truth, the player takes on the role of the new kid in town. You're able to choose your own name, but are referred to as douchebag in the game anyway, because that's usually what the new kid gets called everywhere. Are you sure you want to keep the name douchebag? Very well, douchebag. Number six. The game starts off in the imaginations of the town's kids with a battle that has been waged for over a thousand years between humans and elves. This is in the spirit of things like Lord of the Rings or Dungeons and Dragons. Number seven. South Park the Stick of Truth revolves around a stick that can control the universe. It's just a stick, though. The real magic comes from the children and the people who believe in it. Hey, kids might actually learn a valuable life lesson from this game after all. Number eight. This game has a classic RPG turn-based system. This system is most popularly known through the early Final Fantasy games. It's the type of fighting where, after an attack, you politely wait for your enemy to make a move. If only real-life fights work that way, too. Number 9. The Stick of Truth battle system allows for friends to help out in the fight. You can unlock six buddies to explore the town with, and they're able to fight alongside you one at a time. Number 10. During the character creation part of the game, the player is only able to choose a male character. But in the next game in the series, South Park The Fractured Butt Hole, the player will be able to choose between a male or female character. Number 11. One of the initial ideas for the Stick of Truth was for players to sneak past people's home security systems. This actually resulted in the development of the South Park episode In Security, which mocks security systems as big scams. Number 12. Ubisoft was the publisher of South Park The Stick of Truth. Yes, the same Ubisoft that has published such games in the past as Watch Dogs, Assassin's Creed, and Far Cry. Number 13. Ubisoft will also be publishing the next game in the series, South Park The Fractured Butt Hole, because of the success of The Stick of Truth, making this the second time Ubisoft will strike oil from the South Park well. Number 14. THQ was the previous publisher of South Park games before Ubisoft purchased them. Ubisoft spent $3.2 million to buy the rights during the THQ bankruptcy auction. Number 15. Before selling the South Park game franchise to Ubisoft, THQ had to legally make sure Trey Parker and Matt Stone were okay with who they sold it to. Sounds like common sense, but in the competitive world of business, you never know with some companies. Number 16. When asked about the game potentially going under with THQ before Ubisoft purchased it, Matt Stone and Trey Parker jokingly answered, Oh good, it's over. Safe to say, they were happy with the Switch. Number 17. The Stick of Truth won several IGN awards. It was IGN's choice for Best PS3 Game and Best Xbox 360 Game, as well as Funniest Game of the Year. Number 18. The lead designer for South Park The Stick of Truth was Matt McClain. McClain had previously worked on popular games such as Fallout New Vegas and Dungeon Siege 3. Number 19. There were two versions of South Park The Stick of Truth, the US version, which was made to be inappropriate, but the UK and Australia versions were clean. Well, as clean as South Park can get, that is. Number 20. South Park The Stick of Truth was released on PC, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360. It's also been updated to be backwards compatible on current gen consoles as well. Number 21. The game has a variety of villains like crab people, underpants gnomes, hippies, and aliens, giving an endless amount of odd things to fight not only in the game, but in your nightmares too. Number 22. South Park The Stick of Truth won 12 E3 awards. E3 is the Electronic Entertainment Expo, also known as Christmas for Tech Nerds. Number 23. At a Comic-Con panel in 2013, Trey Parker joked about the delay of the game being due to overambition. Parker said that South Park The Stick of Truth would have come out in the holiday season of 2032 if they had gone with their original script. Number 24. The game's original script was over 850 pages long. Developers insisted that it was too much content for one game to make, and DLC should be considered. Let's just say that Trey Parker shot that prospect down with a classic four-letter retaliation. Even when just mentioning that story of the DLC at the panel, the audience groaned. And Trey and Matt like to go with what the fans want. Number 25. Eventually, a bunch of content was cut from the game. This included a battle with vampire kids, a quest to save Cartman's doll from the gingers, a whole Christmas town, and a huge underground world where gnomes and crab people lived. Number 26. Mr. Hankey's home from the Christmas Town was kept in as a side quest, but it was pretty close to getting chopped as well. No, not Mr. Hankey! Thankfully, sensible minds kept the talking piece of poo in the game. 
number 27. The game gives the player the option to create a new kid and customize clothes, hair, and even scars. So if you ever wanted to know what a South Park version of yourself with a slash across the face would look like, this is the game for you. Number 28. In traditional RPG fashion, the Stick of Truth gives the player the opportunity to choose their class. But it is South Park, so you know there's going to be a tad bit of non-tradition. The player can choose between Fighter, Mage, Thief, and Jew. Yep. Number 29. The game allows for party building with several different characters. The characters are derived from the show's four main characters and two fan favorites. Wizard, Carmen, Princess Kenny, Kenny, Warrior, Stan, Jew Elf, Kyle, Paladin, Butters, and Bard, Jimmy. It makes me wonder what it would be like to have a companion like Tweak. Number 30. The customization of the player's character is almost endless. The player can create a truly unique character or make one based off of a famous person, especially David Hasselhoff. Number 31. The Stick of Truth is a single player game. It's fun for everybody, but if you have a younger brother, there's actually an added feature of not letting him play, but saying you'll let him after just five more minutes. Number 32. The Stick of Truth sold more than 1.6 million copies. Before Ubisoft released an actual number, they said the game had better than expected sales. Don't underestimate the power of Princess Kenny. Number 33. A month after its release, Amazon copies of The Stick of Truth were selling for $20 less. Everywhere else was selling it for $60, and Amazon was selling it for $40, forcing Best Buy to do some price matching. Number 34. Obsidian Entertainment developed The Stick of Truth. They also previously developed Fallout New Vegas. Both of the games won multiple awards, but South Park was the only game with Man Bear Pig. Then again, New Vegas had Death Claws. Y you know what? Equally terrifying monsters. I'm super serial. Number 35. Obsidian Entertainment also developed the game Pillars of Eternity, which raised over $4.1 million in funding as a Kickstarter project. That's pretty good for a Kickstarter campaign. The fact that it isn't for a friend of a friend that wants to start a vintage ham radio store is an added bonus. Number 36. When initially approached with the game's concept over the phone in 2009, Obsidian Entertainment thought Parker and Stone were making a prank call. Turns out they were just huge fans of Obsidian's work and wanted them to be heavily involved in the game's creation. Number 37. The Stick of Truth's team maxed out at around 50 people. Taking a step back, you gotta admit, that's pretty friggin' small, especially with all the overambitiousness. Number 38. Not surprisingly, the Stick of Truth went through some censorship. Its co-creator, Matt Stone, felt that what was being censored was mild enough for TV, but apparently games have different rules. It originally featured scenes involving anal probing and abortion. These things were censored in the European and Australian versions of the game. Number 39. Matt Stone felt they were able to come to a compromise in the censored versions of the game. The compromise was that they would censor the visual with an image of a face-palming statue or crying koala bear, along with a text box describing what was being censored. Number 40. Matt Stone believes that the video game was censored because, quote, there's an interactiveness that makes it different. Instead of watching something, the audience is taking part in it. Like watching someone bet their house versus being the person betting their house. It's pretty different. Number 41. South Park The Stick of Truth was released on March 4th, 2014. It was however delayed in certain countries like Austria and Germany due to the game's use of an unconstitutional symbol, which referred to the game's use of a swastika. It was eventually censored and released worldwide. Number 42. Ubisoft had actually thought they removed all Nazi symbols from the German and Austrian versions of the game. Whoops. The Nazi symbol is not only looked down upon in Germany, but it's actually against the law to display it. Number 43. When Trey Parker found out that Germany wanted to censor the swastikas, his first thought was to just not release it in that country. He changed his mind when he thought of the Ubisoft employees and how it might affect them. Aw, thanks, Trey. Number 44. If the player picks the Jew class, it's pretty much like all the other classes in the game, except that there are certain special abilities that involve dreidels and have names like Jiu-Jitsu. Oh, and also Carmen says you two might not be able to be friends, but who really is friends with Carmen anyway? He's lying to you! Number 45. South Park The Stick of Truth allows the player to go to the movies and listen to trailers for fake films. A recurring joke is a series of fake Rob Schneider movies. Some of them include Rob Schneider is a carrot, Rob Schneider is Kenny, and Rob Schneider is da derp da derp da deedly derpy derpy dumb, rated PG-13. Which all sound more interesting than an actual Rob Schneider movie anyway. Number 46. The Stick of Truth did very well among critics. Its lowest score on a scale of 1 to 10 was 7, and Joystick, who instead reviewed it on a 1 to 5 scale, gave it a 3.5.
Number 47. The player goes on many quests throughout the game. One of these quests is to help Tweak's coffee shop by going to Kenny's house to get the special ingredient. This magical ingredient needed is crack. To make it more authentic, they even added crackheads to guard it, just like Smeagol in Lord of the Rings. Number 48. This game also has the traditional element of summon characters. These are special characters that can do a massive amount of damage when called upon. Think of your favorite Final Fantasy summon character, and it's exactly like that, but homeless and on PCP. Number 49. The Stick of Truth has four different summons. The main difference between these summons and other RPG summons is that they can only be used once during a fight, and they can't be used during boss fights. Oh, and also they're way more offensive and funnier than all other summons in every other RPG combined. Number 50. The four summons in the Stick of Truth are Mr. Hanky, Mr. Slave, Twang Lu Kim, the City Walk Guy, and Jesus. Each summon must be unlocked through completing several tasks. Number 51. The summons all have their own abilities. Mr. Hanky attacks with a tidal wave of poop, Jesus uses heavy firearms, Twang Lu Kim fights in samurai armor while using a sword, and Mr. Slave inhales enemies through his butthole. And somehow all those fates sound scarier than any horror game I can think of at the moment. Number 52. Trey Parker and Matt Stone didn't only completely write the script of the game, but they also voiced their respective characters, making it a rare occasion of a video game being written and voiced by the same people. What was the last game to do that? Like, Pong? Number 53. The first character met in the game is Butters. After walking outside the house, the player will see Butters being attacked. The player then punches the attacker in the face, making Butters and the player best friends forever. Number 54. The tutorial starts off with the player having to choose a weapon from Clyde before the player is forced to fight Clyde, but Cartman is the one who actually teaches the player how to fight. And this is probably the nicest thing Cartman has ever done in South Park history. Number 55. In the Stick of Truth, the player is able to loot enemies that they defeat. Though this is a common function in RPG games, the loot highly differs in this one. It includes things like coffee, band-aids, and soda pop. Number 56. The name of the fortress in the game is Koopa Keep. It's located in Cartman's backyard, who is also the player's neighbor. Number 57. The Stick of Truth brings together the entire South Park universe. One of the first missions is to find the great warriors Token, Craig, and Tweak. These are just three of the iconic South Park characters out of the dozens that are met and put to use. Number 58. Pre-ordering South Park The Stick of Truth gave players access to exclusive costumes that feature special abilities. It was called the Ultimate Fellowship Pack, and the costumes included were Necromancer Sorcerer, Rogue Assassin, Ranger Elf, and Holy Defender. Number 59. A premium bundle was available and marketed as the Grand Wizard Edition. It was sold at a price of $80 and included the full game, a 6-inch Grand Wizard Cartman figure by Kid Robot, a Kingdom of South Park map, and the Ultimate Fellowship pack that was included in the pre-orders. Number 60. The Chin Pokemon were collectibles in the Stick of Truth. In the game, the player had to find 30 different types of Chin Pokemon. The fake franchise and creatures were created to parody Pokemon and were introduced in Episode 11 of Season 3, wherein the Japanese government used the Chin Pokemon to subliminally brainwash the kids into re-attacking Pearl Harbor. Number 61. There are six Chin Pokemon that can only be captured once in the Stick of Truth. Those six are Roid Rat, Beetlebot, Gunrilla, Fetuswami, Turdakin, and Shu. This added to the authenticity of the game because everyone knew that one kid in town who used his shoe as a toy. Poor guy. Number 62. Collecting all 30 Chin Pokemon comes with a special prize. The player is rewarded with a friend request from the Chin Pokemon Corporation, which is in turn needed for the more popular than John Lennon trophy. Number 63. As you make your way to collecting all 30, you will also unlock Poco Chin Poco and Chin Poco Loco. Does anybody else want El Pollo Loco right now? Number 64. South Park The Stick of Truth added a social network feature. The player can add South Park friends that are met while playing quests and side quests. There are 121 friends to add in total. A fourth grader having 121 friends is pretty impressive. Most fourth graders only have one, and mine was imaginary. Number 65. There are eight friends that you only get one chance to add on the social network. These characters are Clyde, Bill, Fossey, Lemmy Winks, Sergeant Yates, Bishop of Banff, Ike, Big Gay Al, and the Chin Pokemon Corporation. Missing any of these friends will prevent the player from getting the more popular than John Lennon trophy. And let's be honest, we all really want that trophy. Number 66. Though some of the quests in the game can be a bit crude, there are also some touching moments as well. Like in the quest Beat Up Clyde when Ike gets hit and starts crying. The player must then light the firework nearby to cheer him up. Ike will then add you as his friend. Even in South Park, nobody wants to see a little Canadian boy cry. 
Number 67. Some of the friends to add are famous people and politicians that have been mimicked in the show. One of those people is former Vice President Al Gore. To add him as a friend, the player must activate the side quest, Man Bear Pig. Number 68. There are 153 weapons and costume parts in the Stick of Truth. Some of them may make the player's character stronger, while others are just added jokes. Number 69. Most of the weapons and costume parts can be collected while walking in free roam or by purchasing them, but there are several items that can be easily missed or that are only obtained in certain missions, like the Underpants Helmet, which is only available after defeating the three gnomes that the player fights after watching the new kid's parents have sex. Yes, you heard that right. The player has to watch the character's fictional parents do the deed. Please do not try this at home, kids, please. Number 70. The 153 weapons and costume parts are located pretty much everywhere throughout the game, even in some of the characters. Ugh. To get the crown of anal pleasure, the player must go inside Mr. Slave to get it. Everybody loves a good field trip. Ugh. Number 71. In order to find the basketball item during the Attack the School quest, the player must loot the elf lying against the right side wall in the cafeteria. This not only gives the player a new item, but also the satisfaction of robbing a mythical woodland creature. Number 72. As mentioned, the Stick of Truth provides side quests other than the main mission. The Nazi zombie bounty side quest is easily missable. When the Nazi zombies are still in town, the player must speak to the sergeant in the police station. Completing the main story causes the zombies to disappear, along with the chance of completing this side quest. Number 73. The player doesn't just stay in South Park, you must also travel to other countries. Well, just one other country, really. Canada. In order to get there, the player must travel north four times through the Lost Forest. Of course, putting Canada in the game gave the creators someone else to blame. Again. Number 74. In the game, Canada is referred to as the Mysterious Kingdom to the North. When the player travels to Canada, the game itself turns into an 8-bit throwback. Number 75. There are six quests that you are able to complete in Canada. Forging alliances, recruit the girls, pose as Bebe's boyfriend, unplanned parenthood, heading north, and O oh Canada. Number 76. While exploring Canada, there are several different characters that the player can meet, including the two most popular Canadian stars, Terence and Philip. Terence and Philip are famous in the South Park world for their fart jokes that are always accompanied with actual farts. <laughs> Number 77. The Woodland Christmas Critters from Season 8, Episode 14 can be found in the Lost Forest. To find them, the player must travel in these directions while in the forest. Right, up, right, down, right. Then, once there, the player will be asked some questions, and when prompted, if they select Accept the True Lord, they will then receive 12 friend requests. Thanks, Critters. Number 78. Beware. The Lost Forest can be a bit confusing and can actually get the player lost. If you do lose your way, just stop moving for a few minutes, and then you can walk in any direction. This makes the new kid's parents show up to ground them for getting lost. Number 79. During the Beat Up Clyde mission, if the player walks out of the room with Mr. Slave instead of trying to deactivate the snook, there's actually an alternate ending. But who can pass up the opportunity to deactivate a thermonuclear device shoved inside Mr. Slave? Number 80. Things being shoved into Mr. Slave isn't a new idea. Mr. Slave swallowed Paris Hilton in Season 8, Episode 12 in the Stupid Spoiled Whore Video Playset episode. This episode is where Mr. Slave got his summon power for the Stick of Truth. Number 81. There's an outstanding number of achievements and trophies for the game, and some of them break the fourth wall. The trophy, Too Far, is awarded when the player farts on the corpse of an aborted Nazi zombie fetus. It's pretty appropriately named. Number 82. As with items, there are 11 achievements that can be easily missed. These achievements only come around one time, like the perverted achievement, which the player is only able to obtain while walking with the gnomes during the scene of the new kid's parents having sex. The player must come out of the wall onto the dresser in the underpants gnome segment during the deed, and also watch them for an extended period of time like a pervert. Number 83. To finish the game with a 100% completion on achievements and trophies, you must play as the Jew class for the Are We Cool achievement. This achievement appears during the Father Maxi quest, where the player, as the Jew class, must find Jesus. Number 84. Another thing you must do to reach 100% completion of the achievements is to follow special instructions. Some of them are to not sell anything until the main mission of the game is finally over, and to not let any friends die until the main mission is over. After that, you can sell 
sell your things to get both the Junk Peddler and the For the Hoarder awards. Additionally, you can kill Kenny 10 times to receive the You Bastards achievement. Number 85. The new kid doesn't actually have very many words to say. The game keeps the character silent throughout the entire game with the exception of the very end, which you're just gonna have to beat the game to find out what happens. No spoilers here. The reason for this is that Trey Parker claimed he likes silent RPG heroes the best. Which ones? Well, number 86. The silence of the new kid protagonist was inspired by Link from the Zelda series. Because, you know, Trey and Matt are big Zelda nerds. Number 87. Though Ubisoft has a game network called Uplay, the Stick of Truth is not on it. Instead, it's available on Steam, a popular game client and network amongst players. Number 88. One of the mini-games in South Park The Stick of Truth is giving Randy an abortion while agents watch. If the player lets one of Randy's balls get caught, the agents shoot you. Pretty far flung from most other games. Jumping on Koopas, this is not. Number 89. The Stick of Truth forced creators Matt Stone and Trey Parker to make a detailed map of South Park, which they had never done in the show's history. Maps are always overlooked until you need one. Helps to have a map. Number 90. The map of Stick of Truth is meant to be interactive. It's very similar to the GTA 5 map. The only real difference is if you play GTA 5 with your grandma, you don't have to explain what a Nazi chef zombie is doing to fourth graders. Instead, you might have other things to explain to her. Number 91. Matt Stone and Trey Parker decided to make an amazing quality game because they felt anything else wouldn't be fair to their fans. Stone said, quote, People are spending $60 for a game. For most people, it's a big purchase that you might forego something else to afford. And even apart from money, it's also a time investment. Number 92. One of the things that Stone learned about making a video game is that the jokes have to be delivered differently. He said the natural rhythms of comedy that we know pretty well from the TV comedy universe, they're different from a game. Just like the rules of censorship, right Matt? Number 93. South Park The Stick of Truth was released with an M rating from the ESRB. The ESRB uses a six-tier rating system from EC for early childhood to AO for adults only. Number 94. Trey Parker and Matt Stone are self-proclaimed lifelong gamers. When when asked if he was going to get a new console, Matt Stone said, I'm a huge FIFA fan, so I had to get one to play FIFA. Number 95. There's a special fart attack that the player can use. Yup. The fart attack is called Dragon Shout, which simulates all the fun that farting can be, and if you hold down the fart button, the new kid will fart forever. Number 96. There's a lot of practicality in the game design to make certain things like magic and bombs possible in a realistic way. For example, ice spells are displayed through the use of fire extinguishers, fireworks are used for explosions, and cupped farts are used for bombs. Every fourth grader's dream. Number 97. Other characters in the party use special powers in combat. One of Jimmy's specials is is called the Brown Note. Jimmy blows on a horn, causing enemies to poop their pants. Number 98. One of the most powerful weapons in the game is the Vibroblade. This is a dildo sword that becomes attainable late in the game, and you can find it inside Mr. Slave. Oh. Number 99. On the first night, the new kid is abducted and then probed by aliens. This is a reference to the very first episode of South Park where Cartman was anally probed. Number 100. There's a lot of graphic content in the Stick of Truth, but one of the most graphic scenes is the old man penis at the very end. An old man penis should only be seen in a gym locker room at a glance at the very most, but... It's in this game. Number 101. One of the major complaints that people had about the Stick of Truth was that the actual RPG part of the game wasn't as good as it could have been. Many game reviewers are hoping that South Park, the fractured butt hole, focuses more on this. Number 102. There is a secret enemy you can fight in the game, the Bank Teller. To fight him, the player must use the gnome dust to shrink down in size and go through a hole behind the left side of his desk. He's pretty easy to defeat since he has nothing to protect him and no special moves. Once defeated, you can then loot all of the bank teller's investments. Number 103. Trey Parker said that when creating South Park The Stick of Truth, he wanted to make the next step in RPG evolution. Parker said the only reason he didn't was because, quote, eventually I realized what I wanted it to be would have taken about 20 years and 80 billion dollars to make. But hey, it's still a great game without costing 80 billion dollars, so... There's that. Number 104. Parker said that they wanted to include South Park The Stick of Truth into the show's season. The only reason it didn't happen was, as Trey Parker put it, quote, That sounds like a bitch. He also described it as a six-month Tuesday, which is a reference to their documentary, Six Days to Air, The Making of South Park. 
number 105. If the player stands idle for a little bit, the other characters, including those in the player's party, begin to shout obscenities at them. It makes the player feel like they really are in South Park. Number 106. Some of the healing items in the game include different kinds of sodas or speed augmenting boosters like Tweak's Coffee. Is there anyone that coffee doesn't help? And number 107. There are about a solid 14 hours of actual gameplay in South Park The Stick of Truth, which is actually a little light on hours for a role-playing game. But just as PC culture engulfed the town of South Park in just a single season, a lot changed in the three years between the original South Park, The Stick of Truth, and its sequel. I'm your host, Jet Set, with the leaderboard, and this is South Park, The Stick of Truth, versus The Fractured But Whole. Before we get into the individual developers behind both titles, we're going to quickly call out one creative consistency that contributed to the success of these games. Typically, when a developer adapts a popular property like, say, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, more often than not the creative force behind the series, in this case Steven Spielberg, is not involved in the game's development. This lack of creative input often makes franchise games feel more or less like half-assed cash grabs. Fortunately for South Park fans, series creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone are gamers at heart and wanted to see a South Park game that could be more than South Park 64. To avoid a similar train wreck, they became more involved in the development process than most creators, not only contributing to the game's writing, but providing their own input on gameplay and design. They were pretty much creating a game that they would want to buy. The first developer they collaborated with on the Stick of Truth was a studio that gave RPG fanatics a warm, tingly feeling, and for good reason. Obsidian Entertainment has worked on some of the finest RPGs released in modern gaming, from Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2 to Fallout New Vegas. In fact, that's precisely why Stone and Parker themselves decided on the studio. Obsidian's time spent developing pre-existing properties as opposed to their own had granted them chameleon-like capabilities, allowing the studio to create a Fallout game with Bethesda-like charm. With South Park, the team outdid themselves, creating not just a game, but something akin to a fully interactive season of the South Park TV show, successfully replicating everything from the show's art style, animation, to its affinity for fart jokes. But for all their talent, Obsidian still had to overcome several hardships beyond their control. The biggest one being the loss of their publisher, THQ, who filed for bankruptcy during the Stick of Truth's development. Without a publisher to fund the game, Stick of Truth was pretty much a pipe dream for YouTubers to speculate about and romanticize. Fortunately, Ubisoft obtained the Stick of Truth through an auction of THQ's assets. This acquisition not only saved the Stick of Truth, but it also set the stage for the next developer to take on the Fractured But Whole. Instead of reaching out for help from a third-party developer like Obsidian, Ubisoft decided it best to assign the sequel to one of their own studios, Ubisoft San Francisco. Unlike Obsidian Entertainment, Ubisoft San Francisco did not have a rich and organic history filled with highly successful titles recognized by the gaming majority. Established in 2009, Ubisoft San Fran had but two games to their name, Rocksmith and Rocksmith 2014. These games were pretty much Ubisoft's answer to Guitar Hero, the main difference being that if you were good at Rocksmith, it meant that you were probably actually good at playing a real guitar. So unlike Obsidian, RPGs were uncharted territory. To make things a tad more difficult, Ubisoft San Fran had a little less than three years to develop the sequel, while Obsidian had been working on their 2014 release since 2009. So how did the new kids fare against all the odds? It's no secret that South Park is a favorite show to many, tackling every corner of pop culture since its debut in 1997, from Pokemon to Game of Thrones. Like a full episode, these South Park RPGs take on a television show's distinct pop cultural theme. A quick glance at the Stick of Truth's box art tells you right off the bat that it's a love letter and crude middle finger to the genre most associated with RPGs, fantasy. It's a specific type of game Matt and Trey have both embraced since childhood. In fact, the Wizard King costume Cartman wears throughout the game reflects a nearly identical Gandalf-like outfit he wore in the Season 6 episode, The Return of the Fellowship of the Ring to the Two Towers. This episode was mostly a parody of J.R.R. Tolkien's go-to fantasy story, The Lord of the Rings Saga. In fact, the Stick of Truth story is more than just similar to Tolkien's tale. It plays upon the One Ring trope, an artifact whose power can be harnessed to rule the Earth. Trey Parker even initially pitched the game to Obsidian as South Park meets Skyrim. The decision to make the game's customizable protagonist, the new kid, the strong silent type, is also in direct reference to the granddaddy of all fantasy video games, The Legend of Zelda, in which the series protagonist, Link, is known to never speak. Unless, of course, CDI Phillips is canon. Golly! 
The character classes players can choose from are also no different than those found in Dungeons & Dragons. There's the mage, who deals in the magical attacks, but in the context of South Park, it's essentially toy lightsabers, fire extinguishers, and blowtorches. There's also the fighter class, which is South Park's equivalent of the fantasy genre warrior class, which traditionally dabbles in combat with swords not made from cardboard. More commonly referred to as the rogue in Dungeons & Dragons, the thief class specializes in stealth and dexterity, while the Jew class was never a class in any fantasy RPG ever. It's not an entirely original South Park creation, you know, aside from the fact that it's a jab at an entire people. The Jew is a hybrid of the traditional fantasy classes known as the Monk and Paladin, and is known for being more of a high-risk, high-reward type. If you prefer a hero whose armor does more than shine, the fractured but whole may be more of an investment. It's a bit more on the nose than its fantasy counterpart. Instead, it serves more as a commentary on the current Hollywood landscape, more specifically its unhealthy obsession with the superhero cinematic universes. The story revolves around the South Park kids' superhero personas from the show, aka Coon and Friends, trying to launch a cinematic world with all of their personas in the same playing field. The unfortunate reality is that not everyone can be the Iron Man of a franchise. Due to the overwhelming amount of heroes and Cartman's ego, there are those that are doomed to the fate of Daredevil and Jessica Jones, confined to the obscurity of a Netflix series. This conflict causes a civil war of Captain America-sized proportions and results in an additional group of kids known as the Freedom Pals. They set out to create their own superior cinematic universe, not unlike the current cinematic arms race between Marvel Studios and DC Films. Hollywood politics aside, the game is still very much a tribute and mockery to comic books as a whole, with every detail, down to the tragic backstory that inspires the protagonist to be the hero that they are. The character classes are based on superhero archetypes. For example, if characters like The Flash and Quicksilver are more your speed, you probably press the A button the moment you saw the Speedster class. If you're down to smash like Hulk or The Thing, go all out with Brutalist. If you like getting inside your enemy's head or just want an excuse to impersonate Sir Patrick Stewart, look no further than the Professor X class, Psychic. There are plenty more classes that cater to various playstyles and your favorite real-world heroes, even if that real-world hero is Halle Berry's Razzie Award-winning Catwoman. Now, fans may argue that the humor in the fractured but whole will quickly become dated due to its timely subject matter, where a stick of truth theme is timeless. The fantasy genre has remained a prominent force since the late 1800s. Only time will tell which game will become a classic. While it's true that Stick of Truth and Fractured But Whole are both RPGs, they are two different breeds that offer two very different experiences. Stick of Truth takes on the more traditional RPG gameplay most players think of for the genre, and that's turn-based RPG. You know, the one where the good guys and bad guys hate each other with a burning passion, yet have the politeness to allow their opponent the chance to strike them so long as they've waited their turn fair and square. While we've stated earlier that Skyrim was a significant influence on the game's design, some games served as a more prominent influence for more obvious reasons. For instance, the Paper Mario series, which is not only a turn-based RPG, but one that successfully blends 2D graphics with 3D and Z-axis. Another significant influence came from one of Nintendo's more obscure titles, Earthbound. Earthbound was obviously influential through its turn-based combat, but according to Parker, the overall aesthetic of the game was a big inspiration for the game's aesthetics. After all, the game follows Ness, a 13-year-old boy, who not only fights his foes with psychic abilities but with everyday objects like baseball bats and yo-yos. This element has been replicated in the fighting styles of the children of South Park, albeit more realistic. Or fake? I mean, they use blowtorches instead of magical fire, and ketchup packets instead of real blood. Fractured But Whole aimed for a different approach with its core design philosophy. It's still the turn-based combat we all know and love, but with some extra dimensions. The battlefield contains a grid that players can move freely through to better position themselves for a strategic advantage. But for warning you, no one is special. Enemies can position themselves just as players can. On a more exciting note, surprises are littered throughout the grid battlegrounds. And by surprises, we mean environmental mental hazards that can mess you up if you're not careful. But hey, they can also screw over your foes as well. Different attacks have different ranges and effects on the grid. Depending on where players place their character, they can dodge attacks or even perform moves that will knock enemies into one another or an ally. In other words, you can gain an edge in battle if you learn proper social political etiquette from new fan favorite character, PC Principal, who can teach you how to properly identify microaggressions from your foes during battle. Identifying microaggressions will grant the player a free in-battle attack. 
back. Neat. Since its debut in 1997, South Park has made a name for itself by pushing the envelope of what they can put on television. And with the release of Stick of Truth, it's now challenging video games in the same way. Much like Comedy Central's reluctance to allow Matt and Trey to feature certain specific religious figures on the show, the game lost some of its battles when it came to its controversial sense of humor, at least outside the United States. Oddly enough, Ubisoft censored up to seven scenes themselves as opposed to giving in to censors, citing the choice as a market decision. In other words, they wanted to make sure they could make as much money as possible by appeasing the sensitivities of other countries. Censored scenes include the alien anal probe sequence and the stage in which the player can perform an abortion. The German version of the game was unique in that it had all allusions to Nazi zombies and Hitler removed because Germany has banned Nazi symbols. Australia's classification board initially refused to rate the game due to its sexual violence, namely because because it's associated with children. If you follow Matt and Trey, you know they don't take censorship lightly, and they didn't quite let Ubisoft off the hook without publicly humiliating them for their censorship compliance. Thus, the duo demanded that they be allowed to insert slides featuring humorous images of crying statues and koala bears that apologize to foreign players and describe what they're missing out on, thus simultaneously mocking Ubisoft and its censors for being killjoys. The attempts at censorship were rendered moot by PC players, as modders created patches that did away with the slides and presented the game as it was meant to be played. Surprisingly, the Fractured But Whole features humor far more offensive and grotesque than its predecessor, yet Ubisoft released the game utterly uncensored in all territories, as was intended by Matt and Trey. However, this did not mean the game dodged backlash from critics. One particularly controversial feature was the Fractured But Whole's unique difficulty settings. Whereas most games have you select your difficulty from an options menu, the Fractured But Whole determines the difficulty level through the customization of the new kid's skin color. A character with lighter skin will get higher pay for completed tasks and more favorable and friendly behavior from NPCs. Making your character's skin darker makes for a more challenging experience, with dark skin characters earning less money and dealing with rude NPCs. The backlash wasn't nearly loud enough to pressure Ubisoft to change this part of the game, probably because South Park had been around for 20 years and people know that, while jokes come across as harsh, they open a dialogue about real-world issues. I mean, how many times has Kyle learned something today? South Park has never shied away from tackling any topic or referencing the biggest names in pop culture, so it makes sense that their games wouldn't either. What's up everyone, I'm Jacob with the Leader board and we're here to check out the easter eggs in South Park the Fractured Butthole. Bill Belichick. South Park the Fractured Butthole quickly calls out any cheaters within the game. There are a handful of instances where you're required to input codes that are found through NPCs or notes in the game. Of course, in the age of the internet, it's so easy to just look up a code and input directly without having to spend time finding it. This is very doable in the Fractured Butthole as well, except that Cartman will call out anyone who does it. Well, it's Cartman dressed as New England Patriots head coach Bill Belichick. He pops up out of nowhere and he basically yells at you as if you were Tom Brady and asks if you'd rather be a cheater or actually play the game. Aside from it being a direct reference to Belichick, there's also a double jab thrown here at the Patriots themselves. In 2007, the Patriots were the center of a controversy in which they were caught videotaping the New York Jets defensive coaches during a game, a fiasco that was eventually known as Spygate. Later, in 2015, the Patriots found themselves in the midst of another controversy with the now infamous Deflategate. They won a playoff game by a decisive 45-7 victory and it was later found out that the football's used for the Patriots on offense were slightly deflated, which made throwing the ball easier. All of that has now led to Cartman dressed as Bill Belichick yelling at you in a video game for cheating. The Thrift Shop At the Sloppy Seconds Thrift Shop in Fracture, there is a bounty of Easter eggs hidden within the store. Ash Ketchum must frequent the store since his jacket is hanging off one of the dressing room doors and his hat is displayed on one of the clothing racks. Fred Flintstone's orange romper jumpsuit tarp thing can also be found on one of the clothing racks. April O'Neil of the Ninja Turtles left her yellow jumpsuit suit at the shop. Looks like Charlie Brown even got tired of his famous yellow shirt and donated it to the thrift shop as well. Not only that, but Dipper from Gravity Falls has also left his hat at the shop. Velma and Daphne from the Scooby-Doo gang apparently got rid of their iconic outfits as well. Okay, so a lot of cartoon characters in general frequent this thrift shop apparently. Who knew that South Park was such a famous cartoon destination? One of the sadder pieces of clothing at the thrift shop is that of Prince's purple suit piece, frills and all. This section could honestly go on and on since there are so many pieces of clothing to spot out from pop culture and cartoons. Morgan Freeman. This one is a little more of an obvious reference, but it is possible to find Morgan Freeman within Fractured. Now, what might Mr. Freeman be doing in South Park, you may ask? Why, what any famous actor would be doing? Selling tacos. It's possible to visit Freeman's tacos at some point in the game where he'll tell you what the special is, which is always tacos. At first, it may not seem like much aside from just having Morgan Freeman in the game, but it is actually possible to fight him. If you strike him once or twice, he won't really do much besides saying it's not a good idea to do that, but with enough 
hits, a battle will start. Freeman is easily one of the hardest bosses in the Fractured Butthole, similar to how Al Gore was in the Stick of Truth. It's highly advised to fight Freeman after beating the game. Once Mr. Freeman is taken down, the achievement Farts Over Freckles is awarded to the player, as is the Golden Taco Relic. The Golden Taco can be used to give all powers a 10% boost when the Freckles makeup is equipped. Skipping the intro. As with most games, it's possible to skip cutscenes in Fractured. No matter how pivotal or important they may be, you do have full reign to skip all of them. Well, almost all of them. At the beginning of the game, there's an opening cinematic which has Cartman, aka the Coon, explaining the story and how the town has gone bad. If you hold down the skip button, Cartman will break character and start telling you that you don't want to skip this. Despite his annoyance, if the skip button is still held, he will eventually concede and let you skip the opening cutscene. The only thing is that he actually makes you skip the entire game and will take you directly to the end credits. It's safe to say that you shouldn't try to make Cartman mad, whether he's Cartman, the Coon, or Bill Belichick. Cartman's Rubik's Cube. Cartman's basement has a lot of items to interact with, including his official Coon merch store, the top bad guys board, the biometric artifact enhancer, and more. One of the most important artifacts in Cartman's basement, though, is a Rubik's Cube that is protected with glass. Cartman doesn't really care that much if you mess with the stuff in his basement for the most part, but he insists that you do not touch the Rubik's Cube. And remember when we said you shouldn't make Cartman mad? Well, it's important to heed his word this time around, because if you continue to knock it around, Carmen will warn you that the whole world will die. Sure enough, with a few good hits, Carmen will yell, No! and the game will cut immediately to a game over screen. The Stick of Truth. Of course, the Fractured Butthole had to reference its predecessor. A lot of fans loved what Stick of Truth did for the franchise in the video game world. It made South Park a legitimate name in the market, so it only makes sense that Fractured would throw in some nods to the Stick of Truth. One of the collectibles in Stick of Truth were Chin Pokemon. In Fractured, the newest collectibles are that of Yaoi drawings. So you might be asking, well, what happened to all the Chin Pokemon that you worked your butt off to collect? Well, they actually aren't gone entirely. In the new kid's garage, they can be seen in a box collecting dust. Not only that, but there's another box filled with a bunch of medieval weaponry, which was used in the Stick of Truth. The biggest trophy in the garage, however, is the mantle of Al Gore's Man Bear Pig helmet. While the new kid's heroics and conquests from the Stick of Truth were short-lived, they shall never be forgotten entirely. In fact, the fractured butthole starts where the Stick of Truth left off until all of the kids got tired of playing fantasy and decided to play heroes instead. This explains why the new kid has to start from scratch with all their new powers. Pokemon Go. The Chin Pokemon references don't stop with the abandoned toys. Call Girl's ultimate ability is connecting two of her phones together to use the Chin Pokemon Go app. This is, of course, a nod to the famous Pokemon Go game. The ultimate ability shows people from all over the world getting a notification, no doubt alerting them of a Chin Pokemon in the area. Soon enough, a swarm of people gather onto the battlefield that do a good amount of damage against opponents. This attack mocks the craze that was Pokemon Go, especially when people were trampling over one another just to collect those sweet digital Pokemon. Jared Fogle. It wouldn't be a South Park game without rubbing a few people the wrong way. So what better way to do that than with the former Subway King himself, Jared Fogle. Jared is a boss fight one third of the way through the game, and he's about as creepy and weird as you'd expect the South Park version of him to be. His appearance seems to be a direct reference to how he looked in the Jared Has AIDS episode of South Park. He even summons AIDS to help him within the fight, and the remixed Subway theme song that appeared in that episode is also used in this instance. Jared's attacks throughout the battle are, uh, well, they're pretty vulgar and creepy, which fits the South Park bill. If Subway sandwiches weren't ruined for you before, they definitely definitely will be after fighting him. After the battle, the game gives you the option to either spare Jared or fart in his face. Nothing really happens either way, but if you let the timer run out during the decision, the game will prompt a message just saying, seriously? Canada. Canada was one of the biggest highlights of the Stick of Truth. It featured an 8-bit overworld map that paid homage to older games like Mario and Zelda. It was easily the biggest surprise in Stick of Truth in terms of presentation and how it shifted the look of the game entirely. Canada does make an appearance in the Fractured Butthole, but alas, it isn't as satisfying this time around. If you make the trip up to the Canadian border, you'll be immediately stopped by an organic food vendor. The food vendor just so happens to be the old farmer who warns Butters about the dangerous roads in the South Park episode, Butters' very own episode. The farmer is actually based off Judd Crandall from the film Pet Cemetery. Just as Crandall does in Pet Cemetery, the old farmer warns everyone of the dangers in the world. When you approach the farmer, he'll move in any direction that blocks you from visiting Canada. He'll then tell you of all of the horrors that have happened in Canada since the Stick of Truth. It is possible to get past the old farmer by blocking him with a basket of berries. And once you get past him, you can walk up to the Canadian border, only to be greeted by a giant wall. There's one Canadian citizen sitting atop the wall who greets you and then tells you that you can't come in. Eventually, a second citizen will shout from behind the wall saying how cool it is in Canada. The citizen on top of the wall will then tell you to buzz off and they might do a DLC sometime down the road. Ubisoft has outlined the DLC that's included in the season pass and sadly, there's no reference of Canada in there. All of the DLC titles have specific locations, aside from Bring on the Crunch, which does promise 
more story content, so it's possible this might bring back Canada. Satan. Okay, so the actual character of Satan isn't in the fractured butthole, but there is a reference to someone who was very close to Satan at one point. In the break room at the police station, there's a box containing some cold cases. One of the photos sticking out is of a man who, upon closer inspection, is Chris, Satan's former lover. Chris fought for Satan's love against Saddam Hussein in the episode Do the Handicapped Go to Hell. He hasn't been seen since then, and this cold case only further speculates where he might be. Although, since he is dead, he's probably just hanging out in hell and hopefully has found a new man, Mr. and Mrs. Hanky. One of the biggest features in the fractured butthole is taking selfies with various citizens of South Park to gain a following on Coonstagram. And who better to take a selfie with than everyone's favorite piece of poop, Mr. Hanky. Once you have the sandblaster ability unlocked, go to the community center and go in the female restroom. And there, use the sandblaster ability to shoot out a giant, it, well, poop to free Mr. Hanky. He'll thank you for rescuing him and will happily take a selfie with you. Once the selfie is taken, he leaves you to tend to his children. It's also possible to meet everyone's slightly less favorite piece of poop, Mrs. Hanky. At Stan's house, use the sandblaster ability yet again outside the bathroom and the room will be engulfed in poop. Mrs. Hanky will appear by the toilet and be in shock since she was hanging out in a U-Bend. She'll also take a selfie with you to gain your popularity with the all-important poop demographic. We're nearing the end of this South Park mega marathon and with this much info, I'm sure you've learned lots. But have you ever stopped and thought about what you've learned from the show itself? The kids at South Park Elementary aren't the only ones learning. There are life lessons galore to learn in and around the Colorado Rockies. And get ready to learn because here are some South Park life lessons. Irreverent, controversial, and always hilarious, South Park's near two decades on the air have left a legacy of animated antics that fans continue to obsess over. From Mecca Streisand to singing Holiday Pooh and beyond, the series has given us a multitude of pop culture benchmarks and references that can continue to delight and appall viewers in equal measure. A no-holds-barred commentary on the ever-evolving zeitgeist, South Park has always been utilized by creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone to critique, criticize, and make fun of current events and the world at large. Often, the show skews into zany, wildly inappropriate territory, and that's the reason it's endured so long. Never one to shy away from bathroom humor or crude jokes, the residents of South Park have been served up every manner of indignity known to man, all so we can get a good laugh. Though, for a show that's not afraid to go there with the naughtiness, South Park is also a series with lessons to teach. Through every madcap adventure, the creators always install a kernel of truth about the human condition, and often serve reminders that the best way to not become a parody of yourself is to be a good person. Although it seems that South Park isn't the most likely place to turn for philosophical rumination, it has, time and again, proven to provide some wonderful gems for living a better life. So put on your snow caps, because today we're going to be taking a look at some important life lessons that can be learned from Cartman and the gang. Let's go! Everything in moderation, including moderation. If the creators of South Park have a strong opinion, then it's that strong opinions tend to do more harm than good. South Park lambasts group after group by creating the logical extreme of said group. I'm willing to bet that just about everyone, myself included, has been insulted by South Park, and all of its victims are taken down by a handful of grade schoolers. And not the best or brightest grade schoolers either. And if you don't like South Park because it's so mean, that's okay. After all, hating everything is extreme. Choosing to always live in the middle is extreme as well. Parker and Stone seem intent to showcase that extremism, no matter the actual angle, is not a healthy way to live one's life. Have your beliefs, celebrate the beliefs of others, challenge your beliefs, and strive to be better. Good friends help each other. Great friends commit crimes for each other. One of the core values of the show is the importance of friendship, and few moments provided us with more insight about what it means to be a friend than the episode where Stan wanted to give Kyle a kidney. Upon learning that Kyle would need a kidney transplant to live, Stan offers to give up one of his own, only to discover that he's not a match. Depressed over the looming and inevitable loss of his friend, Stan resolves to do anything in his power to help Kyle, no matter the cost. When he discovers that Cartman can provide the match needed, Stan hatches a plan that could only be conceived in South Park. Bloody beds, midnight home invasion, and falsified medical records lead to Stan helping Kyle get the organ he needs and their friendship is ensured to see another day. While we don't condone breaking the law or tricking anyone into giving up one of their vital organs, Stan's commitment to Kyle shows us a lot about selflessness and putting the needs of a loved one before our own. Few things hold more power than imagination, or more dangerous. In one of the series' most celebrated arcs, the boys following a hunt to prove whether leprechauns exist find themselves in the midst of a war of imaginary creations. Instigated by a bet between Kyle and Cartman over the complete impossibility that an imaginary character could exist in the real world, the escalating situation reveals that just because something is imaginary doesn't mean it's not real. Utilizing the storyline to lampoon many popular characters from other entertainment properties and pop culture, the heart of the Imagination Land story was about the importance of dreaming. The boys learned that just because something may be imaginary, it doesn't mean it doesn't have significance to
to the person who believes in it. As such, the characters and ideas we hold dear become very real and help shape who we are and how we see the world. So, if you can imagine it, then in some ways, it's real, and we'll take Strawberry Shortcake hostage. When Satan learned that it's okay to be alone sometimes, it seems unlikely that we'd learn anything of moral or personal value from the devil himself. But then again, parent groups the world over would tell me that South Park has no lessons to teach. Satan has the potential to provide us with a good life lesson. Longtime viewers of the show and its feature film spinoff are well aware that Satan had a long and complicated romantic relationship with one-time Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein, a complicated relationship that led to at least one instance of near-nuclear war. Satan's association with Saddam is a definition of unhealthy, which, when it's a love affair between the devil and one of history's most wicked tyrants, we can imagine it would be anything other than problematic. Utilizing the fractured relationship to showcase a very real issue of people who feel trapped in toxic situations because they can't separate their feelings from the very dangerous reality, South Park's creators used a rather funny pairing to shine a spotlight on a very real situation that many people have struggled through. Satan pulls himself up by the bootstraps and kicks Saddam to the curb, finding a sense of peace and completion and being himself. In that moment, Satan realizes it's better to be alone than to be with someone who doesn't make you want to strive to be the best version of you. They say the devil's in the details, and in this case of self-empowerment, we couldn't agree more. That censorship isn't a replacement for talking to your kids. Censorship and complaints over content are no strangers to the creative team behind South Park. From the beginning, parent groups often cited the bathroom humor and foul language as a big negative for younger viewers and would demand Comedy Central pull the show from the air. So, when the series was given a big screen adaptation in the form of South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, the film's storyline about the censoring of a subversive television program had an air of familiarity. Attacking the notion of censorship head-on, the film shows Kyle's mom bringing about a nuclear Armageddon in an effort to take a television show she deems reprehensible off the air. In one of the movie's more prescient moments, Mrs. Broflowski points out that it's easier to blame the television than take the blame as parents for not doing their job. Time and again, when incidents occur within communities, fingers get pointed at video games, cartoons, and film content as the blame for violent attitudes and behavior. Taking this argument into consideration, Parker and Stone use a movie to turn the finger back around at the accuser, pointing out that it's not so much the content of the art, but the dialogue that surrounds it in the home. One can see a violent movie and know that violence is reprehensible. It's more about talking things out, not hiding away from them and pretending they don't exist. With the South Park movie, the creators show us that censoring never leads to solutions, just creates more problems without means to express them. Don't get too focused on a single goal. One of the most infamous episodes of the show's first decade was one titled Make Love Not Warcraft, which saw our favorite bus stop gang get sucked into the all too addicting world of online role-playing games. As the boys descended further and further down the rabbit hole of gameplay, they started to eschew real life and social situations, becoming incapable of living beyond what was happening on the screen. Furthermore, beyond inspiring online competition, the game led to real life contention among the friends, as well as a few extra pounds on Cartman's part. As much as we, being citizens of the internet and all, hate to admit it, the boys learned that it's good to unplug and step away from our lives online and take a minute to appreciate the world and people around us. The boys lost themselves to fantasy in another episode where they got a little too into Lord of the Rings, leading to some very enlightening moments for Butters. As we mentioned earlier, the show encourages flights of fantasy and using your imagination to take you to new heights, but keeping in line with Parker and Stone's ever-present warning of not taking things too extremes, they like to remind viewers that it's okay to appreciate the real world and strive to make that better too. Confidence is a key component of success. Despite the limitations of living in a small, snowed-in town in Colorado, the gang from South Park never let the world get in the way of their dreams. In fact, for all their failings, one thing you can say about the residents of the icy little village is that they have no problem going after their dreams, which has led to international fame for the characters on the show on more than one occasion. Take, for example, the fact that the boys once created their own teen pop band, or that Randy was revealed to be the pop singer Lord. All this was achieved because they believed in themselves. South Park shows the importance of setting a goal and working to achieve it. Few characters exemplify this more than Eric Cartman, whose schemes are often heinous in nature. Remember that one time he made a kid eat his own parents? Because we're still sure having dreams about that. But almost always executed in his favor. This is because Cartman, who refuses to acknowledge or see the failings of his plans, never doubts that they can be achieved. Thanks to his convictions, Cartman has been the spokesperson for Cheesy Poof, Spot a Theme Park, and Time, and again, one-upped Kyle in otherwise nonsense bets. All of these successes, and occasional successful failures, poster child for Nambla episode, can be attributed to Cartman's belief in himself. Whether it's becoming a pop star or a world leader, South Park continues to show the audience that the key to achieving your dreams is confidence in your abilities to make them happen. Though, for the sake of us all, try and make sure your goals are a little more noble than Cartman's. We want to be able to sleep at night. Adults don't always have the answers. One thing consistent fans of South Park can tell you, there's not a single character on the show that gets out unscathed. Structured to mock after-school specials of yesteryear, the series format follows the adventures of Kyle, Stan, Cartman, and Kenny, and the rest of the elementary set as they discover the world and learn lessons. In similar shows, when things get dire for the children, they know they can always turn to 
to their parents for advice and insight. However, South Park being, well, South Park, the adults are often as clueless, if not more so, than the kids. Often this leads to their own series of adventures, whether it's Kyle's mom leading a war against Canada, or Randy Marsh attempting to impress Stan with his guitar. The adults of South Park often add to the general chaos of the series by often revealing that they don't know what the hell is going on most of the time. Not only does this add to the humor of the show, but it also humanizes adults in a way that most shows centered around children do not. The truth is, no one ever feels like they've grown up. Even grown-ups. By making the parents as irreverent as a kid, South Park reminds us that sometimes adults don't have all the answers and are just trying to get by, just like everybody else. Even if this does mean Randy gets into fistfights with other people's dads. Often. You can find humor in anything. And you should. Perhaps the ultimate lesson that can be learned from South Park is the most obvious one. Take nothing too seriously. Just as Parker and Stone were able to use the movie to laugh at their own issues with censorship, the show reminds us that, overall, it's important to take the time and laugh at yourself on occasion. Nothing is too serious that it doesn't deserve a good, humorous roast from time to time. Because, often in humor, we also find essential truths. Life is short. Just ask Kenny. We made a whole bunch of references to South Park today, but what about all the references made by South Park? Yeah, they do that a lot. Heck, that's kind of their whole thing. People love how quickly South Park can turn around and lampoon current events faster than really anybody else. So here we go. Breakdowns of all sorts of different references from South Park. South Park is without a doubt the definitive master when it comes to cartoon satire. Every episode packs in about four pop culture references per minute, and with 20 seasons under its belt, that's, well, you know, just a whole lot of references, and you probably missed a couple over the seasons. Hi everyone, I'm Justin with Channel Frederick and we're here to take you through some of the best shoutouts in South Park history. So come on down to South Park and meet some pop culture references of mine. TV shows. My Super Sweet 16. Remember the MTV reality show that starred wildly privileged teenagers planning birthday parties so extravagant they could rival Kim and Kanye's wedding? Yeah, that one MTV is actually bringing back to television now a decade later? Well, imagine that that teenager is Satan and you've got South Park Season 10 Episode 11 on your hands, Hell on Earth 2006. Satan starts the episode by calling out My Super Sweet 16 and voicing his desire to rent the entire W Hotel and and invite a bunch of celebrities to his Halloween party. After all, Halloween is about me, Satan says, and just like a bratty teen, guests at Satan's big birthday party have to RSVP and get a blue wristband because they will not get in without one. And on top of that, no one can show up as a crow because, you know, that, that's Satan's costume. Yep, the Prince of Darkness does Teen Queen real well. For a bonus reference, let's not forget about serial killers Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and John Wayne Gacy showing up in the episode dressed as the Three Stooges, tapped by Satan to pick up his dream Ferrari cake. And yeah, you guessed it, that is a cake shaped like a bright red Ferrari. <laughs> Satan's got extravagant taste. And this episode definitely nails the diva mentality embodied in My Super Sweet 16. Scooby-Doo. You likely caught South Park's episode-long reference to Scooby-Doo in Season 3 with Korn's groovy pirate ghost mystery, but you might have missed the nod one season later in Cartman Joins Nambula, Episode 5 of Season 4. For everyone's sake, let's not get into the details of the episode except for the classic chase scene in a hallway with lots of doors. You know, the ones where Scooby and friends and the bad guys run in and out of doors in a hallway only to keep missing each other and race into different rooms. Picture Cartman doing this with the feds, a bunch of Marlon Brando lookalikes, and the other kids from South Park. Though the internet could spend years debating the origins of this hallway chase trope, let's just safely call it a Scooby-Doo homage and be done with it. Movies. Cloverfield. Did you ever notice the opening of Season 12, Episode 11, Pandemic 2, The Startling? With its shaky handheld camcorder shots of giant guinea pigs wrecking havoc on South Park, the opening of the episode looks a lot like Cloverfield, the monster movie that grossed $170 million at the box office back in 2008. Though, Randy Marsh turns the camera back around on himself for plenty of giant guinea pig selfies, which Cloverfield's TJ Miller as Hug Platt doesn't even do. But rest assured, Assured, the rest of this reference is definitely all Cloverfield. An image of the guinea pigs' destruction of Manhattan on Randy's TV really brings this home as the monster movie takes place in New York. The scene, which captures the military shooting at giant guinea pigs as they prowl the wrecked city streets, mimics HUD's shots as he flees the alien beast 
taking over that same city and Cloverfield. Children of the Corn. The South Park creator's love for horror movies goes all the way back to season one, whether they're referencing Godzilla with a mecha Barbara Streisand or any number of zombie movies with a pink eye outbreak. In season four, episode 16, Wacky Molestation Adventure, sorry for the episode names, but it's South Park for you. They go after Children of the Corn, a Stephen King short story turned 1980s cult classic about a town taken over by children after they murder all the adults living there. Naturally, the South Park spoof manages to not only match this premise, but make it even more inappropriate. The adults disappear after the town's children all falsely accuse them of molestation. Good old South Park. And like in Children of the Corn, the plot moves forward when two unwitting adults get stranded in this eerie child-run world. This couple even stumbles upon an abandoned gas station when first entering South Park, which is one of the first unsettling places the couple encounters in Children of the Corn. Only in the horror flick, Butters doesn't eventually come out to meet them. Bonus reference, this episode throws in a risky business moment when Kyle slides into a doorway wearing his underwear and sunglasses Tom Cruise style after the cops take his parents away. The Core. We know about Cartman's undying hatred for hippies, so it goes with no surprise that he goes all Armageddon on them in season nine, episode two, Die Hippie Die. Oh wait, we're, we're actually supposed to be talking about The Core. Well, this South Park episode references both of these action flicks. Armageddon with the orange jumpsuits that Cartman and company wear while stopping the town's influx of hippies. Which look just like the spacesuits that Bruce Willis and company wear in Armageddon and The Core with pretty much the rest of the episode. In the 2002 film The Core, which stars Aaron Eckhart and Hilary Swank, a group backed by the US government has to ride a vessel able to penetrate the Earth's core in order to save the planet, just like how Cartman has to ride a drill into a large group of hippies to save his town from a music festival. Among his team, Cartman requests, quote, a black person who can sacrifice himself in case something goes wrong. End quote. This character was Ed Braz Brazelton, played by Delroy Lindo in The Core, while in South Park, this role was taken by Isaac Hayes as Chef. Fun fact, this was the last episode for which Hayes ever recorded lines before leaving the show. Every Rob Schneider movie, like literally ever, headlining timeless classics like The Animal and The Hot Chick has made Rob Schneider an easy target, that and simply being Rob Schneider. In the season six episode, The Biggest Douche in the Universe, <laughs> These episode titles just keep getting better and better. South Park imagines new movies that Schneider might star in by featuring the faux trailers in front of movies that the boys are watching. These hypothetical movies starring Rob Schneider include The Stapler and A Carrot, rated PG-13. The Dark Crystal in a season 10 episode mocking reality shows like Nanny 911 and Dog Whisper, one of the nannies that they meet is Nanny Skeksis. This is a reference to the villainous bird-like creatures from Jim Henson and Frank Oz's The Dark Crystal. Called Skeksis, hear the resemblance? These creatures have pointed beaks, withered skin, and a certain hunchback quality, and that nanny version embodies that to a T. Star Wars. Of course, no reference trivia set would be complete without a nod to Star Wars, though this happens more than once in South Park's 20 seasons, one of the most obscure references appears in Mr. Hankey's Christmas Classics in Season 3. In this holiday special, the episode kicks off with a mustachioed news anchor saying, Fighting the Frizzies at 11. The news anchor Roland Smith said the same thing in a bump during the infamous 1978 Star Wars holiday special, which you may have heard of because it was so bad, it was never broadcast again. Harrison Ford condemned it as an embarrassment, and Carrie Fisher, may she rest in peace, actually called it awful. Video games. Family Guy, the quest for stuff. South Park established its Family Guy feud in season 10 when it mocked the cartoon by depicting its writers as manatees pushing around idea balls. But the show goes after Family Guy again in the season 18 episode, Freemium Isn't Free. In it, the show's famed Canadian actors, or rather flatulence artists, Terrence and Philip come out with a mobile game called Give Us Your Money, which looks suspiciously like the Family Guy The Quest for Stop mobile app. The whole show pokes fun at the freemium structure for mobile apps, which offers a bare bones version of a game for free, but then starts to charge you if you want to unlock any of the actual cool features in it and play more of the game. In Give Us Your Money, these cool features are buying coins so you can help rebuild Canada by doing things like putting up hospitals. Meanwhile, on the other side of the fence, the premise of the Family Guy mobile game is that Peter Griffin and Ernie the Giant Chicken get into a brawl so huge that it destroys Quahog, and you, the player, have to rebuild it. 
Sound familiar? Fox launched the quest for stuff in April 2014, a few months before South Park debuted Freemium Isn't Free, so you be the judge. Super Paper Mario Like Freemium Isn't Free, South Park's Royal Pudding episode in Season 15 does one of the things that South Park does best. It makes fun of Canadians, our kindly neighbors to the north. Hi Jacob. It also spares no effort in making fun of the royal wedding between Prince William and Kate Middleton which took place in April 2011, just over a week before Royal Pudding aired on Comedy Central. But in between mocking other English speaking countries, South Park threw in a nod to Super Paper Mario. The side scrolling game debuted in 2011 for Nintendo Wii and its plot also revolves around a wedding, one in which Princess Peach is captured. In South Park, the royal Canadian princess is the one who's getting captured. She gets trapped in a cube while the narrator puts it, the little mushroom people of Nova Scotia scream with horror. These mushroom people were animated to quite clearly resemble Super Paper Mario's Toad People. And because we had to look it up, the royal pudding instant pudding mix that is both the title of the episode and a big part of South Park's royal Canadian wedding is not actually a Canadian brand. It's actually owned by Illinois-based Gelsert. Yeah, the more you know. Pokemon. With memorable Chimpokomon like Lamtron and Shu, who doesn't love South Park's version of the anime series almost as much as the original? In Season 3, Episode 11, Chimpokomon, the kids of South Park get swept up in the frenzy to catch them all and destroy the evil power, which turns out to be the United States of America, but you know, still, who doesn't want to catch Shu? This parody resurfaced years later after its 1999 origin thanks to the popularity of Pokemon Go in 2016. If you know your meme, then you'll know Chimpokomon. Pokemon Go, which you can't play, but can upvote on Reddit, and why the heck not? Once again, I'm Justin with Channel Frederator, and thanks for watching South Park references you may have missed. And to end it all off, why not break down the impact short form video platforms had on the show? Did TikTok save South Park? Let's find out. If you've been on or around the internet lately, and let's be honest, if you're watching this video, you fall into this category, you might have noticed something about the content that people are consuming. There's a relatively new category of stuff that is both eye-catching and attention-retaining, and it's super easy to make and upload. Some people are calling it digital sludge, some people are going with the more descriptive South Park clips with crappy mobile game footage and maybe some sensory videos added below. Whatever you call it, it's taking over the short form content sphere and changing how people watch long running TV shows. So how does South Park factor in exactly? Well, let's get into that. To get a fulsome view of this topic, let's take it back, way back. Before TikTok was even a glimmer in the eye of whatever tech whiz came up with Music Alley or Emmy or whatever. Let's go back to 1997 when Matt Stone and Trey Parker were still working with construction paper, back to the advent of South Park. After it premiered with the episode Cartman Gets an Anal Probe, it blew up. People were going crazy for South Park. The first episode did big numbers and received high ratings. Soon enough, people were getting together for South Park watch parties on college campuses, and Comedy Central, the network airing the show, was booming. Ratings rose throughout the first seasons and even set records at the time for most non-sporting event viewers. People couldn't get enough of South Park. This is exactly what the folks behind the scenes were looking for at the time. Ratings on cable television. Higher ratings meant they could sell more ads and get more eyes on said advertisements. This made them more money, made the show more notorious, and made the people working on South Park look like geniuses. At the beginning of the show's run, the most expensive Comedy Central ad you could buy was like $7,500, but by the end of the year, ad prices had jumped to an average of 40 k and some were even commanding up to 80 That's big money. The controversy and timeliness of South Park plotlines have been a topic of discussion throughout the years as well. Nobody was quicker at picking up the pulse of what was going on in American life than the South Park team, and they always made sure to poke fun at anything that would cause people to raise their eyebrows and clutch their pearls. Politicians, religious figures, community leaders, concerned parents, and more all found reasons to speak out against South Park, but South Park kept on coming. Vulgarity was a hot topic, which South Park approached with the delicacy of a bulldozer. Religion was a popular target too, with South Park making a mockery of Scientology, Mormonism, Christianity, Islam, and more. Celebrities were taken down regularly, and often they got upset about it. And of course, parents wanted to protect their children from the foul-mouthed and violent antics of the citizens of South Park. That last one more or less relies on parents not letting their kids watch the show. Before the advent of personal electronics like smartphones and laptops, this may have been an easier task. These days, 
hard to stop anybody from watching anything. Over the years, the show's ratings and the dollar signs associated with them have fluctuated significantly. Of course, the way that people watch television also changed. South Park has been around long enough that we've seen episodes premiere on cable, sold by the season on DVDs, clipped and posted to early YouTube, and brought onto streaming platforms. Now they're chopped and stapled to other footage on short-form content apps. These new methods of viewership have obviously impacted the traditional cable-only ratings of the show, with a lot of people preferring to consume the show using whatever they see as the most convenient method. And now, for a whole lot of people, TikTok, YouTube Shorts, Instagram Reels, and whatever's going on over at Twitter are the most convenient places to watch all of this. What makes it even easier is that they come pre-packaged with even more visual stimulus to keep folks on that specific video for a longer period of time. We've seen it happen to pretty much every popular and long-running adult animated comedy, from Family Guy to Rick and Morty to The Simpsons. My theory is that their largely episodic nature and their high volume of jokes make it real easy to hop in wherever. Really, that's what helped the shows get so popular in the first place. Low barrier of entry, iconic set of characters, wide variety of scenarios, and boom! You can sit down and watch an episode without any additional context. But now, you don't even need to sit down and choose to watch clips from the show. If you're scrolling through through TikTok, one might just show up whether or not you've shown interest in it, and it'll play, along with whatever ASMR sensory soap cutting mobile game Subway Surfer's kinetic sand stuff that it's attached to. Suddenly, the viewer's brain is taking in like three different things and they might not even know it. They're watching an out of context South Park clip where Cartman's trying to avoid a fight while somebody plays a mobile game badly enough that they want to hop in and correct their technique while somebody else carves soap oh so satisfyingly. At any point, the viewer might get bored of one of these things, but instead of moving on to the next video, they can just move their eyeline an inch or two and be rewarded with something new. You're also hearing the show the whole time that this is happening. This means higher retention, more and longer views on the video, and an algorithm that sees this as a success. So, more clips get produced, and more people are introduced to whatever show is playing in the top half of their screen. Which brings us back to South Park. We discussed ratings earlier and how over the years they fluctuated. In the end, traditional cable had a hard time keeping up with streaming and short-form apps. Season 25 of South Park, which aired in 2022, had some of the series' lowest ratings of all time. Now, these low ratings can be credited to a whole bunch of different things. The show had moved away from that episodic structure that made it so popular and also so easy to watch. Extended storylines and plots that spanned multiple episodes had become the hallmark of the later seasons. While this allowed for some interesting tales to be told, it also threw some viewers off and limited what could happen in each episode. There's also the whole HBO Paramount thing going on right now, where a bunch of South Park feature films are being made and the rights to South Park are being hotly contested. I don't speak legalese, nor do I claim to understand copyright law, so you do your own research there. Needless to say, the pandemic did a number on South Park's production and their numbers. But the new interest in the show that was seemingly sparked by TikToks has been a welcome change. Even though most of the clips on TikTok are overwhelmingly distracting with their content, some people decided to give the show a try, even independent of these apps. If you take a look at interest in South Park over the last few years, you can see that early 2023 saw a huge increase. Even when it inevitably dropped off its first high, it still stayed significantly higher than before. This can definitely be attributed to the popularity of clips on TikTok, but that isn't just it. The South Park team was definitely smart in how they approached their latest season. They knew that TikTok was big for them and made episodes specifically about the platform, warts and all. They made a TikTok account and posted clips from the show that were more or less built for the app. They even returned to their episodic plot structure that made them a huge success in the first place. And of course, controversy reigns supreme. Celebrity takedowns of Kanye and the royal couple Harry and Meghan brought all sorts of eyes to the show and had some celebrities in question publicly comment on South Park. That's definitely a good sign that South Park is back to doing what it does best. The online South Park community is growing too. The famously simple art style is easy for anyone to emulate, with them creating their own characters or drawing Stan, Kyle, Kenny, and Cartman in their own art style. Having a solid base of fans connecting with your show can definitely keep it in the public eye longer. The only question now is will they be able to maintain this? As the demand for instant content continues to grow, will the South Park team be able to keep up? Will the demand for the show continue to rise, or will all the existing episodes get munched up into sludge and then forgotten? Trends move faster than ever and even shows that have been memed for decades can fall off at a moment's notice.
this. Will content creators move on once the next big thing bursts onto the scene? Parker and Stone will definitely continue to lampoon whatever the topic of the day is in any way they can, as they've proven that they're capable of doing so since the 90s. There is no slowing them down. All that's left to do is wait and see, I suppose. That and hop on TikTok and wait for some South Park clips to show up in your feed. Ah, fiddlesticks. It's over. Already. It's only been like five hours. We should have shot for ten. Ah oh, well, next time. So what did you think of all this South Park knowledge? You gonna kick ass at the next trivia night you attend? Or perhaps rub your superior South Park knowledge in the face of a coworker who's always out quoting you. Whatever nefarious purposes you're putting this information toward, I'm proud of you. Make sure you let us know what you thought of the video down in the comments and subscribe to Channel Frederator for more like this. Thanks for watching and remember, Frederator loves you.